Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here today, and it's an honor to be joined by so many whose work we greatly admire. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to those joining us through our YouTube live stream from all over the world. My name is Holly Johnson, and I'm the Associate Director of Columbia Global Freedom of Expression. For those who are not yet familiar with our work, Global Freedom of Expression was established in 2014 by Columbia University President Lisey Bollinger to bring together judges, lawyers, journalists, scholars, and activists to advance understanding of international norms that protect freedom of expression and the free flow of information in an interconnected global community. To achieve its mission, Global Freedom of Expression undertakes research and policy projects, organizes events, and contributes to global debates on the protection of freedom of expression and information. Our flagship project is a database which currently hosts more than 1,800 briefs on court decisions relating to freedom of expression from more than 130 countries. Versions of the database are also available in Spanish, Arabic, French, Portuguese, and Russian. Our interest in the potential of decentralized networks arose out of work we started three years ago as part of the Future of Free Speech project with our partners, the Danish think tank Justicia and Aarhus University's Department of Political Science. The project seeks to understand why freedom of, freedom of speech is in global decline and how the deterioration of free speech threatens individual freedom, civil society, and democratic institutions. A key driver of that decline are perceived threats from hate speech, extremism, terrorism, and disinformation, which have called uh, for stricter regulations by authoritarian governments, democratic governments, NGOs, and social media companies. And so this collaboration has enabled us to add additional court decisions relating to hate speech and disinformation to our database. And one of the things we've been looking at is trying to understand how courts are altering their understanding of these age-old harms in light of how they have evolved in the online world. Originally, this event was supposed to take place in the spring of 2020 and be a small experts meeting of about 12 people in Tunisia to discuss AI, disinformation, and elections. And then came COVID and January 6th and the invasion of Ukraine all bringing the fundamental questions of the project into stark relief. We recalibrated, and here we all are in New York in 2022 with over 50 people in person seeking solutions to a crisis of democracy globally, the rise of what has been coined digital authoritarianism and the ever ongoing threats to freedom of expression and privacy. Over the next two days, we will explore ways to protect freedom of expression and hopefully fix the broken marketplace of ideas in the online public sphere. Today, we will focus on emerging technical solutions to some of the biggest problems relating to content moderation. These potential solutions are not new, and they have been written about and debated over the past few years by many of the people in this room. Mike Masnick, for instance, featured a tech policy greenhouse discussion in cooperation with the Electronic Frontier Foundation on his blog, Tech Dirt. Last year, Mike also published an essay for the Knight First Amendment Institute titled, Protocols Not Platforms, a Technological Approach to Free Speech. The essay envisioned the proliferation of decentralized protocols as a means for protecting both user privacy and free speech while at the same time minimizing the impact of abusive behavior online and creating new and compelling business models that are more aligned with user interests. The Knight First Amendment Institute here at Columbia also hosted a conference in 2021 on reimagining the internet where Cory Doctorow and Daphne Keller spoke about the interoperability of social networks and regulation from the perspective of user rights and benefits. Many of these resources and others are now posted on our conference site under background materials. Their ideas are gaining momentum, and we hope that the panels here will provide an opportunity to further these conversations and render more insights on how to collectively change course and how to get the train back on the tracks. Session one today will focus um, and identify the most promising of the decentralized networks, which could shift 
the concentrated power away from the platforms and put individuals in control of their data and content curation. We hope to not only better understand what problems they may solve, but also what new risks to freedom of expression they may present and how to address them. Session two will discuss what policies and technical solutions are necessary to realize the potential of the decentralized networks, such as data portability, interoperability, unbundling, and mandated access. Panelists will also consider if and how values and principles can be embedded in technology to better protect freedom of expression and privacy. Session three will feature representatives from leading tech companies employing or building on Web3 technologies as part of their business models to improve online security and privacy, combat hate speech, and even build a decentralized infrastructure to restore trust and transparency online. They will consider ways that decentralization can foster innovation through greater competition. Today, we're looking at where we could and possibly should go. Tomorrow, we'll focus on where we are right now. What regulations are being implemented? What are the pros and cons? Further, we will consider how regulations created today will shape the environment for the decentralized networks of tomorrow. And last but not least, how can international human rights law, standards, principles, and values be effectively applied to the policies as well as the protocols? Before we start, we must extend special thanks to Barbara Bukowska, Article 19's Senior Director for Law and Policy, and Daphne Keller, she's in the room right now, um, Director of Program on Platform Regulation at Stanford Cyber Policy Center, both of whom provided invaluable insights and guidance on the conceptual development of this conference. Also, I'd like to encourage all members of our audience, both in person and virtual, to engage with us on Twitter during the event and tweet during the sessions. Be sure to use our conference hashtag, which is hashtag Public Sphere 2022. Not sure if it's up there yet, okay. You can also follow us at Columbia GFOE. So, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our partner, Jacob Mishangama, who is going to give some opening remarks and a brief presentation on today's topics. For those who do not yet know Jacob, he is the founder and executive director of Justicia, a Danish think tank focusing on human rights. He's also a senior fellow at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, a member of the Forum on Information and Democracy Steering Committee for the Working Group on Network Accountability Regimes, a member of the Danish government's Independent Free Speech Commission, and a member of the Steering Committee of the World Expression Forum. Back in 2018, he was a visiting scholar at Columbia Global Freedom of Expression, during which time he was producing his fabulous podcast, Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech, that podcast was further developed into his critically acclaimed book, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. And with that, I give the floor to Jacob and invite him to come to the podium. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Holly. Um, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to, to be here today uh, in, uh, in this room with this particular group uh, of people. I think we have a really, really unique set of group, not only the panelists, but also the attendees here. I think every, every participant here was, was deserving of, of, of being on a panel, but unfortunately, we, uh, we, we don't have the time and resources to put everyone, uh, to put everyone on. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, the John Templeton Foundation for, for, for supporting um, the, uh, the Future of Free Speech Project uh, and this, uh, and, and, and this uh, conference, uh, and my hardworking colleagues, Raghav Mendirata and Natalie Alkiviado, who are, who are here. And of course, a uh, big thanks to you, Holly, Sophia, and Catalina, uh, for, for your great cooperation uh, throughout uh, these uh, three, uh, three years. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm really excited about today is uh, with this particular group of people is that it's a, it's a group uh, of people, of experts, with a very diverse set of, of expertise. I'm a lawyer, uh, and lawyers tend to think quite narrowly. 
um, in, in terms of, of rules and, and, and regulation, and I think it's become quite clear that lawyers don't have uh, all the solutions to, uh, to, to how to think about free speech in the, in the digital age. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of, of, of people here whose work uh, I, I appreciate for, for going beyond the hot takes, for, for exploding myths and, and popular narratives, and also quite a few people who have forced me, uh, and I'm sure many others, to, uh, however reluctantly, uh, abandon certain ideas and assumptions that they had about uh, free speech in the digital age that, that simply did not live up to, 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 to scrutiny once new research uh, came uh, to light. Um, I want to try and contextualize why we're here. It's, it's a story that all of you are familiar with and I will be grossly, uh, um, you know, um, it'll, it'll be a very short exec executive summary, ex summary but, but I think it's still worth sort of uh, going through. So this is Tim Berners-Lee, <coughs> hailed as the architect of the World Wide Web and this was his vision uh, that he set out in, in Weaving the Web from 1999. Uh, he, he talks about the, the decentralized organic growth of ideas, technology, and society, um, and, and how you know, he basically envisages, envisages an, an unfiltered uh, web, and when someone imposes involuntary filters on someone else, that is censorship. So uh, pretty radically uh, um, decentralized uh, idea of, of, uh, of, of what the internet should be. Um, and that, I, uh, so, sort of that techno, talking about tech, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I, here we go, survived for, for quite a while. So here are two statements from the same person. It's uh, the junior senator from Illinois uh, in 2006, Barack Obama, who uh, on his blog um, talked about, uh, released a podcast where he talked about uh, how Basically, uh, um, the internet allowed him to say what he wanted without censorship to bypass uh, gatekeepers, and it was obviously an essential way for him using social media to connect and energize new voters that, that were turned off by, by politics uh, at the time. He won the so-called Facebook generation, and it's really interesting to go back and look at the coverage of social media and elections in 2008 and 2012 compared to uh, uh, later uh, years. Uh, it's safe to say that the narrative has changed uh, dramatically. And then Barack Obama in 2020 in an interview in The Atlantic where he talks about how the the, the, the architecture of the internet with online dis disinformation is the single biggest threat to our democracy. So something has changed dramatically from Tim Berners-Lee, uh, techno-optimism uh, that was sort of adopted by, uh, by, by democratic uh, politicians uh, early on uh, and, and, and the way the, the world we live in today. And one of the reasons, of course, is that we have um, a much more uh, centralized, platformized uh, uh, internet today with, with actors uh, that, uh, that have become mega platforms and in some ways uh, act as, as choke points for, for the practical exercise of uh, free expression. Um, so as early as 2012, IBM said that 90% of the data in the world today was created in the last two years. That has uh, I'm sure grown exponentially. And then in 2021, every minute, uh, 4 million videos were streamed on YouTube, 500,000 tweets were, 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 were posted, and, and, and 500,000 comments uh, uploaded on, on, on Facebook, roughly. Uh, I'm sure not all of those comments were equally uh, eloquent, uh, elegant or, or, or wise, but it says something about the scope of free speech. And, that, uh, and, and then you might say, well, What's the problem if we have this quantity of, 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 of speech? You know, uh, no one could have dreamt of the possibilities that we have today of, of communicating freely with each other uh, across borders uh, in real time. Um, so, so why are we worried about the, the future uh, of free speech in the online digital sphere? Well, because uh, even though uh, we have um, access that was uh, unprecedented earlier, there's actually an online free speech recession. Um, we see it most uh, dramatically, of course, in authoritarian uh, and illiberal uh, states. 
if we use Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report, you can see that for 11 consecutive years, online freedom uh, has been uh, in, uh, in, the decl in decline. Uh, if you go to Access Now, you can also see how uh, internet uh, block uh, shutdowns uh, have, have become a, a, a feature. And even though you see a lot of green um, countries in Europe, um, uh, and, and North America, um, there are also uh, argument, uh, strong case to be made that um, the, the online free speech recession has extended to uh, democracies uh, of the world who are more likely to, to view at least certain aspects of the, the, the digital sphere as a threat to, to democracy rather than as uh, sustaining it. Uh, and, and that is, of course, what we'll talk about today. Now, I, it, it's I think uh, there's a tendency for, for people in our age to think of the challenges as being completely unique to our age due to, to technology. But as someone who has focused on the history of free speech, I'm obviously not going to spare you uh, some historical uh, parallels uh, because we are, in fact, not the first generation of humans who have had to grapple with the effects of uh, revolutionary uh, developments in communication technology. So this is Erasmus of Rotterdam. Uh, one of the most uh, prolific writers, uh, a Renaissance man, uh, who in 20, 1525 wrote of printers that they filled the world with pamphlets and books, foolish, ignorant, malignant, libelous, libelous mad, impious, and subversive. Um, so, and, and here, we, of course, we're talking about pamphlets and, and books, and he was writing at a, at a point in time where the, uh, the, 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 the printing press was, uh, was mixed in an explosive cocktail with the Protestant Reformation, which made the disruptions of our time look uh, quite uh, manageable, I would say. Um, here's another pr prolific writer, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, a, a famous philosopher who in 1750 thought that, uh, that European states should basically just uh, ban uh, printing because uh, of the, the evils that uh, were produced every day uh, and that would uh, produce a horrible uh, future. Um, and here's former president, uh, US President Andrew Jackson, who uh, was extremely worried about the fact that abolitionists in the North would send uh, abolitionist um, uh, tracts, pamphlets, and so on to the South, and proposed a federal law which would uh, uh, basically say that the, 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 the federal post could, should, should be prohibited from, from sending uh, abolitionist tracks uh, to the to the south, sort of a a where when the federal mail system uh, acted as a choke point, uh, in in some ways analogous to 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 the way that social media can can act uh, now, and the New York Times, 1858, on the transatlantic uh, oceanic uh, telegraph, thought that the that that when it came to the influence of the newspaper upon the mind and morals of the people, there can be no rational doubt that the telegraph has caused vast injury, superficial, sudden, unsifted, too fast for the truth, must be all telegraphic intelligence. Much better to wait two or three weeks for use uh, to cross uh, the Atlantic than uh, being able to, 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 to press it. And the last example um, is uh, Princeton professor John B. Whitten, uh, who wrote at a time where the United Nations uh, was debating what should be the limits on free speech in international human rights law, something which is really um, uh, prescient even today, which, which constitutes the framework that we're still working with. And one of the big issues that was being debated um, in, the, uh, in the United Nations uh, Conference on Freedom of Information was whether there should be a, an obligation to prohibit propaganda, something which the Soviet Union was very much in, in, in favor of. John B. Whitten was certainly not a fan of the Soviet Union, but he made an argument that I think uh, we hear still uh, today that the American position, the American position was that there should be no explicit limits on, on propaganda. Uh, he said that you know, those views may have been sound 100 years ago, but they are very doubtful validity in the age of the shortwave radio and the beam program of subversive and revolutionary uh, propaganda. Um, so, so, so this is just to give you a, a, a short overview of, uh, if you like, hot takes from the, from the past uh, that may help inform uh, us today. But even if, um, even if we can learn uh, from the past, I think it's, it's, it's clear there's a dire need to find solutions for today and our rapidly uh, developing uh, uh, future. Um, and um, one of the big issues uh, is whether um, the solution 
could be, um, could be uh, a way forward could, 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 uh, where we could benefit from the huge advantages of free and equal online speech while limiting the harms and costs. I mean, that's, that's the sweet spot we all want to, to, to land at. Then we might disagree on where that sweet spot uh, <laughs> exactly uh, is. Uh, but one of the questions, of course, is if the future could be decentralized. Uh, um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and I think uh, this is really uh, a question that has interested me uh, a lot, and that is what I'm really looking forward to today, especially because we have uh, some of the pioneers when it comes to, to thinking uh, and, and actually uh, working on uh, decentralized uh, models. Uh, and so, I, especially today, I very much uh, just look forward to returning to my seat and, 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 taking, and taking notes uh, and, and, and hopefully becoming a lot wiser on how to think uh, about, these, uh, about these issues. Ultimately, the goal of the Future Free Speech Project is to create a flourishing culture uh, of free speech, which I believe is, is the most important uh, feature for, 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 for free speech to, to thrive. And I very much hope that today's and tomorrow's, uh, this conference as such, can contribute to charting a, a, uh, a more healthy uh, culture of free speech globally. So thank you very much. And Holly, over to you to introduce the first panel. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jacob. Now we invite our first panel up to the front. They are all here, present and accounted for. Um, so this session is called Mapping the Decentralized Ecosystem, and it's being moderated by Mike Masnick, uh, the founder and editor of the popular Tech Dirk blog, as well as the founder of Silicon Valley's think tank, the Copia Institute. Um, Mike and Tech Dirt have also been key players in the ongoing battles over net neutrality, encryption, and anti-slap laws. Via the Copia Institute, Mike has pioneered new uses of games and simulations to help better explain complex present issues and explore future possibilities. He will present the rest of his very impressive panel. The floor is yours, Mike. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for being here and people who are attending virtually as well. Um, so that was a great introduction, Jacob. You obviously knew what panel was coming up, and it was an, an excellent setup. Um, and I will say, uh, if anyone here who is watching has not read Jacob's recent book on the history of free speech, it is absolutely wonderful. I recommend it to everyone. It is a very, very um, useful tool for thinking about all of these issues and understanding how many of the debates today, as you could see from that presentation, really are echoing in all sorts of really interesting ways. Um, so on this panel, um, we want to talk about sort of mapping and thinking about the decentralized ecosystem and um, how all of this fits into these debates about free speech. Um, and just as a little bit of, a, of an introduction, um, you know, I started thinking about this concept you know, uh, about a decade ago, honestly, when, when some of these questions were first coming up and people were asking about, you know, we had had this situation where everybody had been very excited and, and thrilled about this internet and bypassing gatekeepers and being able to have access to, you know, the, the ability from many people to communicate with many people uh, very easily. And every, lots of people, I think, were very, very excited about that and eager to see what would happen and believe that sort of, you know, certainly a lot of people believe that it was, uh, you know, uh, um, obviously a good thing and, and was going to, to turn out well. And, and about a decade ago, we began to see some of the cracks in that and some people began to raise questions about how these technologies might be abused or might already have been started to, to being abused. And, um, and, and I, you know, I was looking at it and realizing that these were, these were very, very difficult and, and challenging issues. And, and I started to try and reconcile that because I, I certainly came from the, the background and belief that the internet was good and the ability to communicate with everybody was, was a good thing and the ability to, to 
um, route around various gatekeepers um, was, was something that would lead to, to good results, and I was beginning to see where that wasn't always happening. Um, and, and the thing that I sort of came to was this recognition that, that the internet that we were seeing, and that we've definitely seen more and more of today, um, but you know, a decade ago it was sort of obvious where this was all starting to head, was actually somewhat different than the internet that, that, um, that we had been promised, I guess. The internet that we had thought about uh, in, the, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and that was one that was really decentralized, where you know, the power of the internet was, was not just that you could hop on someone else's service, but that you could build your own services. And that you didn't, you know, it wasn't just the gatekeepers for, for speech, but it was that there were no gatekeepers for, for connecting, for building your own service, for offering different things. Um, and so I, I started to look at that and realize, like, you know, how, how do we get back to that world? How do we move from a world that is... Um, you know, much fr that, that was becoming more and more centralized and more and more um, in control of a few platforms or a few companies to one that, that was more decentralized, where the powers were more pushed out tor towards the ends, um, and that, you know, that, that could maybe lead to the promise uh, or what we had been promised early on. Um, and so I, I started writing about that and, and eventually wrote a paper that came out in, in 2019, the Protocols Not Platforms paper that got some buzz that was put out by a different group here at Columbia, actually. Um, and in fact, also led to Jack Dorsey's talk about protocols, um, which was an interesting experience where he read the paper about three months after it came out and suddenly I get a phone call from Jack Dorsey, which is not something that normally happens to me. Um, and, and, but suddenly expressing interest in this idea and thinking through like how you know, could Twitter itself become, um, you know, become more decentralized and, and no longer have to take on all of that responsibility and, and, and power itself. Um, and so since then, certainly I've been thinking a lot about this as have everybody else on the panel and realizing that like, the, the, it's something interesting because f for the first part, it's, it's actually very, very different than, uh, than what we have now. And it, even though it, it sort of harkens back to the early days of the internet, it's a very different approach, especially from the, the policy angle where a lot of the um, policy discussions today are really about what do we do about the, the you know, four, five, six big companies out there? How do we manage them? How do we regulate them? Um, and less about like how do we actually empower more users to be able to have more power themselves and, and not necessarily hand that off to, um, to the large companies. Um, and you know, in, in the, these past few years, as I've been talking to more people and thinking more about it, you realize there are trade-offs to every approach and there are challenges to every approach. And so I think that's a lot of what we want to be discussing uh, on the panel today. And we have an excellent crew of people. Um, this is sort of my crew of people who I talk to about this stuff all the time anyway. So when they set up the panel and I was like, oh, it's my friends, uh, I got very excited about it. Um, so just as, as I'll give really quick introductions. Uh, one thing that we decided to do, originally we had talked about having each person give a presentation, um, but since I sort of know uh, all the people on the panel so well and because we talk about this stuff all the time, we figured it would be better to have just mostly a really open discussion. Um, and as part of that, I'm going to give a very, very brief intro on each of them. If you want to look up their backgrounds and resumes and all of the wonderful things that they've done, look it up online, because they all have done really amazing things. Um, but just really, really quickly, we have Daphne Keller, who is at Stanford and is director of the program on platform regulation. And we have Golda Velez, who uh, is uh, the co-founder of cooperation.org, right? That's what it's called now, right? Uh, and has been sort of very, very instrumental in sort of building community around Blue Sky, which is the Twitter uh, kicked off, not Twitter owned, but Twitter initially funded and set up uh, attempt at building a decentralized system. We have Alex Fierst. Uh, who ran Trust and Safety and Legal at Medium for many years and uh, has done a bunch of other things, but is now working with his, his organization, uh, Murmuration Labs, which is working on sort of a trust and safety setup for 
the decentralized Web3 world. And on video, we have, we do, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, we have Alan Rosenstein, who is an associate professor of law at University of Minnesota, who has been researching and writing about all of this as well. So that is our panel. And I'm going to kick it off by starting with a question for Daphne, um, which is that I, I wanted to, you know, sort of scene set for the panel and, and ask you to sort of give, uh, you know, a short summary on, on kind of the concerns and, and the worries that people have about free speech and the way the internet is sort of structured today and where we have, you know, these sort of big platforms. What are the concerns that, that people are seeing? Yeah, so I think this is a useful starting for lawyers or sort of free expression people thinking about where interoperability fits in because I think I'll say broadly, every human rights compliant democracy is running into this problem where the speech that the law permits includes some really ugly things that social norms don't permit. And the US has the most extreme version of this because we have the, the most extreme free expression protections under the First Amendment, but it still remains the case that in terms of what people want to see when they go on Facebook or what they think is morally appropriate for Facebook to let us see, that includes a, you know, wanting Facebook to block a bunch of stuff that is, that is legal. N almost no one wants to go onto Facebook and see technically legal beheading videos or spam or pornography or pro-suicide and pro-anorexia content. There's this vast swath of lawful but awful speech that nobody wants to see but that is definitely protected under law. And this leads us to a dynamic where people who want that speech to go away for good reasons, right, for like ethical reasons that I think most of us share, therefore want private platforms to take it down. And because the dominant platforms that we have have such incredible power over public discourse and over who gets to speak and be listened to, uh, we get into this sort of spiraling dynamic where they are increasingly restricting what information can flow. And the legal proposals that we see to respond to that all go in what I think are pretty bad directions. You know, there's the like, well, we need them on that wall, let's leave Mark Zuckerberg in charge because he will at least get rid of the barely legal hate speech. I don't really like that direction, the leave Mark in charge <laughs> direction. There's the, well, I guess the government will have to come in with some new rules restricting speech that used to be legal. That's sort of the UK online safety direction, and I don't like that one either. Uh, and you know, because all of the regulatory directions or many of the regulatory directions seem so problematic, it is very <laughs> nice to arrive at a solution where we pass the buck to the technologists, <laughs> sorry, technologists, uh, and say, Okay, you know, what if we reduce the power of the incumbent platform operators to control the discourse, but nonetheless let people have some control over what they see, not have to go onto the internet and see all of the lawful but awful speech that their legal system would permit, and what is a mechanism that would do that? And the sort of first order response a lot of people have is break up the platforms, turn them into a lot of smaller platforms, which I think, all, any economist would say there's a problem with that. They are likely to reassemble because of network effects. Like that's, that's not a good long-term solution. And so this is where we get to what Mike calls protocols, not platforms, uh, what I have called magic APIs, which is this idea that you, well, as, as I see it, and not every design <laughs> for it is the same, <laughs> but as I see it, you sort of allow the incumbents to sit there with their dragon's horde of data and content that they've already collected. Um, and provide security for it and like do various things that do work better when they're centralized and then open that up so that third parties can come along and provide competing content moderation services. And so you can sign up for the Disney version of Facebook if you want or a version of YouTube where the, the ranking is done by a Black Lives Matter affiliated group. This could affect what content comes down and how the content that you see is ranked and it sort of depends on third parties coming along to provide this service. Uh, and so you need, we can get into this later, maybe an economic incentive or a social incentive for them to do that, but diversifying the sources of control 
over the feeds that we see reduces the problem of having Mark in charge of everything um, and also allows people to sort of choose the discursive universe they want to operate in. I'll stop there. I have a lot more to say. But yes, <laughs> I, 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 and, and I have lots of responses to that. But uh, I'll move on to Golda. Um, so Golda and I first met because we were both in, in when Twitter started to prepare to put together Blue Sky. They set up a matrix chat room with all sorts of people who were sort of interested in you know, participating in it. It created some really interesting debates, I think, um, about how, how do you do this? If you wanted to set up uh, uh, you know, a social media protocol type system, how do you do that? And lots of people had very strong opinions uh, on different ways to do that. So I wanted to ask you if you could just you know, share for, for folks here and for the folks watching you know, some of the different ways in which one could create a, a decentralized uh, social media system, some of the, the ones that have been proposed and some of the ones that are actually being worked on. Sure, sure. No, I'd definitely be happy to do that. And um, just so to clarify who exactly I am, and it, it's kind of appropriate for a decentralization conference that I'm not necessarily anyone in particular. I'm a software engineer, and I basically, because I did some human rights work, I basically talked myself into that Twitter room um, <laughs> by getting an interview at Twitter and talking to people. And um, But I wanted to be there because I think it's very, very important for human rights work, and, and I've become very opinionated over the course of the time as far as good solutions. Um, but I want to just highlight a few things. So, so yeah, I was in the room where it happened when Jack was first talking to us, um, and his, his statement was we need a durable protocol. And it doesn't mean that the content's going to be durable. He wants the protocol to be durable, something that's going to be usable in a lot of different use cases. And then Blue Sky, just to be clear, because I talked to Jay, who is the head of Blue Sky, and she wanted me to be very clear that Twitter is not controlling Blue Sky, even though they funded it. And Blue Sky is not... You know, I am not representing Blue Sky, um, but I do know the people there, and I was helping run the community. So to answer your question, Mike, as far as the different types of solutions we see, um, I would envision it as a environment, you could say, with a bunch of little walled gardens, and that might be like some matrix rooms. There might be guys like Piergoss who have a very strong wall around their garden. And then you have some big citadels like Facebook and Twitter. And you have some attackers trying to get at all these guys and force them to show certain kinds of information. I think what people don't realize is there's two kinds of attacks that go on. Some of the attacks are against the privacy of people and trying to suppress content. But there's an even bigger attack of trying to push content on people, and we're really starting to see that now. And that's one of the big attacks, for instance, that happens in Saudi Arabia. So when Jamal Khashoggi was killed, uh, he was actually trying to set up uh, something they were calling an army of bees, because in Saudi they have a saying, a saying that the Saudi government is putting all these flies out there, just disseminating all this crap all the time to just make it so that you don't notice that somebody is saying that, hey, my brother's in prison. And it's like instead of just killing the guy who said my brother's in prison, they also just put out all this crap so you really can't tell what's going on. And he had the idea of setting up this army of bees, of like putting out the real content and getting some SIM cards that weren't compromised and sending them. And that was like the week before he got killed. So anyway... There's a number of different kinds of attacks. And some of the ways that people are defending their gardens, for example, in Matrix, you have the concept of shared gray lists. So, so the people who run Matrix have blacklists against certain people coming into the rooms, and you kind of can share those. And like on, on Mastodon, you know, kind of each node has to do their own types of moderation. And in Peergoss, it doesn't matter because you can only talk to your friends anyway. Sorry, yeah, is he in here? Um, so... Um, there's a number of different approaches, but the type of attack you get depends how big your garden is. So the issue with connecting these walled gardens to Twitter as these gardens open their doors because they want to have more, more reach, because really there's two issues here, and let me know if I'm going over, but um, there's freedom of speech and there's freedom of reach. And Jay, who's the head of Blue Sky, likes to say, you have freedom of speech, but we're not guaranteeing you freedom of reach. That's not a right. That's something that people are choosing. But as you open these walled gardens and let them communicate with each other so somebody in the walled garden has more reach, because that's what will happen if we connect Blue Sky to Twitter, um, you'll suddenly have more reach. That also opens a door for attackers who are 
not attacking that little walled garden so much because if you just have like a little Discord server, you're not being attacked so vigorously by people because they don't care about the people in your Discord server. But once you now are a backdoor into Twitter, you're going to get attacked by these, atta these guys. And so now we have to make these federated systems and tools for controlling that, which I'm very interested in, but I think I've talked too much. No, that, that's great. It actually leads in perfectly to the question I was going to ask Alex, uh, which is that, you know, one of the things, and, and, and this was certainly a response that I got when, when people read uh, read my paper originally, was they thought, oh, if you have this sort of protocol-based world or this interoperable world, um, then the need for content moderation goes away. Uh, that's clearly not the case, but, but Alex, I wanted to... to just to ask you to, to give your thoughts on, on what happens in this world. If you have a distributed world, does the need for like trust and safety, content moderation stuff disappear? Yeah, so <laughs> thanks for the question. I'm gonna say pro probably not. Um, and I think for me, as I got interested in working on these problems, I wanted to, Web3 or, or sort of working in a decentralized fashion, for me at least represented like a new opportunity to do things differently <laughs> in the way I at least have been doing them for five or so years at Medium, where you know we worked, we worked very hard, but we eventually ran up against the structural constraints of doing content moderation or whatever you want to call it in a centralized fashion. And so eventually you can have a great team or you can have an okay team and you can have good software or crappy software, but the structural constraints of how you do it eventually sort of reveal themselves and you sort of bang your head against the same walls and ceilings for a while. And so before plunging into dusting off a similar toolkit and using the same nomenclature and repeating all of our mistakes in Web3, part of what I had sort of asked myself was like, well, what, is it possible to zoom out and rethink about what are we doing? Like, what is the largest way to conceptualize the whole problem? And so for me, and content moderation is one of the words that we've sort of stabilized at, and that's fine. I would also propose that in some ways, content moderation is like a weirdly trivial word for the cosmically large thing we're talking about, <laughs> which is like all expression. Um, you know, that is enabled online. And so in some ways, like, and I say hell is other people's expression, um, that, that you're, we're dealing with, with a range of behaviors from curation and positive amplification to demotion, throttling, um, all the way down to banning. And like that entire spectrum of behaviors, you can call it lots of things. And you inter, and, and you know, when you run some kind of service, you intervene into it lots of different ways. But for me, like starting at the baseline, I, one of the things I decided and wanted to sort of propose to people is that th we've been thinking about content moderation in Web2 land in a sort of like naturalistic fallacy way, which is like people are gonna people, like humans are gonna human, and they're gonna like piss people off, they're gonna abuse, they're gonna harass. We can't necessarily stop that. We're gonna have to do something. And so we have a set playbook of things that we do. Now, I, I, don't, think, I don't think that that's wrong, but I think all of the online systems that we make because they're inherently artificial, um, you know, they are, they are like the matrix where you don't really breathe air. It would be silly to say humans are simply, sim humans are humaning, but they're humaning along the specific incentives and structures and other mazes that we make for them in, this, in these structures. And so it's worth considering what the structures are gonna do um, b before you start building them again. Now, to your point, Mike, like whether moderation, minimalism, or non-intervention will work, I think the first, the, the way that I generally do this is like, step one is like, well, as long as you accept that nation states have power over the internet, and some folks in the room perhaps don't, but as long as you accept that nation states and law enforcement folks are gonna have views and laws and the ability to enforce things, you can't do nothing, because people will, will post, there's many lawful but awful things that are conceptually interesting to us, but there's lots of just illegal stuff. This is the, t the main two horsemen of the content moderation apocalypse which is CSAM, child sexual abuse material, and nowadays terrorism, violent extremist content, generally illegal in most places, taboo in virtually all places, depending on your definition of a terrorist. Um, and so at minimum, you're gonna wanna figure something out with that. The second thing I generally tell people is like, m most human behavior operates extrajudicially outside of court. So when you say that's defamation and I say it ain't, that's just like your opinion, man, right? Most things don't go to court and never get a court order, and it would be prohibitively expensive to adjudicate these things in a way that has all the trappings of nation state. And so what you're really talking about is like interventions into an already artificial system in a way that has hopefully legitimacy, hopefully efficacy. And then I think secondarily, um, this notion that you're managing a, you're, 
the more interventions you make and the more that you feel compelled to make them or the more that your users or your community either want a service to make them or users are empowered to make them themselves. And perhaps interventions is a sort of delicate and silly word for it, but I'm trying to come up with something better. The more of those you do, um, the more you're sort of accepting that this, this is a very structured system where lots of people are making interventions into other people's speech um, in an extrajudicial context where no, no state authority figure will probably ever rule on the legitimacy of this. So we're in this mush of extrajudicial persuasion and power where we have to figure out the rules. And I'll say one last thing and then I'll stop, which is that one of the promises of the decentralized environment is to accept that, you're, that someone will need to intervene, whether it's like normatively through a community, whether it's through tooling or whatever, but the goal is to do it in a way where the power allocates in a larger number of hands and each of those larger number of hands has less power. So the notion of non-intervention, I, I would say is like fundamentally fallacious if you really think about this stuff for a while, but the promise of decentralization is to do the allocation differently so that this notion of hardcore enforcement content moderation sort of bleeds into a much more organic set of human behaviors such as normative, normative behavior and putting pressure on people and mentorship and encouragement and curation and all the other things that we actually inhabit in human spaces where we do intervene into other people's expression all the time in subtle ways and to have tools that sort of biomimic those human mechanisms for nudging and steering. There's a whole bunch of stuff I want to explore there, but uh, first I want to go to, to Alan, who, who's joining us virtually. Um, Alan, I know that uh, you've, you've done a bunch of research on Mastodon uh, in particular, which is one system, which is a federated system, which is a, a slightly different approach from a purely decentralized, purely distributed system. Um, but um, so, so I wanted to start actually by kind of asking you um, your thoughts on, on federated systems and, and how that differs from the, the, the fully decentralized distributed systems um, and, and if you think there are certain pros and cons uh, of one versus the other. Yeah, sure. Um, am I on? Are you good? Yes, we can hear you. You're good. on do you use? And my answer sheepishly is I don't. Um, I already hate myself enough for using Twitter. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and so, you know, the, the, the larger point here is that Mastodon will succeed or fail not based on the cleverness of its architecture, but whether ultimately it provides a compelling user experience. Um, and this just remains to be seen. Um, you know, it is notable that when Elon Musk first uh, uh, promised, threatened, uh, fever dreamed, uh, I don't know what the exact right word is at this point, to buy Twitter, uh, Mastodon's uh, uh, um, registrations went up and the you know, server crashed because it couldn't, couldn't handle it. So it shows maybe some, some interest. Now, I think what's clever about Mastodon is, is two things. Um, the first is that it is, to the extent it is decentralized, it is decentralized as a matter of architecture, not as a matter just of policy. Um, so for example, you know, this is what I think distinguishes Mastodon's federation versus, let's say, what you might call Reddit's federation, which has its own kind of federated structure, right? You have all these subreddits. Um, and they act with some degree of autonomy. Um, and I think that's good, I'm a big fan of Reddit. Um, but ultimately, because this federation is ultimately of a, as a matter of policy, which is to say Reddit HQ can turn anything off at any moment, um, that puts a lot of pressure on Reddit to do that. And we've seen, in fact, Reddit do that from time to time. Again, I'm not taking a position on whether or not they should have removed whatever subreddits they've removed, um, but it just shows that I think policy, def uh, policy federation or policy decentralization is, only gets you so far. Right, because if you can, at some point someone will argue that you should. And if you can't, well then it's kind of pointless to argue whether you should or not. Um, and I think this is notable, for example, in Mastodon's case, when uh, Gab, which is the kind of far right, one of the kind of MAGA social media platforms, um, started up, they initially used something other than the, the Mastodon, the activity pub protocol, but at some point they realized that, that it's a good protocol and they should use it, because of course it's, it's open source and they're allowed to use it. Um, and people got really upset because it violated um, 
a norm on Mastodon, which they called the no Nazis policy. Um, at which point the Mastodon uh, founder said, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, there's literally nothing I can do. The whole point was to build this thing in a way that I couldn't touch it. Um, and I think for that reason, it's not that the controversy died down, but we quickly moved away from um, debating whether or not someone should shut Gab down because there, you couldn't shut Gab down. And so the network, the broader network had to decide what to do. And what they decided what to do, to do was um, that the major federated plat the major federated instances um, of Mastodon started cutting ties initially with Gab, and then they started cutting ties with anyone who didn't cut ties with Gab, and then Gab decided to hell with all these people, we don't need them anyway, and so now the, the Mastodon network is all these instances, and then Gab, which is its own little island. Um, and I think, I'm not even sure if Gab technically is on the um, network anymore, kind of all depends on, on what you define interoperability for this purpose. But the, the, what I think sort of is, shows is that this worked. I think this is the correct outcome for what it's worth, right? Um, the gabbers get to gab to each other, that's fine. And the rest of Mastodon decided they don't wanna deal with it. And if gab gets really bad, well, both the, the infrastructure and the people exist in real space, they exist within jurisdictions. Um, and uh, you know, governments can deal with that, uh, which I think is also no, you know, appropriate um, at, at some threshold. Um, so to me, it's a pretty good model. Now, there are lots of things that can go wrong, to be clear, right? Um, you know, and this gets, Mike, to your question about what's the difference between federation and decentralization. Um, you, you know, if you have federation, you're gonna have some network effects, um, uh, even though Mastodon makes it relatively easy to, cro to communicate across instances and actually I think even more importantly to leave your instance if you don't like it, but then retain your follower count, which is really, really important. It allows exit um, in the kind of exit voice loyalty framework that people often think about. It allows exit in a way that is not really possible with Twitter or Facebook. Of course, you can exit Twitter or Facebook, but then you've given up this kind of fairly useful um, digital social capital that you have, uh, you have developed. Um, so you still have some network effects. And they kind of follow the, the sort of Zips law, right, um, uh, that you see uh, the uh, power law distribution that you see on, on, on the internet. Um, you know, the top, I, I, I looked, you can look this stuff up. I did like a quick Excel and analysis of this at some point. Um, like the top five instances have something like 80% of the users, which on the one hand is really centralized. On the other hand is way less centralized actually than Twitter and Facebook, of course, where the top instance, there's only one, has 100% of the users. Um, so, you know, depending on what you're comparing it to, it's either super decentralized or super centralized, but that is uh, uh, um, a difference. I mean, the other benefit, I think, of feder uh, federation, which is why I think that's the future, um, is that, um, uh, you know, I think there's a consensus on this panel, I suspect, that content moderation is not going away um, in a uh, decentralized system. It's just, it's just um, morphing, right? It's moving to different areas, and it's really expensive to do well, right? Um, you know, it's expensive to have the people, and uh, if the robot overlords ever get smart enough, it'll be expensive to run them anyway. Um, so one benefit of federation is that it allows for someone to invest in some of those resources to do it well, and then maybe even kind of franchise out those services, those services to others. So again, all this is just to say that um, uh, this is not the last word on Mastodon. Who knows if it'll be successful? Maybe, maybe Blue Sky will be better. I think Blue Sky is super interesting. Um, but Mastodon has the huge benefit of existing um, and operating. And as far as I can tell, working okay. And, and in a world where it's just, you know, trade-offs balanced against other trade-offs, that's, that's not nothing. So, so I wanted to, to discuss, you know, something that I think has come up in a few of these answers, which is this concept of, of kind of the norms, you know, that, that you know, one of the, the reasons why I think a lot of these challenges have come up is that, you know, we sort of outsource the sort of community norm building to centralized platforms, and that creates all sorts of challenges <laughs> uh, and, and, and potentially issues. Um, you know, and, and obviously we're here, we're talking about freedom of expression, um, you know, and, and one element of freedom of expression is also freedom of association or not association. And so it's, you know, I think the, the example of like Gab and how the different Macedon uh, instances dealt with that and decided not not to associate with Gab is actually um, something that's that's really interesting and and worth thinking about. But uh, but I wanted to sort of uh, and this is a question for for anyone. So I'm just going to open it up for anyone to chime in. Is you know is there is norm building 
a technical issue or, or is it something else? Is, is there, you know, because I, I, it feels like to me a lot of the different kinds of attempts, and, and this is a lot of honestly, you know, what was, was interesting to me in the discussion and all the different approaches that people were talking about with Blue Sky was they were all basically taking sort of models of how interaction happens in the real world and norms of how communities form and change and grow or shrink over time and trying to put that into a technological format and hoping that if, if we can put in place this, this technology, the norms will sort of follow. Um, and in some cases, you know, it is about sort of creating the, in the incentives that then create the norms. But like, do, do we think that works? What is the, the basis of, of norm building uh, in, in these kinds of communities? Is, is it technological? Is it other kinds of incentives? What, what is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would be interested to speak to that because that's something I, I do very consciously and that we did kind of consciously in the Blue Sky group. Um, and I think it's, both are very important. Um, you have to make very easy tools for people to adopt a new norm. Um, but also getting someone to adopt a norm in a decentralized space is a really big lift. Even if you've made the best tool, the user adoption is a really, really big lift. So, I mean, it kind of definitely plays back and forth, and that's actually why people were interested in Blue Sky in the first place, because, yeah, it doesn't exist yet, you know, to your point, which is very, you know, very, very valid, um, but people were interested in it because something that, you know, Jack Dorsey's going to promote, something that Twitter's going to promote, okay, this is going to be a big, you know, uh, you know, elephant that's going to go ahead and, uh, and get some adoption going for these norms. So I really like what you just said, uh, Mike, about um, the way making tools for the things we already do. Because I think that is a big part of what's been missing in this kind of very incentivized space where everything's kind of advertiser incentivized. There's a lot of tools for things that help advertisers um, and that track people. And there's, there's a great deal of tools that have been made for the people paying for the space. But we really don't have tools for staking credibility. We don't have tools, we were at Columbia, the School of Journalism, we don't have tools for staking your credibility but protecting your sources. Um, those things aren't really norms and tools yet, and I think those are very important. Um, you do have the ability to kick people out of spaces, you know, who are not behaving. But the problem we have really is you have these kind of human-focused things of, yeah, humans will be humans, and, you know, you got to nudge them. But because of the anon anonymity and the, the new uh, breadth of the Internet, you have something that we don't normally have in a room like this, which is, imagine if this room was about... Two, you know, maybe two thirds of the people here were actually robot holograms that are being controlled by somebody else and they kind of look like people <laughs> because that's really the environment that we're in is you have to figure out which of the people you're interacting with are real people and which are here from a very, very well-funded, you know, uh, coordinated network of bad actors. And so there's some problems that we don't normally encounter as normal people and that we need to figure out how to give essentially what I think are tools for agency um, for people to easily do the things that people normally want to do. Um, but a lot of it is really, really still being discovered. I mean, I agree with you, Mastodon's an excellent example of something that exists, um, but it's going to be hard for Mastodon to deal with some of the things that, for example, Facebook had to deal with, with stuff that was happening in the Burmese language that was causing people to kill other people, which is very hard to detect if you don't have a well-funded bunch of multilingual moderators. So it's these small edge cases that are going to be, you know, attacks into the system that we're going to have to deal with. Yeah, I'd like to, to add a couple of things to that, and I totally agree that, so to me, this is like a hybrid human tech problem, right? That's partly why it's interesting. It's not never before seen under the sun, but some aspects of it are, are novel. Um, and I think if you think about, like, building tools in an environment where you're not thinking about both layers of the effects. Like, for example, t to me, like if you think about par part of what is interesting about social media is that you can sort of selectively repeal laws of the natural world or enhance them. You can have ephemeral speech, but you can make it non-ephemeral. You can cause it to reach more people, fewer people, and you can sort of tinker with, with, with the machinery of the natural world in this artificial space. Um, and I think part of what we're learning is to also 
or part, one of the things I've been interested in and obsessed with is re, re uptaking the wisdom of the natural world into the technological tools that we build. And this is sort of like, I've been reading books about like bees and ecology and like how do you create a self sustaining ecosystem um, and why I named Murmuration Labs after birds um, is because there's at least some amount of ecological thinking that you can do where you can say like if you're building tools in a way where humans are able to both perceive things and act on norms in ways that you say, have, give them agency, but also who can see me, who can I see, do, am I viscerally aware of whom I'm, who I'm affecting, do I understand the scale of the behavior that I'm, that I'm engaging in, um, then you have a better chance of those tools, um, I suppose at the highest level, like connecting with your instincts and limbic system in a way that makes sense and connects your, your personal agency and sense of volition with the effects you have in the world even if we can sort of like augment them and tinker with them in these like artificial environments. So to me, that's sort of the promise of different types of tooling and not just sort of content moderation tooling, but also just the interactions that you're trying to structure is becoming very focused on the types of awarenesses and, ty and the types of um, interactions and agency that you have. Um, and, and just to give one brief example, like when you think about harms, I think, like one of the challenge, one of the very concrete and interesting challenges with this is there's such a selective array of harms, like harms to different individuals, different groups of people, you can harm democracy, so you can like harm an abstract concept, you can harm institutions. Um, and, and when people talk about sort of the subsidiarity principle of like let's put the tools as close to the, at the lowest possible level, as close to the individual as possible to, to like maximize autonomy and wisdom and local knowledge, um, it depends on what you're talking about. So it's like if, if I don't wanna see things that offend me, that's a great tool for me to have where I can just sort of like not see people calling me bad names maybe. But if people are like calling a SWAT team to my house or raising a violent mob to come find me, me not seeing it is not gonna help me a ton. <laughs> and so you really need to track the types of expressive qualities and harms that you're talking about. And then just to, to briefly tie that off, it's not even that simple because if you have like a, a, a human ecology, even if I'm not seeing the insults that people um, sincerely want to level at me, if you sort of um, allow that ecosystem to spiral into misogyny and racism and other forms of like norms around how humans are treated, even if I'm not seeing them, there's these larger second and third order effects around what norms and normalizations you're allowing and encouraging that you should not fail to think about even when you're tracking like specific harms to people in a careful way. So to me, that is a sort of plate spinning that one has to do when you're thinking about what kind of like both positive and, and negative enforcement tooling that you're doing in, in these environments. Okay, from you. So I, I think there's sort of the continuum of kinds and sizes of communities that we might be talking about here. And if, if we're talking about smaller communities like probably a Mastodon instance or like um, if people follow Ethan Zuckerman's work, the very local com online communities he talks about, people are invested in developing the norms and they're gonna put, on, put in that work. And over at the other end is this much more corporate version that I described at the beginning, which is maybe there's a user who wants to go to social media and it's more like watching TV for that person and they want a news feed that's like curated by ESPN because they're sports fans, but then minus anything that violates the values of their church, so they have an overlay of that and they're a feminist and they want an overlay of that. So they you know, kind of delegate decision making to these three outside bodies to contribute to how their news feed is ranked or what content is, is taken down. Um, and, and for that model, which I think is, you know, a, a decent chunk of, of the audience, the uh, <laughs> audience maybe <laughs> betrays how <laughs> unidirectional the communication is in that model, but um, for that, you need a profit motive for ESPN to show up and do that work. You know, maybe the church is gonna show up and do it for free and maybe a feminist organization will show up and do that sort of lens for free. Um, but but I, th I think there's a lot of work that we want done that's expensive. It is expensive to have Burmese speakers. It is expensive to identify what color shirt signifies what political affiliation in Thailand or in the United States or in Ireland. You know, and we can't have all of these nodes replicating the labor of hiring enough people to do the translation and the literal language translation and, and the cultural translation. So there's like an economic problem to be solved here and I, I don't have the solution yet but I, 
I kind of think we just haven't talked about it very much. Like I, I believe there, there may well be a solution of figuring out, you know, do you change ad revenue flows? If we're abandoning ads somehow, where, where's the money come from then? Like how, how do we get um, incentive to those providers and what sort of common tools can we give those providers to reduce the cost of all that pedent potentially redundant moderation in, in different nodes? And, and if we are giving them shared tools, how do we avoid the problems that Evelyn Duick has written about as content cartels, where there's like somebody behind the scenes providing shared information about who is and is not a terrorist, and we're not sure who that is, but we're just gonna trust them. So there, there's a set of problems, but they're, they're, they're nice problems if you're a lawyer in this space because like nobody's worked on them and there's probably actually a way forward. Can I quickly add a thing? Yeah. And so 100% agree with Daphne, and I think the, the, the idea that there's labor being done is very, it's important to like internalize and recognize because somebody's gotta do it. And part of the promise of Web3, I think is like, if you have a community doing it, or you're gonna ask each of us to take on more labor in observing and nudging each other, it makes more sense when you collectively own something. So in some ways, the hard ownership structures and the hard power structures are directly tied to this. It's like you, you can have the miracle of Wiki, Wikipedia moderators who are volunteers, because they believe in that project. You have the maybe larger miracle of Reddit mods who are like volunteering for a private corporation. Um, and you can ask like, what, what are the various human factors that cause people to behave that way? And I think one of the, one of the at least promises of, of distributed or Web3 platforms is to say like, it is more authentic. The word community is a little bit more meaningful when the folks who are doing all that labor, if you're gonna spread it out more, are gonna participate in some kind of either financial upside or governance um, control or some other sort of stakeholder. Yeah, or, 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 so they have hard power as opposed to being client, you know, customers of a corporation. I just wanna to add to that, or a reputational system, because I think whenever you'd have completely anonymized financial systems, it's a lot more subject to manipulation. And so the kind of some of these frictionized tokens or localized tokens even, you could, reputation, financial, and government, I think would be the three pillars, but yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's actually really interesting to explore. As, as Daphne was talking, I also my mind also went to sort of Wikipedia, right? Because before Wikipedia existed, I think most people would assume and did assume that like the idea that you were going to get an entirely volunteer, you know, totally open, anyone can edit uh, encyclopedia to work was was ridiculous, and there was no way you would get that labor that the quality would be any good and that it would, it would last and, and not be widely abused. And yet we've seen that all, all of that has, to some extent, come to pass. It's certainly not, not perfect, but there are different things that, that created these incentives in there that I, that I thought were, were, were really interesting. Um, and um, and, and the, the one other thing I'll note, too, is that uh, and, and we can we can discuss this in a second as well. Is that um, you know the the financial aspect of it, which is like a big part of Web three, I think takes a, a lot of the oxygen out of the room when we have these discussions. I think it is important, and obviously economic incentives absolutely matter. Um, but um, a lot of people start to assume that, that the financial incentives are the only ones, and that often distorts, di distorts the thing. Um, I, I want to make sure, Alan, that, that we're not ignoring you since you're on the screen. Do you, do you want to, you have something to weigh in on? Uh, yeah, how, how could you ignore me with what appears to be a 15-foot giant <laughs> picture of my face <laughs> looming it's behind us? Um, God, I'm, no, one's, no one's sleeping tonight. Um, yeah, so, you know, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer and I'm a law professor, so I think I, I think of this in the legal context, but one thing that is interesting, I mean, you asked at the very beginning of, of what we started talking about was, you know, is this an issue of technology or it's an issue of norms? And of course the answer is, well, there's all these interesting interactive effects and how you set up the technology you know, has an effect on what norms develop. And there's true from a legal sense too, right? I mean, you can make an analogy, I think, to at least how we do it in America, where you have, to oversimplify enormously, you have a, uh, uh, a strong um, legal principle of government non-censorship, which you can think of sort of as the mastodon uh, principle of I can't do anything, <laughs> um, I'm not allowed to. Um, and that requires certain norms to develop, right? Certain, you would think of as self-help norms, um, where people have to deal with their own problems and they have to negotiate and they have to develop social norms. Also, you have the subconstitutional principles like property law that help with that because of course, if the government's not gonna uh, censor anyone, well, it's then important for you to be able to kick them out of your house or your store or your whatever the case 
uh, uh, is. So I think there's a similar sense in which um, the technological choices that you make, for example, if Mastodon makes a choice of, well, we can't, as a technological matter, do any sort of global moderation, then that requires the, the instances in the community itself to develop different norms than what you might have on Facebook and Twitter, where you can, if you make enough of a stink, cause Mark Zuckerberg or you know, Jack Dorsey to do something. Um, so so that, that's, that's, that's one point. The other point I just wanted to make when we talk about the, the, whether it's the legal or even financial incentives, right? Um, here, there are some interesting issues to think about in terms of what sort of legal principles would, would help with this sort of decentralized moderation, right? So I think Section 230 is a good example. Um, and, and on the one hand, you know, we all groan when, when it's brought up because we've talked about it to death, but the Supreme Court has just decided um, two hours ago uh, that it's going to talk about it a lot. Yeah, I <laughs> see Daphne. Yep, Daphne, you look how I feel. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and I think whatever you think about 230, and I think one can think many things, um, including at the same time, um, there's no question that if you don't provide some very, very serious liability protections to these, um, I'm thinking in the Mastodon context, um, nonprofit volunteer run instances, um, you're gonna have some real problems. And so it's an interesting thing to, to reflect on uh, that you know, if the justification for 230 initially was the nascent uh, nature of the internet and now with internet giants, we can maybe ask whether we need it in quite the same way. Um, certainly I think these instances um, whether Mastodon or whatever is going to happen with Blue Sky, for example, um, uh, we, we are right back to the need for this sort of protection on both legal and, uh, to Mike's point, financial grounds. So that, that brings up a really good question that, that I think is worth discussing, especially with, you know, um, sort of the nature of, of this conference as well, is, is, you know, what is the intersection of, of the regulatory space and, and the policy space on actually either making any of this happen or preventing any of this from happening, which is, is my general fear, that a lot, a lot of the uh, regulatory proposals and, um, and, and policy proposals that are out there today are so focused on, you know, how do we limit Facebook, mainly, um, that they don't necessarily recognize how they might also kind of kill some of these ideas before they ever really have a chance to, to take off. So, um, does anyone want to talk about kind of like how, how do we structure the regulatory environment in a way that actually enables this? Uh, I'll jump in with some pieces of what I think we're seeing right Perfect. now. Perfect. So there's a real um, like some, some competing pressures in the regulatory environment where on the one hand people enacting competition laws like ICOA in the US or the DMA in Europe, they want interoperability. And sometimes that is explicitly, you know, some version of interoperability is explicitly part of those laws. And then the people whose concern is content regulation and like making sure that illegal stuff gets off the internet or maybe trying to get legal stuff off the internet too, uh, they don't like interoperability <laughs> because that reduces the number of, uh, you know, pressure points you have to get to in order to get content taken down. And I don't think those two are speaking to each other necessarily, so we get a little bit of like a random intersection um, of consequences. And then there's a, a third piece. So always in this space, there's a triangle of privacy, competition, content. So there's the privacy piece, which I think gets neglected a fair amount. And I, I wrote about this in my Journal of Democracy issue um, about middleware or protocols, not platforms, which is, if, you, if I have a friend on Facebook and my friend shares her breastfeeding picture with me and I have subscribed to some fly-by-night <laughs> ranking service, <laughs> the kind I was just extolling, um, you know, I have to share all the content in my feed, including this privately shared image that my friend maybe didn't want that fly-by-night service to get its hands on and maybe that service is Cambridge Analytica and you know it betrays my trust and I've trusted them on behalf of my friend who had no say in the matter and you know suddenly all of our, our data is in the hands of somebody we who is unreliable. So there, there's a privacy piece that also needs to be solved and that one I don't think there is a magic bullet. I think there are only solutions that are trade-offs of competition and privacy values with an overlay of the content stuff we're talking about here. So it's hard but it needs to be part of the conversation or we won't come to a resolution. Yeah, I, I think it's... Can I, can I, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm about to go to you, don't worry. No, okay. uh, I saw you raise your hand, don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, no, I, I think it's really important, and I think it's, it's something that is underexplored, is how much all of this is connected, and, and how moving the needle in one area will impact other areas significantly, and how, especially in the policymaking space, they seem to be developing these ideas mostly in silos. All right, Alan, go for it. Okay, good. Now, now I know that the, the, the raised hand button works. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so no. So, so, so as an example of the danger of this sort of silo thinking, um, I, I think we can look at the the um, recent uh, circuit court decisions coming out of the 11th and 5th circuits regarding the Florida and Texas social media laws, um, which to, to make Daffy's head explode even more may be uh, going to the Supreme Court too uh, this term. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and and I mention that because. You know, I, I think that this question of interoperability and what sort of mandates you could require, it's, it's a hard enough policy question for all the reasons Daphne just uh, articulated without adding what I think is a very unhelpful constitutional overlay of, for example, um, is, uh, you know, does editorial discretion extend to who you get to share data with and would an interoperability mandate violate the First Amendment, for example? Um, and, and I mention this because um, the recent litigation that's touching on First Amendment issues with platforms has not, um, how shall I say, um, has not uh, filled me with, uh, has not encouraged me that uh, uh, we are a legally mature enough uh, uh, society to deal with these well, right? If you want a very, you know, for example, angry analysis of the Fifth Circuit opinion, uh, Mike wrote a great post about it. If you want a <laughs> only slightly less angry uh, version, I wrote about it for, for Lawfare. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, I think we can probably both agree that the way the First Amendment analysis has played out, you know, I think in both cases, but especially in the Fifth Circuit case, suggests that we are still in this real all or nothing um, view that could have enormously distorting effects on all of these other issues, right? Um, that you know, if we can't even agree that these are difficult questions that require nuance and require some flexibility beyond just the First Amendment protects all of, you know, protects Facebook in the same way that it protects your and my ability to say what we want on this panel, on the one hand, or the First Amendment doesn't protect any of this because this is lefty censorship, um, which is literally the position of both these states and as far as I can tell the Fifth Circuit. There's no hope to have a nuanced a discussion of the really difficult, not just policy, but also legal and maybe on the margins constitutional issues that we may have to address in order to encourage and in some cases uh, mandate, if that's the direction we want to go in, uh, interoperability. So this is just another example of the danger um, of the unintended second order consequences of not just thinking in siloed ways, but thinking in siloed ways and being immature within the silos. Yeah, and, and just uh, in case anyone watching this is not familiar, the, 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 the Fifth Circuit ruling was about, Texas has this law that effectively limits the ability of, of websites to moderate content. Uh, and Florida passed a similar law in the 11th Circuit, said that was fairly obviously unconstitutional. And with, with Texas's law, the Fifth Circuit, in a fairly snarky, condescending ruling, said, no, of course of course, the state can, can limit this. Th those laws used to be fairly obviously constitutional. Yes. Unconstitutional. Yes. Well, well, Sorry. The, uh, it's yeah. all in flux. Yes, it's, it is very much in flux, and we, 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 we will see what happens. One, one thing I did want to raise just specifically, and, and then we'll get others into discussion too, is like we use some terms here that, that um, aren't necessarily interchangeable. And, and, and um, when we talk about like distributed decentralized systems, and we talk about interoperability, and we talk about APIs or, or like data uh, export and, and transportability, those are not all the same things. And I think that's actually kind of important because, you know, uh, uh, what, what I've seen a lot is, you know, w when I talk about decentralized systems and sort of the, the potential power of them to enable some really interesting new, new services and new, new ways of handling speech questions, um, you know, I, I then see a lot of policymakers come back at me with like, well, which we'll, we'll, we'll mandate interoperability, which is not quite the same thing. Interoperability, you know, right now, Facebook and Twitter and Google allow you to export all of your data, and then you have nothing to do with it because, you know, nothing, nothing quite works with it. You know, the, the idea of interoperability is that, okay, other things could be built to work with it, but still, 
you know, Facebook still controls all the original data, which gets to some of the privacy questions that Daphne was raising. Um, but, you know, in theory, there could be a fully decentralized system where, you know, none of these companies control the data, that maybe you control your own data in some sort of encrypted data blob somewhere, and you allow, like, Facebook to have slight access to it or, you know, you know, Mastodon to have some access to it or Blue Sky or whoever it is, and you decide you have more control over it. Um, that's sort of the world that I think is, is most interesting, but also raises other issues. <laughs> so all of these are, are challenges, but I think it's important to, to be clear on the language because I, I sometimes feel that, you know, the discussion leads very quickly to, oh, interoperability is what you're talking about, and there, there are other yeah, models I around mean, that. I mean, there's, there be lions in that forest, because if you're mandating yes. interoperability, that would be a method of them mandating that certain content could get into Twitter that otherwise couldn't get into it. But if, you, if you'd like, I can kind of quickly run down the terms for you here. And, and I wanted to actually respond to one of the things about Mastodon. Um, so some people talk about a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system, and that's something where you know your data is all stored on some physical thing that you like, or it might be stored on S3, wherever it's stored is wherever you decided to store it, and you're sending messages to other people that you choose from your node, and that's where you have kind of the least centralized help with moderation. Um, you might have to talk about a federated system where stuff lives on node operators and people just like, I'll subscribe to this node, and I can then, you know, like you said, you could take your account and, and export it, and then because in Mastodon it is, well, I mean, really, we're talking about activity streams is the protocol. Mastodon is an instance of activity streams, and there's a W3C standard for how those things interoperate. Um, but you can take your, your, essentially, your account out and import it into another node. Um, I think there's a lot of places where the devil's in the details. Um, and I just want to show an example of one without getting too far in the weeds here, is that it takes centralization or federated agreements to implement certain things that might be important to people. And an example is the ability to block people on Twitter, just to give you a very concrete example. On, if you're doing a decentralized system and you just want to make sure you don't see other people, that's easy because you can filter it right here. But on Twitter, you can block people from seeing you. And that's something that you actually can't do right now on Mastodon. And there were some people who really wanted it because people were harassing them in a way by seeing their toots and then saying stuff about them. And they couldn't stop people from seeing their toots. And this was actually an argument that he had with the creator of Mastodon who said, oh, this is too hard. I'm not going to implement it. Um, and so that ability to block someone from seeing you would require federated agreements that, well, he said to block him, and if you don't honor that, now I'm not going to talk to you. And so there's certain types of things that require more sophisticated federated agreements. Um, so again, the devil gets into the details, and we don't have time to get into all the weeds, but that's why the policy hammer you have to be very careful on, because the policy people probably have no concept of what they might be doing with that big hammer, and so you have to kind of be very careful to tie it to something kind of concrete, rather than making kind of a big forceful hammer uh, that you might not know the consequences of. Yeah, and to add, I think, one or a couple more examples to this, the, and, and you have this sort of like public law regulatory aspect and this like private law structuring ordering aspect. Um, I suppose since ye olde internet laws of the 90s, we've been saying like, be careful to not over calcify the categories of the day into things that are gonna constrain technologies of the future. And we've been saying it for a while, um, and, and possibly nobody believes us anymore, but um, when you look at sort of the way that the mental model of something like the GDPR or even the mental model of something like CDA 230 or DMCA, and then you put that next to trying to comply when you have a, a decentralized system, it's very hard because like a lot of the definition of like what is an actor or who is acting on what is not always super clear as a closing. And so you have to do things in sort of often contorted and odd ways because of the conceptual models that happen to be available at the time. And since we're at Columbia, I wanted to just shout out one other thing, which is I feel like this is one of the seats of, of, of the hipster antitrust movement is that the competition aspect of this for for Web3, to me, are seen larger and larger because, again, while, while Web3 may not be forms of human collaboration heretofore never imagined under the sun, there are a lot of different types of collaboration with large open source projects or many companies collaborating together to try to accomplish something or ownership that is divided through complex structures. And it would be a shame for antitrust and competition regulators to look at this and just say, like, 
I see 99 different versions of cartels. Um, these are not productive or not good. This is like collusion nation. And in fact, like a, a mental model of what forms of collaboration are productive and useful, um, you know, and also account for the privacy and content issues, I think could be, a, could be a big opportunity or could become a huge problem if we continue relying on or calcifying, you know, the, the classical ways we've been thinking about the, the, the tech company as an actor. Yeah. Um, if I could just add something to that really quickly, is that the other big issue with regulation is that we're now affecting people who do not have a voice at the table because the regulation is affecting all the people in the Middle East, all the people in China, all the people you know, in Hong Kong, all the people in Taiwan. Well, Taiwan has, has, has a voice. But there's people who don't have a voice who are being affected by these regulations, who don't have a seat at the table making them and may not necessarily understand exactly how it's going to affect them. But I think it's an issue that we're making all these decisions that are not just affecting the normal jurisdiction because of, of the fact that you're, you're actually impacting all these people and you may not be hearing the, and prioritizing the problems that they're actually having. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, if I can say, it's, it, often these technologies are a pass-through for expression, so like, you may think you're punishing Mark Zuckerberg, but in fact, you're punishing a bunch of people who are trying to post things. So like, don't let that ire you might have against individuals or companies as a regulator, like, cause, the, cause that pass-through nature of expression to not be clear when you're wielding the hammer. Um, so I, I wanted to, to take some questions from the audience. I think do, do, is there a, there's a microphone, um, and we ha we have a, a question up front here. Um, I think this question's for Golda. So um, the content moderation discussion is interesting, and I was trying to quickly look on the ADX GitHub. Um, have you looked into like I think DeFi has like an interesting analog to consider. So. Have you looked into like Chainlink oracles or Teller or oracles where they decentralize the provision of off-chain data by essentially paying reporters in tokens to provide, like, like, so the analogy I'm trying to make is you have civil society organizations all over the world in global, in the global south, in China, in Myanmar, we're, I mean, mm -hmm. we are a civil society organization in Myanmar and operating on shoestring budgets with locals who have fluency in the native language mm -hmm. and the, the social and political context. Um, it would be like very interesting if Blue Sky offered something like a content moderation oracle where you'd have reporters who are these civil society organizations who can get paid, like if you worked out the tokenomics, who could get paid for doing content moderation. I was just wondering if you like that's like a yeah. true decentralized yeah. solution, I think. No, no, I, I, I think I think both yes and no. So I haven't looked specifically at Chainlink. I think the one I'm more familiar with is like Kleros, and Kleros is someone that we should bring up because it sort of is kind of doing small scale courts on the internet. Um, and I think that's both promising and a little bit dangerous because I think in less, my personal opinion, and, and so ADX right now is not trying to tackle moderation directly. ADX is trying to tackle a scalable protocol you know, for, for decentralized communication that might work with Twitter. And I think Jay's perspective on it in terms of, of, of the content moderation, she'd like to see some of these solutions come up organically and not necessarily be imposed in a top-down way. Um, and I think that tokenomics, yes, but I think unless you have some type of friction or permanent reputation, the difference between the tokenomics of like, you know, blockchain and crypto and the tokenomics of this is that the people trying to take over cryptos have only financial incentives, so financial incentives work against them. The people trying to control the disinformation are basically trying to bid for the US government and the nuclear codes, and so they have a different type of financial incentives than the people who are just trying to mis, you know, misuse crypto networks. So I think that, yes, there should be financial incentives for reporters and there should be some kind of decentralized token, but I also think that it has to be tied to some type of non-transferable reputation for it to work. And I am hopeful that something will come out, and I think we're hoping for it to emerge. Just, just one more yeah, let, let's, okay. okay. We, well, we here, can let, talk about let's, that. Let's yeah. go to the next question. Thanks for this uh, spectacularly uh, brilliant and thought-provoking panel, first of all. To pick up on your point, that the, uh, Golda, that the vast majority of people have absolutely no say in how they're being governed. Um, you make the vital point that that is the case for people all over the world um, outside the United States and Europe. It's also the case for almost everybody in the United States and Europe. Um, as you think, uh, all of you, about 
um, federating uh, online life, can you um, see opportunities for some kind of representation uh, being built into federated systems? It's a, a loaded question, of course, since I think it's vital. And a second really quick question related to another kind of subtext of the panel about norms. Alex, you, you said a lot about the fact that human behavior is principally governed uh, well, I, I'm going to riff on what you said rather than put words in your mouth. Human behavior is principally governed by informal norms, not uh, formal law. Um, we know quite a bit, there is quite a bit of uh, quite robust research on how to change human behavior, and there have been demonstrations, many of those in the last 100 or 200 years, of gigantic changes in human behavior, such as, for example, the decrease in smoking in many societies or drunk driving. Um, is there room for, for optimism for perhaps also with some uh, um, structural representation online uh, that would in fact allow people to build and reinforce norms in a salutary way um, in digital life? I, I'll, I can give a quick, my take on it, and, and other people should definitely. I mean, my hope is that we increase the norm of agency, of people taking more agency and more responsibility, not only for their own actions, but having the agency to have, no, if there is no center, where is the center? Well, the only logical center is yourself. You know, your view of the internet should be centered on things that you have intentionally said you trust, intentionally things you, you have wanted. So, so my ideal of the future is sort of this you know, trust-linked system that exists uh, with some central providers of indexed things that need to be happening, that, that each person kind of has a norm of having a little bit more agency of like, okay, maybe it's not quite as slick as the environment <laughs> that I'm used to, but if, if we can exchange just a little bit of that slickness and easiness of, for a norm of choosing your view into the world and each person having more agency, that's my hope. Uh, I, I would also say, like, I think on one level, the, the logic of this is more like market logic and less like democracy logic, that sort of you vote with your eyeballs. You go to the node that does have the rules you want. If it doesn't exist, maybe you build that node. Um, and that's good, but it also has limits. And, and so hopefully the next step, once those options even exist, is you see something more like, you know, open source software communities, you know, elective affinities, people doing things voluntarily, you know, building actual communities in ways that bring more, um, you know, non-market questions about governance to bear. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll, I'll add to that, I think I agree with Daphne too, is there are some interesting experiments um, there's like, uh, what's his name, Aviv uh, Avadia? He has a citizen. Uh, yeah, he's, he has this idea of like platform democracy um, where you, you sort of build like citizen councils and and, and I believe like, I, I didn't read the details, but Facebook is now experimenting with something along those lines, so I'm not exactly sure of all the details there. And there are other examples that he's written about uh, that are that are really interesting, and and as a potential model of like involving participants in in determining how, how these things can work, um, are, are really interesting, and, and and in a very thoughtful way, because I think you know there's one view which is like oh you just let it open it up and everyone has a vote, and that creates its own issues, and th there are all sorts of different ways of of exploring it, and I think there's some interesting models there that could work well with some of these decentralized distributed systems. And I think, you know, we're, with all of this stuff, we're in the really, really early days of it, and everybody's experimenting and trying to figure stuff out. And so the more that people are talking about and sort of sharing these ideas, I think, I think we'll get more and more interesting experiments. Yeah, this, this is like content moderation jury duty, um, <laughs> right. which, I, which I, I joke about, but actually, like, you learn all the time, like, the number of people who have a positive experience and come out of jury duty believing in the civic system more is, like, in the 80, like, 84% or something. Like, Jury duty is good, generally, although we all avoid it. Um, I, I wanted to say um, uh, uh, that one of the things that gives me cause for optimism, um, in line with what Goldo was saying, is that if you talk to a, like a VC who's been doing VC work for five minutes, the first thing they'll say to you is like, it doesn't scale, as meant as a criticism, like that thing you're talking about doesn't scale. And at least one of the promises of decentralized community building, to me, is that 
it has the promise of allowing communities to have this fractal structure where you can have local communities. So you can, like you're, when you're talking about it in the democratic sense, you can have communities you belong to that are smaller, that plug into larger communities and aggregate into something that is very large, but you don't plug directly into a large impersonal like postmodern institution that makes you feel alienated and, and whatever. And so to me, that is partly what this federated tool making or decentralized community allows is to start operating at a scale in which norms can operate because, because they need to be small enough. And then the manner that it scales is not necessarily trying to get to two billion users. The manner it scales is sort of fractal where these communities aggregate into something larger. And you can also belong to very large communities that are more like spectatorial in nature and then smaller ones that are more participatory in nature. And if you have like a plurality of these systems, you'll have something closer to input than what you have now, especially if you know, if you are re playing with um, the different ownership models or the different governance models of these. So to me that like plural, that sort of like plural, pluralistic future of plugging into lots of smaller communities through these different like tech facilitations is, um, again, I don't know that it is like mind blowingly new, but it is like somewhat helpful. And we have technology that makes it smoother than what we had, you know, 50 years ago. Um, we, we have a few more hands. Every, everybody's on this side. I don't know if anyone has questions on this <laughs> side. But, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a question here. Hi, um, Mike, thanks for mentioning uh, Aviv's papers on platform governance. You know, I, I love I, Aviv's ideas, and but one thing that I've talked to him about is how are they representative? Because there are some people who have more time to do these types of things. Mm -hmm. My husband loves his video games, he, he mods his Discord channel, I don't have time for that, you know, raising a family and things like that. So, you know, we've heard similar criticisms of, say, the types of people who engage most on wiki, right? And wiki editors. So how do you, how do you have a decentralized platform governance structure that is truly representative, not self-selecting in the people who have the most time? Yeah, I, 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 oh, yeah. oh yeah. sorry. I'll, 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 uh, I, I think that that's like a, a hugely important question uh, and, and one that is really interesting. There was a, um, a paper um, that I saw and I'm blanking on whether or not it was released yet or if I just saw a pre-release copy. So um, I'll hesitate to name who, the details. But like it was talking about uh, in particular DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organiza organizations and how active the participants were because that is sort of a... In, in theory, they were sort of presented as this kind of like democratic organizational system where different people vote and that has token elements and, and, and staking. Um, and what it found was like there was a really, really tiny percentage of people who actually were like deeply involved and basically like, you know, took on, you know, all of their time was spent, you know, sort of doing that while most of the people did nothing. And so it, it creates some, some really interesting, interesting challenges and questions that I think people are still figuring out. Alan, did, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I did. I mean, I, mostly I just want to associate myself with, with Daphne's remarks uh, from the previous question, right, which is, which is that you have to start with the, I think, economic market power and then the, the kind of representational questions I, I think have to be follow from that, right? Part, part of that is for the, the reasons that the, the, the questioner mentioned, right, which is not, not everyone has time for the representational stuff, but just by participating we engage in the sort of market or for our eyeballs and our attention. And the other reason, of course, being that you can have all the representation you want, um, but it's not clear what's gonna happen with it. I mean, Facebook famously allowed users to vote um, until it became um, <laughs> inconvenient. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I do think that a focus on representation, while important, um, and I, I feel like such a neoliberal shill saying this, I mean, I think in, in this context just has to be, uh, has to be a secondary consideration to getting the kind of market mechanism uh, right, which is why I think the issues of, you know, exit and stuff are, are so important. Yeah, I mean, a, a, as far as the representation, I think that in a sense, you're, if you have the strength of delegating it, people are going to want to earn your trust because they want to be delegated to. So giving people tools to really optionally delegate to who they want is giving them some power, even if they don't have time to do the thing. And, and the other thing I would just say that in our experience in terms of a DAO-like organization, you really do have to, it's good that some people are doing the work, but also there's some people who are just talkers and controllers. And so having a way that people can delegate kind of bottom-up or recognize work or have a, a really good mechanism of bottom-up like peer review 
those types of things can give more power to the people who maybe are too busy but are doing valuable things and, and trying to have those mechanisms. So, so I texted Aviv and I just thought I'd let you know what he said. Um, uh, so <laughs> we're, we're a decentralized <laughs> panel. Hi, Aviv. <laughs> um, I mean, so, so payment is one method, right? Like being you know, like similar to jury duty, you have to make sure it's a fair amount of payment. You want to ensure that child care, elder care, disability transport are covered and at least contemplated by the system and taken into account. Um, there's another bubble there, so maybe there's more information coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and wow, um, uh, yeah, you need more resources per person for participation, but I suppose the question is you have to allocate resources in a manner that is maybe um, works differently than the way our current jury system does, which is a combination, I guess, of like mandatory coercion and a little bit of of cash and, and one exemption. Um, and, and just to endorse what Alan and, and Dabby said, I, I, don't, I don't think everything is squishing norms from the bottom up and we rely on people. Like there's, I've, I've learned sometimes the hard way that the hard power backstop or like the crunchy center is often like the prime mover from which all of the soft power flows. And so the allocation of power of like these hardcore economic incentives or who the final decider will be, whether it's like law enforcement or some you know, some lawyer or some other like um, authority figure will eventually potentially collide with a lot of these bottom up norm um, f forming aspirations in ways that could be really ugly and ways that could be really violent. So I feel like I've gotten involved with lots of idealistic things where we eventually ran up against the brick wall of hard power and realized like, oh, next time everybody's gonna be thinking about avoiding all of these things that cause us to get into this situation. So. I don't think that that is like anywhere near solved and I don't want to pretend that those like more traditional corporate power structures are repealed or not operating <laughs> in decentral land. Or government power structures. That one too. <laughs> um, do, do we have some questions on this side of the room? I see one. Oh. I have, I have. Ooh, sorry. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about like whether this moves content moderation up the stack and like where um, do these protocols require CDNs and servers and is there a risk at all that um, this just creates sort of pressure on servers, AWS to, to you know, moderate the actual protocols themselves if they allow for content that right now um, social media platforms are, you know, pressured to moderate. I'd say it moves it up and down, right? So if you have all these federated nodes doing things that are illegal, um, or even things that are extremely unpopular, and the only one that can cut them off is someone, you know, is a Cloudflare uh, or a DNS provider, you know, whatever, then yeah, it moves pressure down the stack. On the other hand, at least in the like, kind of simplistic version I started out describing where you still have Facebook, it's just on top of it, there are these layers. It's almost like it's made the stack one layer taller and Facebook takes on something more like the neutrality obligations or like, you know, neutrality as to lawful content or you know, something uh, that we currently associate with things like ISPs. So it's, it's moving things up and down the stack kind of no matter how you do it, I think. And, and there's sort of independent pressure right now, as you're saying, to do more moderation at the, in, at what is traditionally called the infrastructure layer. Mike has written about this a bunch, and we've talked about it. Um, and so that's sort of like a concurrent development with this. Um, yeah. And I, I would say one of my adages in this area is like all, all content disputes eventually escalate to storage disputes or payment disputes, because either you're gonna wanna take somebody down for good or you're gonna wanna deprive them of money. And so this is sort of why the Web3 and Bitcoin credos are like stabilizing, or I guess providing decentralized payment and storage solutions so that the things that sit on top of it are more resilient, um, however you right. want to define those. But, but I think you're right that this, the pressure to do infrastructure interventions, pressure from governments, pressure from non-digital rights activist groups um, is mounting. And so it's going to collide, I think, with the tools of Web3 in interesting ways. Yeah, I mean, I would point out there's some historical, you know, provenance for that because, uh, you know, back in like 1995, if you st put up a server and somebody complained about the content on the server, they would call your NOC, your network operation center, and say, hey, can, and then you might get a phone call from your NOC. I mean, I, I got cut off and then I was like, why did you cut me off? And it was like, well, the CIA said somebody hooked into your server and was attacking a Department of Defense site. I was like, oh, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I mean, it, it's, it's not unprecedented for there to be 
pressures at those levels, even though you know we, we have this concept of, of neutrality. And in fact, right now with the you know Russia Ukraine war, there was pressure for uh, cloud you know Cloudflare to stop protecting some of the Russian bank sites. And I you know and we uh, they did actually stop protecting. I don't know if it was the banks. They did stop protecting certain sites. So you know you really can't get away from from that. You're always making a decision of where your resources go, and you can't pretend that that you're just unaware of everything inside. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's just sort of the nature of any of these things is that, you know, the, the pressure will search for some way to get certain content down, and so it'll move up and down the stack wherever wherever it can find a, a bottleneck or, or, or a pressure point. Yeah. I, I will note, we had a, a giant Cory Doctorow head up here over, <laughs> over us, which is <laughs> kind of cool uh, in a sort of yeah. science can, fiction-y can, way. Can I say one, one more thing yeah. about it really quick, Mike? Because, I mean, for example, at some time as you should, there's an internet cut off in Tigray, okay? But who cuts off the internet? It's the ISP that's providing services in Eritrea, and that ISP has board members that I can email and copy mic on if I wanted to. And so, you know, there is a chain, and when there's harm, I think you do have to be able to propagate back up the chain, and of course, that's also an attack vector, but. Um, I think we have time for one more question, I guess. I don't know, I'm losing track of time, but yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, ask, I guess, all of the panelists what they thought about um, the interaction between the internet ecosystem and other forms of media with respect to decentralization. So there are tremendous benefits, I agree, about decentralization, um, but they still exist within a more complex ecosystem where, for a lot of part of the world, their um, uh, information comes from radio or from newspapers, but those sources of information are highly influenced by the information that's put out online. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, some of the, the uh, overpopulating of, of uh, uh, rumors and propaganda, for example. Um, so in part, it's a little bit the question of representation because there are so many people in the world who are affected. Um, but it's also a question, I think, of equity because uh, these ideals about decentralization might not be shared equally. Um, and so how can we involve or, or affect the, the larger ecosystem? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one, one small question is like, maybe some decentralization in the media ecosystem could also be good, you yeah. know? Like, do we need every broadcaster to be owned by Sinclair? Um, <laughs> so th some of the logic applies, I think, the same there. Yeah, and to some extent, I mean, I think these things are, are obviously all connected, just like we were talking about before, like the different policies silos are also connected. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's always going to be, you know, uh, wells of gravity, I guess, of attention, right? That, that, you know, whether you're talking about traditional media or social media or whatever, we, you know, you describe it, there's always going to be people who have outsized influence and power and, and you know, get the most attention. But, you know, I think that, you know, one of the, the most effective ways of, of challenging that is, is enabling, you know, more people to have to have voice that they, that can counter those things and try and you know push out the messaging of of why you know certain things might not be as trustworthy. And again, we get back to all the same things that we've been discussing for the last hour of you know the norms and and, and structure like that. But no, you're it, it is an important point that these things are all connected and and social media doesn't live in a vacuum uh, as compared to the rest of the world. I I would say like, and I sort of spent four or five years on this at Medium. Um, um, in some ways, we're running a lot of natural or, or arguably unnatural experiments in like Kosian unbundling and, and rebundling right now of like, what does a decentralized newsroom look like? Can you have fact checkers over here and editors over there and then on Substack freelance writers or does like the ethical, do the ethical institutions of a newsroom as we understand it require certain types of sitting under the same roof and being centralized? And I think we're running I mean, we're, we're running experiments in this right now, I would say, um, and there will be externalities and, and problems and costs, but I think it's probably a salutary development that what we have assumed always needed to be under one roof with like a large media corporation and having all these different arms as necessarily being like under the Kosian corporation, it's very possible that decentralizing parts of it could lead to better outcomes, especially if you have like an international network of contributors or all these other things. And so. 
it's worth funding, and I'm not saying it'll bring back local news magically, but it, it could tend in that direction um, if, if you find the right combination. Um, are, are we, we're out of time? All right. <laughs> oh, we got one more question? Okay. The microphone, so I have it. So I wanted to just <laughs> ask you, um, and again, maybe it's for later conversation as well, but, and you know, far be it from me to stand here and, or I guess I'm sitting, and you know, defend centralization. But there's, there's a way in which the discussion seems to be, you know, like the protocols approach is great for the developed world, but potentially really bad for the developing world. And I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit, I mean, I know we're really out of time, but you know, on the one hand, there's the economics of doing this in the developing world, but there's also the problem of government demands mm -hmm. and government repression. Yeah. And I wonder if, like, how does this fit into a world in which we just genuinely have different experiences? Um, and so that's really just a I mean, comment I, and a question. I, I'd like to speak to that. I mean, I think it's very, very important to have the decentralized and small walled garden. So I, and I would also like to kind of throw out a challenge to all of us and, and, and to people listening that this isn't a theoretical discussion. This is a right now discussion. And I would like to say that if we're doing something useful, the test of if it's useful is if it's actually helping some of the people who have these situations right now. So like every morning I kind of you know, read my, all my messages, which includes messages on signal from women in Afghanistan, which includes messages on signal from you know, people in a number of different locations in northern Syria where there's a cholera ep epidemic right now. And I think it's incumbent on all of us, especially who are sitting here in a place that's very uh, you know, somewhat protected, um, to create those strong relationships that then can transmit those people's concerns directly. And I would say that you really have to think of us all really as one large human network and some of us happen to be in places that are more protected because we have representation and the power that's affecting us and some people are in a, a, a position where they don't have representation and people that have physical power over them but that's why they need to be strongly linked into this network and it'd be nice if maybe on the next version of this panel we had we could zoom in a woman in Afghanistan we could zoom in a guy in Syria in this panel just as easily as we could zoom in somebody else and I think that would be a really good thing for us to do so we could have those different perspectives um, as far as the centralization, I don't see that centralization is necessarily more helpful for the developing world. Most of the people I know there will only speak freely on signal channels and groups, and also some people will just speak to people they trust over WhatsApp or whatever. They're not going to speak publicly unless they think that they're anonymous, and most people don't trust that they're anonymous, so they're not going to speak freely on these central channels because they're afraid of getting hurt. But that's why also it's really important that somebody who is protected could speak for them and say that, hey, I know that this tweet about people getting burned to death in this village and me Myanmar is true, and I'm not going to tell you who told me, but I know this is true, even though it came from an anonymous account that just got created yesterday, but I know it's true. And you have to be willing to go ahead and stake your credibility on behalf of other people, and those people are going to talk to you because they trust you because someone introduced you to them, and you're talking to them on signal. So I don't, I think decentralization is still important. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I mean, I think that, um, you know, if you're, I think you're right. You're raising the right questions and, and the right points about, you know, the um, less developed parts of the world and, and and less privileged areas. But, you know, those are the places where they can do more to put pressure on centralized uh, providers, and uh, and that's where I actually think that decentralization can have the most impact, in that it allows for ways to sort of route around. That, that structure and power and control and to enable people to, ha to have these voices that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have otherwise. So I'm not sure, I, I, I think you're raising an important point, but I'm not sure I agree with the premise that, that decentralization is, is, more, is more problematic for them or even less accessible to them. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends a ton on context and which thing you're, you're talking about. I would say like the, the, in, the current enthusiasm for decentralization um, is I would say an understandable outgrowth of a bunch of things, including the perception that we have large centralized corporate actors right now that imperil you know, freedom and other things. And that manifests in antitrust enthusiasm and decentralization and other, other movements. Um, it's certainly not good for everything that ails you, like, and it's probably not good to use it as the hammer on every nail. Um, I think it's interesting 
it creates some potential for like modularity, I think, of having a toolkit in which you can have multiple and plural solutions to things. So for that, I share some optimism with Mike that it wor can work in a lot of different contexts depending on what institutions you're dealing with. Now, if you have a centralized institution you can't route around, like that's how it's gonna be unless you have some other way around it. But, I, but I, I'm finding that the, the, na the forces of recentralization when you work in this environment feel very, there's a strong undertow because of efficiency and economies of scale and our existing institutions to re-centralize things very quickly, even as you are attempting to disaggregate power. Um, and so I think, I can totally see how this movement also, viewed from a certain angle, can seem like a mania for decentralizing everything and saying the word decentralized <laughs> many hundreds of times per day. Um, but I think the excitement partly comes out of the sense that, that in many, in a diversity of contexts, allocating that power to more actors is gonna allow at least some experimentation, if not some success. Can I just add, if, if, any, if people are interested in this like re-centralizing undertow, uh, Moxie Marlin Spike has a blog post on this, the sort of in the NFT context that's really helpful. Yeah, all right. Well, I think we are out of time, but I want to thank everyone. Uh, the panel is a really interesting discussion. I know we could keep going, uh, but, but, but we shouldn't because there are other people who want us to, to speak. And I want to make sure, Alan, I don't, don't leave you out. Thank you very much for, for joining remotely. Uh, and, and thanks to everyone on the panel and for the, the excellent questions from the audience as well. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys again. That was fascinating. It was an incredibly rich discussion. I do want everybody to know we're going to be putting together a report at the end of this, so we will hopefully have a lot of this captured in such a way that people can follow up on these issues. But right now we're going to take about an eight-minute break, and then we hope to reconvene um, 11.15? Nope. 10? 12? 12. 12 is the break. Okay. What's that? You'll make an announcement. Okay. Yeah. I will be making an announcement again. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> No, Sorry, I'm just trying to figure time. out like the timing. I read yeah. it.
other because a lot of these people haven't had a chance to see each other in quite a long time. And see what you see believe.
Oh, yeah. The drunk star. Start. Hi, everyone. I think we're ready to begin. So our next panel, how to get there from here, regulatory requirements and necessary standards. This panel will be moderated by Kate Klonick, Associate Professor at St. John's University Law School. She's also a fellow at the Brookings Institution and a fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project. For the 2022 to 2023 academic year, she is in residence in Cambridge as a visiting scholar at the Rebooting Social Media Institute at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center. We are really grateful to have her here today. So over to you, Kate. Is this guy on? There we go. Um, thank you so much, uh, and I am so excited. This is, we're all kind of getting used to being back in person, and this feels like both overstimulating and exhausting and awesome and exciting at the same time. So uh, this has been so wonderful to see every, all the, everybody's faces. Um, so how do we get there from here? And this is a particularly useful conversation this morning um, as the Supreme Court has just taken um, two cases that will address Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act um, in this term. Um, but before we kind of get, we're probably not going to spend a lot of time talking about what the Supreme Court, making propositions about what the Supreme Court's going to do with the 230 cases. Um, but we are going to talk about what's been happening in the meantime in the space that basically the court has created and the silence of the uh, U.S. government has created in, uh, in the regulatory space and the role that the EU has played in stepping into that. And we have just an incredible, incredible panel of people that are going to be talking about this who have had all had a foot in some part of this, either public or private. Um, inside the companies, outside the companies, as lawyers or advocates. And so um, it is, I, I don't say this, I don't usually preface this much with intros. I'm a very, like, keep it brief, keep it short, everyone knows everyone. But I actually think it's worth uh, giving everyone's brief bios today just because it really, like, kind of, it's easy to forget all of the roles that people played previously, and I think that those are all coming to bear right now in these regulatory conversations with the people that are here. So I'm gonna start um, with Barbara um, Bukovsa, uh, who is a Senior Director of Law and Policy at Article 19, the International Human Rights uh, organization that works to defend and promote freedom of expression and information. And Barbara has a long and illustrious career as a human rights attorney and advocate, working on arguing pivotal human rights cases in Europe, and in Europe's highest courts. Um, and then to Barbara's uh, left is Andrew McLaughlin, who is currently the CEO and president of Assembly OSM, which is a startup um, that is uh, working to transform the building of urban, uh, urban buildings to make them greener and more affordable. He is at Higher Ground Labs and is a board chair at Access Now. And he has been in and out of the tech, sector, tech sector as an attorney, policy advisor, and entrepreneur for the last two decades. He helped launch ICANN, and he served as director of global public policy at Google um, in the early 2000s, and then went to the White, Obama White House, it was where he served as the deputy chief technology officer. Um, and then, is Corey on the screen? He's up, or was a second ago. He was? There he Corey, is. hi! <laughs> Corey Doctor might be the pe person who's had the most and the best hats. He is a prolific uh, and award-winning blogger, journalist, and sci-fi writer. At the early days of the internet, Corey was maybe one of the strongest proponents and advocates for Creative Commons, which start, sought to make copyright more um, open and accessible for everyone. He is currently and has been a longtime senior advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And welcome from, I'm assuming, your incredible studio in Southern California, Corey. <laughs> it's nice to have you. Uh, and finally, Zoe Darme is a senior management of search, uh, government affairs, and public policy at Google. She previously was um, in a similar role at Microsoft, and before that, Meta, nay, Facebook, where she was on the team that uh, 
created the oversight board. And so, and before joining the private sphere, I don't know if a lot of people know this about Zoe, but before joining the private sphere and working at tech companies, she was at the UN and working in human rights as well. So obviously we have a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives and it is a time for those perspectives, hopefully, and listening to them and the, bringing the conversations from the different disciplines together. Um, and so with that, I'm actually going to start us um, maybe 20-ish years ago, and I'm gonna, I was gonna ask Andrew to basically start, Andrew and Corey, um, and to kind of open up the conversation. One of the things that if you are a student of internet law, you have to learn and you have to recognize is that this, a lot of the, the power shifting that has happened over the time in the legal and the cultural sphere that has like been created, started out with copyright as like really where a lot of this was going. That's where IP, um, IP was, um, was the forefront of where these issues were being fought. And um, we weren't even having terms like the online public sphere 20 years ago. That was kind of, I mean, we we're all just kind of stealing music on our computers. Um, but t do you want to walk us through a little bit like what you, we'll start with you, Andrew, and then go to you, Corey. Does that sound good? Great. Yeah, let's do it. So um, hi, everybody. I feel like the, uh, like I'm like removing the like, uh, you know, mummy wrapping and having emerged from my sarcophagus uh, <laughs> to be here today. Um, both because we're back in person, yay, and also uh, I, I actually have been around this thing enough that this morning's news was kind of jarring. So I was, I managed to worm my way as a young lawyer uh, onto the legal team that did the Communications Decency Act case in 1996 and 97. Um, Reno and versus ACLU. Reno against ACLU, that's right. Um, I was a gender and block at the time, which represented the non-ACLU group of uh, plaintiffs. Um, uh, since we're like okay with like dorking out in a major way here, this was, there was an interesting split in the plaintiffs back then, um, legal theories. The ACLU wanted to advance a set of arguments and did advance a set of arguments about the value of sexually explicit speech to minors to some, for some of it. And a bunch of the companies that were involved were very uncomfortable with that argument and wanted to rest it on other grounds. And so there were two legal teams that went forward. But anyway, the, this morning's news um, uh, means that we're gonna, I'm gonna at least get to bring it full circle. So, so, um, so 20 years ago, um, 25 years ago, um, if I were kicking off a panel like this, I would have said that there were kind of like two great axes of conflict on the internet. Uh, in the world of internet policy. The first one is the free speech versus censorship uh, axis. So uh, unfettered uh, uh, human expression on the one hand uh, and the um, vindication of social uh, and political values uh, that require the limitation of speech on the other hand, that was one axis of conflict. And the other great one was privacy versus surveillance. Uh, 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 governments and um, uh, uh, other actors uh, seeing what I'm doing versus uh, communications and, and actions that are private to me online. But I think there are today, maybe looking around the landscape, two new axes. These are still there for sure. Um, one of them is the concentration versus competition uh, axis now. So uh, 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 on the one hand, you have an open marketplace where multiple uh, players can survive and thrive. Um, and on the other hand, you have the centralization and lock-in uh, of major, uh, around major players on the internet. That's one big policy axis. And then the last one I think that's, uh, that's kind of reached that level of centrality is uh, the borderlessness of the internet versus the imperatives of, let's call it sovereignty. Uh, but the conflict between the uh, uh, lines on the ground, territorial jurisdiction of policymaking and the borderlessness of the internet is very much now at issue in a way that I think it was uh, settled uh, uh, 20 years ago that um, uh, uh, you simply couldn't regulate uh, the internet uh, now, in, in, at least in a, in a, in a speech-protective, rights-oriented democracy, and that is now very much not uh, very much not settled. So then um, one big, you know, kind of like meta observation is that 20, 25 years ago, it was very clear that the internet uh, was at, a, uh, at war with incumbents from other industries. And so Hollywood and the recording industry uh, was trying to figure out how to replicate their existing lattice work of business relationships and quasi-corrupt, uh, you know, uh, incumbent protecting policies uh, instantiated in things like copyright law. Uh, the telecom companies were trying to figure out how to uh, uh, extend their own 
lazy and comfortable uh, business uh, uh, positions into this new environment. Um, governments themselves were trying to figure out how to uh, uh, do on the internet what they were used to doing elsewhere. And so the battle was fundamentally a new and upstart uh, environment, uh, network, collection of networks, the internet, versus uh, incumbents that were going to war to try to conform it to their uh, wishes. Uh, today, the internet players are the incumbents, uh, and the policy battles are very different. The big uh, 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 sort of Goliaths to be uh, brought down are themselves the internet companies that we cheered and championed as upstarts uh, a generation ago. Um, so uh, now I would, I would say it's more like individuals and maybe collectively the public interest and upstarts versus the big behemoths that seem uh, un, un, unrestrained by public policy. The last thing maybe that I'll mention is that in uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, the dominant ethos in the regulatory world was what uh, Jamie Boyle at Duke famously mm -hmm. called the libertarian gotcha. So this was basically, if you regulate the internet, you kill the internet. Uh, so if you love the benefits, uh, economic, uh, socio-political, cultural, and otherwise that come from the internet, you better not regulate it because it will kill it. Um, today, the dominant ethos is the internet sucks. It ruins <laughs> everything. We can't make it any worse, so let's start regulating it uh, uh, as best we can. The role of the EU obviously has changed massively in the last 20 to 25 years, and I think that's fundamentally like that is the big regulatory story. Back then, the EU was a kind of a lagging follower. Um, as Kate mentioned, I was arguably the first employee of ICANN, but I was definitely the first chief policy officer and spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to navigate the EU vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US, Australia, Japan, and some of the other major actors that were involved in setting up uh, ICANN. And the EU was definitely a reluctant and grumpy uh, participant in that process now it is the world's lead regulator. Mm. The European Union uh, has a strategic motivation to try to assert European policy uh, preferences and uh, uh, controls over the internet, uh, uh, at least within Europe. They also have a tactical motivation, which is not to get stuck as a powerless actor in between China on the one hand and the US on the other. It's a very real fear. The EU has an enormous amount of dependency on China for hardware, on the US for software and online services. Um, and as a practical matter, we've learned that you can't just limit EU jurisdiction <laughs> to EU people, and so the EU's quite rational, I think, judgment is, let's just make our rules, the borderline global rules, uh, require compliance, and uh, let the rest of the world uh, deal with it as best they can, and we can sort of feel smug and good about the fact that our rules will be the global default. What's interesting is that the US has gone from being a kind of like a coherent, <laughs> player with a clear perspective to being basically just like a chaos monkey of incoherence. Uh, we are, you know, our domestic policy debates are a total mess. The Texas law is like a joke um, of kind of like politicized cruelty. Um, the uh, uh, it's kind of like law as trolling sort of dominates our domestic debates. And what's interesting to me about the big uh, uh, acts that have come out of Brussels, the Digital Markets Act, the D Digital Services Act, is that they are basically like compendia of all of the individual pet bills that you see being advanced by different lawmakers ac around the US. We're still completely scattershot uh, in our regulatory uh, reality, whereas the European Union is kind of like, if not coherently weaving them together, at least collecting them as a giant package and then making them the law. So anyway, my view is, when I look around right now, everything uh, is getting worse, there's more censorship, there's less diversity, there's more walled gardens, less interoperability, more surveillance, less openness, and uh, the rise of a new regulator uh, uh, across the ocean that um, uh, maybe we'll get into the sort of pros and cons of it, but that to me is the vector of the last 25 years. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew. And just to, to, to kind of foot stump that last thing, I've been in this space for a, a much shorter amount of time, but I would say even in the last seven years, the conversations that I was a part of in the EU versus the ones that I had like this summer after the DSA and the DMA have, have been drafted and they've been working on them for many years, the conversations have just become so much more sophisticated and the whole, the whole like, there has been a huge sea change. Um, and I totally agree with that observation. Corey, I would love to hear your response to the axes and the vectors that, that Andrew just spelled out for us. 
I, I really like Andrew's account. I, it it um, certainly rings true in my experience. I think that there is a story today that I, that I want to joust with, a narrative about, about how we got here, which goes uh, that in the 1990s, uh, modem-addled Gen Xers thought that if we just gave everyone the internet, everything would be fine. And, that's, and so they went off and caped for tech companies when they wanted to do mean things to the record industry and, uh, <laughs> n and, and give um, uh, internet access to, or, or social media access to people living in dictatorships on the grounds that it would somehow make them more democratic and now look where we are. And I, I want to dispute that uh, to the extent that it's, it's a true account. I've heard versions of it. I want to dispute it and say that the, what we got wrong was something entirely different. Uh, what we got wrong was a market concentration story, not a story about the venality of, of firms or the utility of technology and network technology in particular to uh, projects of uh, commercial oppression, and, uh, state oppression, and crime. Um, I think that, that people were very much alive to those possibilities. Uh, you know, no one starts an organization like the Electronic Frontier Foundation because they think everything will be fine in the end. I think <laughs> if, we, if we had a, 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 a kind of motto in those days, it was the one that Michael Weinberg eventually crystallized in his white paper on 3D printing, which was titled, This Will All Be So Great If We Don't Screw It Up. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think there was real fear and, and justifiable fear about how it could get screwed up. And what we kind of missed was that we, we didn't really realize that antitrust was as sick as it, it, it was at the time. And I, literally as I was preparing for this panel this morning, I was also writing a, an article summarizing a new paper by uh, Lencieri, Posner, and Zingales called The Political Economy and the Decline of Antitrust Enforcement in the US that makes the point that Nobody ever said we were not going to do antitrust anymore. Mm. That you know, politicians campaigned on antitrust. The public polled well on antitrust. Judges were confirmed after saying that they would enforce antitrust. Regulators were confirmed after being told that they would entrust anti that they would enforce antitrust, and then they just didn't. And so, in those early days, you had a, a fair degree of market concentration already among the incumbents. You had uh, you know the telecoms and the entertainment sector in particular being very uh, concentrated, and. That left them free to not just have the general fallacy of the internet, but to act on it. I think the general fallacy of the internet is that the internet is uh, primarily whatever I don't like about it. So the internet is a pornography distribution system, or a system for taking music, or a system for recruiting terrorists, or a system for making children anorexic, uh, or, or what have you, uh, as opposed to the, the kind of uh, yes to all of the above and more answer, which is that the internet is like the nervous system of the 21st century, and it's how we get, or will eventually end up getting, back in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, how we'll end up getting politics, civics, nutrition, uh, um, civic um, education, employment, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know everything else that is important to us as, a, as an advanced civilization, and that well, um, that doesn't militate against regulating it at all. It does militate against regulating it as though the only important thing about it were, say, spam or, or CSAM or any of the other extremely bad things that exist on the internet. Not because those things aren't bad, but because you must regulate in a way that takes into account the potential uh, downstream consequences for other equities that are as important as the equity of keeping people free from spam or CSAM or, or what have you. Or free from being victimized to produce CSAM, or, or what have you. Uh, and, and so um, this fallacy was one that the telecoms operators in the record industry could, could run free with. And I really came to understand what was going on and why the tech sector, which was in aggregate already larger than either of those industries, was just having its butt kicked over and over again in every regulatory forum and it was when I read Tim Wu's 2004 paper, Copyrights Communications Policy, where he just drops this, like, uh, you know, in retrospect, extremely obvious idea that very mature industries that have dwindled down to a few companies find it easy to figure out what their lobbying position should be. And, and I, I, I very vividly remember a day when something like 30 state houses all dropped a genuinely bananas copyright bill, tech copyright bill, at the state level, which like didn't pass legislative muster because it's a federal matter, and just like 
was also completely incoherent and whatever, and it was the same bill in all these state houses, and, and this being sort of a cat amongst the pigeons moment at EFF in our offices, and someone saying, what's the point of Microsoft being this giant monopolist if they can't have you know, lobbyists in all these state houses ready to, to, to watch for this kind of thing? Like, and, and the reality was that Microsoft was at that point embroiled in really serious hand-to-hand -hand combat with new market entrants that were credibly threatening to eat its lunch and they were so distracted with, with what you might call internecine struggle, but what, what you might also call healthy competition, that they weren't able to serve as an effective check against this. And so you, you have this rise and rise of, um, of monopoly, both in the incumbents that were being challenged by tech and then ultimately by tech itself. Some of that, I think, was driven by the ordinary venality of tech leaders. I think it's a, a form of tech exceptionalism to assume that tech leaders are, are evil geniuses, first because they're not geniuses, right? The, you know, they're people who got lucky once and never made another successful product or managed to make one or two, but otherwise maintain their dominance through access to the capital markets. You know, Google is a company that made a browser, a search engine, and a Hotmail clone. Everything else they made failed, and everything else that they've done that's successful they bought from someone else. This is not a super genius, right? This is just mm -hmm. someone who's willing to engage in anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions. Um, and so th neither are, they're, they're neither uh, geniuses, nor are they particularly evil. I don't think the ambitions of Google's founders or Facebook's founders or Apple's founders are, are uh, I, I'm not going to say that they're not sociopathic. I'm just gonna say that they're not more sociopathic than the ambitions of the founders of Cray or the digital equipment company or Silicon Graphics or Sun or for that matter, you know, Warner Entertainment. I think that it takes a certain kind of person to want to establish world dominance through uh, their corporate holdings, and that sort of person is very attractive to investors, both in the, in the venture capital market and then eventually in the public capital markets. And so these firms weren't, weren't particularly evil. Uh, they weren't particularly uh, genius. Uh, they did want to merge to monopoly for the same reason that other firms wanted to merge to monopoly, that is to eliminate competition so that they could, you know, like the cable sector has done, for example, sort of divide up the internet the way the Pope divided up the new world and say, you do your business over here, I'll do my business over there, and we won't compete head on with each other, except at the margins. Um, but the, the, the thing that um, they were also doing was merging to monopoly as a defensive maneuver because they were in a supply chain that included monopolists, that included oligopolists, who did have a unified position, and that it was only through concentration elsewhere in the supply chain that they were able to resist it. It's a familiar pattern in many sectors. In the US, the pharmaceutical industry's concentration begat price gouging of the hospitals, which begat monopolization of the hospitals, and price gouging of the insurers, which begat uh, monopolization among the insurers. And then, you know, all you have loose at the either end of that are the healthcare workers who are getting less money for worse working uh, conditions, and the patients who are paying more money for worse health outcomes. And in between them, there's a little bit of, of this and that, but, but nothing significant. So you have the tech sector that's becoming very concentrated, and as a result of this concentration, it begins to do things that lend itself to the project of dictatorial states. Uh, first among them is the decision that not only should you have sales in territories that are uh, non-human rights respecting, but, but that those sales should be maximized through the expedient of, of adding a sales office and a local firm to those territories. That I remember when, you know, for example, Twitter moved into Turkey. Uh, and, and that in so doing, you should put your employees within the physical grasp of enforcement agents in those states who might enact policies that say things like you have to spy on your users or you have to censor content that is um, harmful to the government. And this, this creates a, a, a circumstance of great vulnerability and acts as a spur to accelerate the splinter net because uh, the two ways, the two levers that uh, an oppressive state has over a multinational tech firm is one that will block you at the border and the other one is that will arrest your personnel uh, and if they can do both, right, if you have opted to put a sales office within their territory and you've also, that, that territory has also had such concentration in its telecom sector that can affect its own great firewall, then you have the one-two combo that says that these giants with economies of scale will become kind of super weapons that the worst people in the world can lay hands on and, and turn to their interests. Um, 
So uh, I, I, would, I, I would close by saying that I think the big change in the conception of people who care about copyright over the internet over the last 40 years, 20 years, has been uh, a change from being concerned about free expression and the brittleness that having easy takedown and uh, intermediary liability creates to a wider understanding that between para-copyrights like uh, uh, anti-circumvention, uh, central copyright, and then like kind of copyright adjacent things like, like claims about APIs that thankfully have, have gone the way of the, of the dodo, at least for now, that there is a mechanism whereby large firms can cement their dominance, interrupt the cycle of competition that made tech so exciting in its early days where you know, one day there was a giant and the next day it was being bought uh, out of its you know, ruination by a small company that, that was nowhere a few years before, like Compaq buying deck, into one in which whoever wins the current round of, of uh, musical chairs can stop the music and keep their chair forever. Uh, and, and that that was the thing that, that and, and, and that, that is the thing we become more alive to subsequently, that, that all the risks of network technology in a network society are multiplied by corporate oligopolies that are uh, impedance matched with authoritarian states. That was, an, uh, both of you, that was an amazing, um, amazing summary. I think that, so Corey, I'm just gonna save some, bookmark something for later because I think that this is, um, I think that this is super important. I'm really interested um, to know, we'll, and we'll get back to this after um, we hear from Barbara and Zoe, um, but I really do wanna bookmark this idea that what you think about the, the competition um, regulation of the DMA coming out of this and if that addresses some of these antitrust concerns. And the other thing is to make you, to force you a little bit to thicken what you see antitrust playing a role here. There's a lot of remedies on the table for antitrust, exactly. Um, and so we've, we've, there's been a lot of kind of public, big break them up, structural antitrust remedies, which are probably maybe not going to happen, but there's also um, a lot of work that interoperability can do, and I know that you've been um, a huge proponent of that for years, and so I hope that we can kind of get into that um, briefly. But Barbara, I want to turn to you because you have um, just this incredibly prolific um, history in human rights um, and the EU, and you have also spent so much time in the courts as an attorney, and now in your role um, at Article 19, you do a lot of work on advocacy and policy, and so this is a particularly exciting time to kind of be have kind of made a pivot from you know arguing in courtrooms to kind of to which I'm sure you're maybe still have like doing a fair amount of but to doing um, the kind of advocacy work um, and what you're doing. Can you walk us through a little bit of how your perspective from the the EU? We've heard just some two fairly American perspectives about how this moment has come about and like what you're feeling about what's coming out of this and the perspective um, of people um, at Article 19. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you also to Columbia Freedom of Expression for inviting me in Article 19. And actually, I need to give a shout out because uh, the first director of Columbia Freedom of Expression was also formerly director of Article 19, Agnes Calamar. So we both stand on the shoulders of the giant. And so this was very useful introduction to kind of the processes which in the EU have now uh, sort of reached the pivot of having some regulation in place. And uh, there's are two pieces of, of regulation which the EU finally is um, putting forward and has adopted, although they are not yet in force. DSA and DMA, Digital Services Act and Digital uh, Markets Act. And I'm not gonna actually speak about what is in these two legislations because I think tomorrow there are two sessions on this very topic, so that will be quite repetitive. But there is kind of, um, so, so, but I, I just in a very, very kind of high level, I need to say what is in there because I understand that some people might not be really familiar what is in there in, in, uh, in specs. And this is important for the future discussion. So Digital Services Act, it deals kind of with the content aspect, although it doesn't really say what content needs to be removed. Um, it deals more, focuses more on transparency and the procedural rights, and also quite importantly, and this is what I want to speak a little bit about, is also envisions role of civil society, 
in enforcement of this regulation because the civil society should have a role to play uh, and scrutinizing, not just civil society, but also independent researchers scrutinizing the obligations under, under DSA. And then there is a twin legislation, which is the Digital Markets Act, and that's more like competitive tool, which deals with very large online platforms, and, uh, um, and that deals with the gatekeepers, and it defines gatekeepers in terms of their turnover, in how the users, and also in the control of the core platform, and then introduces certain obligations on these gatekeepers. And um, that's um, something which is obviously to be seen, how they are defined, and one of the very important requirements of it is also interoperability, which Corey, I'm sure, is gonna have a say about, but on messaging platforms, so not for everything. So now this is a huge uh, development, huge legislation, where Article 19 and civil society were involved in shaping this regulation. However, we think that it could have been more ambitious, and it's not going to be panacea for everything. And one of the proposals which Article 19 put forward, which didn't make it to the MA, and I think I need to mention this mm -hmm. because it's Please. in the in the program. It was mentioned also by Holly at the beginning. Uh, this proposal for unbundling. So this was our proposal for addressing both the issues with content moderation as well as market power of certain platforms. And our proposal here was to look at the fact that these large platforms, these dominant platforms, offer the hosting services and content moderation services as a bundle, which mm. has economic value, and also this is the problem which locks users in these platforms. You can, you, can, you can leave, but also you are facing all these problems there, hate speech, harassment, and, and so on. So we, our proposal was to have mandate these uh, companies with significant market power to unbundle these two services and allow competitors to provide content moderation services on their platforms. And this would uh, be better for the companies, for the competitors, as well as for the markets, as well as for the users who could be choosing and have a more control over the content moderation that is done in there. However, there is also aspect of regulation where there would have to be a role of regulator that would create the level playing field for those alternative players that would have to uh, be allowed on those platforms to provide content moderation services, but also how this would be done in a human rights compliant level. So this is more like a holistic proposal, which would solve uh, both problems. It didn't make it to the DMA and the SA, unfortunately, but we are not abandoning it because there's obviously a world beyond EU, and we are also working with regulators in other countries and in the global south as well, how this could be put forward. But, and I'm happy to elaborate on this concept which will require decentralization, going to the topic of previous panel, both on contractual level, with these alternative players coming, but also on a technical level with interoperability needed for it. But now, I also want to make sure that we understand that with these two legislations in place in the EU, it doesn't mean that we got there. So the topic of this panel is how we get from here to there. So here maybe we define where we want to go, but the road there is still very long because there is an issue of enforcement. Mm. So now there is gonna be a period before the enforcement kicks in. Uh, DSA it's gonna be you know, 15 months plus and then the uh, DMA is, is shorter, but this, the, the implementation and enforcement of this provision is gonna be crucial, not only because the proof is in the pudding, but also if there is no effective uh, regulatory enforcement, this will be an empty shell. And here there are many obstacles. First, there is also the system of enforcement, which is different for each uh, this pieces of legislation. For the DSA, it's more decentralized because it depends on the National, um, national level, EU member states, which will have to appoint digital coordinators. It's gonna be local regulator, and then there's gonna be a collaboration between um, this advisory board to these regulators. And then for the very large online platforms and search engines, uh, the, the commission is gonna have, um, have the, the role in there where the 
member states will have a less um, say. And then for DMA, the implementation is with the Commission. So this is quite complicated system, not to mention that there are also going to be you no know, secondary acts, there is going to be voluntary codes of conduct, uh, which are all referenced in DSA, which still need to be adopted, not to mention that in several countries there have been national legislation that will have to be amended, such as uh, an SDG in, in, uh, uh, in Germany or in France, there have been legislation. So this is not going to be like smooth sailing for a number of reasons. One of them is cost. The other one is expertise, because the European Commission and also national regulators need an expertise to scrutinize the conduct of these companies. So they need you know, experts, they need uh, technological experts, and a huge kind of resources, as well as the cost. And how then will be the approach to the companies will be crucial, because they will litigate. And you know, com some companies take a different approach to legislation uh, and enforcement. Some of them are you know, hostile, are going to sue everything. Some of them are going to be more cooperative. But this is, this, is still, this is still to be seen. And now there is also a role for civil society, and this is also what we are going to concentrate on in the next couple months. And we don't actually have a model, because this involvement of the CSOs, of uh, independent researchers, it's only vaguely referenced in the DSA, but it's not specified. So it's not cl uh, clear how this should, be, uh, this should be, what should be these processes whether they should be mandatory and so on. So we are focusing on defining actually this CSO and independent researchers participation for the DSA. For the DMA, there is no expectation of obligatorily commission in their enforcement dialogue, speaking to civil society, but we are pushing for them to, to do so, so to, to have a civil society also uh, engaged in those, in those processes. So, Far from being there in the EU is, um, is still a very long, uh, long, a long way to go. And if anything is to learn from this previous period, which also Cory and Andrew mentioned, we have an experience of GDPR. GDPR, this was another you know, revolutionary legislation which was adopted, but then enforcement is understood as a failure because it was not properly resourced and also very much depended on local on the staff, on the resource, uh, the, the, the um, privacy regulators. So if there is anything to learn from that, the system here is somewhat uh, easier and more straightforward, but it's far from being, being clear. So the road there is still, still quite, quite complicated and will be determined by these processes as well as litigation. Thank you so much. Um, so I just to kind of like, to, I for one am, slowly getting into the mode of kind of reacquaint or acquainting myself with exactly how all of the DSA and DMA implementation is going to work through the member states and through the platforms. And um, I think that you've pointed out something really important, which is that unlike D, uh, GDPR, which was also a very large omnibus like um, piece of legislation to govern privacy and had a huge outsized effect um, on places uh, far outside the EU, um, that the DSA and DMA are also going to have that, and this procedurally, how the DSA and the DMA are going to become implemented hand in hand with the commission is unlike how it's happened before. And I think that for those of us who are not familiar of how kind of the E works legally, like how these implementation procedures work, um, this next period of implementation, as you as you point out, is going to, to truly be um, a little bit where the, as you said, there's a long road. I would say it's where the rubber meets the road. I would say that there is going to be a kind of, it is going to be what we decide to make of this law and whether it is an empty shell, as you said, or not. So that, thank you so much for that. So Zoe, you have been in the human rights context <clears throat> before. Now you are um, working at the companies and you're doing policy in this area. So we've heard from kind of, Barbara gave a wonderful kind of overview of what um, the legal framework and the civil society concerns are um, for advocates. Um, what is happening in, I mean, not that you can tell us, you know, like minutes of what's happening in the company, but really how is how are the companies preparing for all of these? There's also, I want to just point out that there there's a big difference in the companies that are regulated under the DSA and the DMA, um, depending on the size and what they are working on. And so there's what's called very, 
someone keeps saying this, someone said this and I now can't unhear it, the, the very large platforms, um, or as if you've watched The Princess Bride, rodents of unusual size <laughs> um, of like the, you know, and uh, I think it's the perfect uh, way to kind of think there's, a t the timeline is different for what those companies have to do. The, the scope of their obligations are much different. Um, and uh, the same is true for the DMA, as Barbara pointed out, the DMA is going to have a much shorter horizon um, for implementation than the DSA. Um, and so, yeah, so what, what's going on inside, inside uh, the Goog? Okay, well, I'll start. Um, this may seem very strange, but it'll be relevant later. Can I just see a how many, a uh, show of hands of how many people in here are lawyers or are training? Okay, yeah, that's pretty much what I thought. <laughs> um, so uh, the reason I ask this is because I think, you know, we do have muscle memory. Sorry, just a little closer. Oh, sorry. We do have muscle memory in the companies uh, from having gone through GDPR, through DMCA, all of these things. But I think the people who are always thinking about tech regulation from the get-go were the lawyers and the legal departments. Um, and so my job probably didn't exist 10, 20 years ago or certainly didn't exist in the way that it does now. You hire a random English major who's worked in government before. I didn't give that part of your bio for a reason, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I think a lot of this was handled by legal departments. Um, certainly the OGs of thinking through uh, content regulation at, at the Goog, as you call it, Kate, were basically people that Daphne hired, many of whom are still um, uh, are still our search P consoles, if I, if I uh, can talk specifically about the product that I work on. Um, so I think one of the things that the companies are doing are just diversifying the types of people who are working on these issues. And so we've expanded a little bit to the sister group of people. First we had the lawyers, and now we have public policy professionals. You know, my mom always <laughs> dreamed of someday having a public policy professional in the family. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> the next stage of this, if we're talking about where to get from here to there, is, you know, not having content regulation or competition regulation or privacy regulation just be the purview of the lawyers and the public policy professionals, but also the engineers, the product managers. Um, and I, I see that happening, I'll say. Um, I get regular requests, you know, from hundreds of engineers saying, you know, come come to my team meeting and tell me what's, what's happening next, Zoe. What do, we, what do we have to build? And I actually think, you know, that's a really good thing. Uh, to have some of these trust conversations because the policy intent behind all of these regulations is really about driving trust. Um, and so a lot of these conversations are moving out from the purview of, you know, the lawyers that we used to have in this other building over here and the public policy folks over here and really integrating us more closely into product <laughs> development. And so what I'll say is it's not like companies have sat back and waited, you know, there have been regulations that have come in the past and they are hiring um, and not just in the traditional uh, units that worked on these issues, but people who specialize in compliance, who specialize in trust within the product teams, within the engineering teams. Um, and that's a luxury that a big company can have, mm -hmm. is to hire in, in anticipation. And if we're talking about decentralized networks or we're talking about smaller platforms, you know, Kate, you mentioned that there are some graduated obligations in the DSA. There are also some graduated obligations in some other uh, regulations like the UK Online Safety Bill, for example, category, I forget, category one, category two, category A, category B, but there are different categories and different obligations of what you need to do, whether you're a large platform or a small platform. But there are a couple of things I'll say about this. One is that small doesn't mean free from risk, right? Especially the types of risks that are underlying the motivations for passing these regulations. Um, and the second thing is even these supposedly graduated obligations, they are quite high, right? Um, these are high bars. So uh, I, I was just reading the assessment of the UK online safety bill that the UK government did, and um, just reading the bill, the estimate for everybody in the UK, the companies, cost to companies, uh, is a conservative estimate of 9.6 million to 17.5 million pounds, just to read it, right? 
And there's other estimates for individual obligations, such as updating terms of service, which would cost anywhere between 17 and 33 million pounds. So yes, a company like the Goog probably has enough lawyers left over that Daphne hired to read all of these bills. And it's not just DSA, it's not just DMA. It is Nigeria, it is Brazil, it is India, it is Singapore, it is Japan, it is South Korea. Uh, I'm tracking probably anywhere between 40 to 60 bills at any given time. So uh, there are barriers to entry happening. Uh, even though there are the best attempts to graduate obligations and make sure that we don't unintendedly or unexpectedly uh, create such high barriers to entry that new market players can't enter. Um, but when you look at just the types, just the catalog of types of obligations, there are things like what Corey mentioned, the local presence requirement. There are turnaround times inherited from the NetsDG when a couple of years ago we thought NetsDG was groundbreaking, pathbreaking, and now we have all of these other regulations that go uh, far beyond what that required. There's algorithmic transparency, there's external appeals and out-of-court dispute mechanisms, which is not the purview of VLOPs or very large online platforms, but also included on online platforms as well. Transparency reporting, data access for researchers, age verification, age assurance. We haven't probably talked enough about the children's bills or the child safety bills that are happening. Um, in and then, states, in like the US, in US states too. I mean, we're correct. All, yeah. Correct, there's the UK AADC, California AADC, COSA, uh, COPPA 2.0, a plethora of kids' privacy and safety bills. And so I do think we are entering a moment that has some promise because you have engineers and product people thinking about what do we have to do to ready ourselves for regulation or what do we have to do to satisfy the policy intent so people know that our products are trusted. That's the, that's the great thing. Um, but I think we're also entering a new area, era wherein the, the obligations are not small. <laughs> and so uh, in, in solving for Facebook, right, all these regulations to some extent, you know, a lot of them are motivated by certain large platforms, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or, you know, whatever product, YouTube, for example. Um, but since we're building for those, often we're not thinking about what comes next, the startup or the decentralized network, there are no carve outs in many of these bills for those types of um, companies or platforms. Yeah, really well said. I think that brings us actually perfectly back to Andrew's starting axes. Um, like and the different axes that he mentioned, which is this this flux between competition, innovation, um, surveillance, and um, surveillance and and privacy, uh, freedom of expression and censorship. I think that these are this is like this is, I think that we're seeing them play out, but in maybe in ways and in vectors that we didn't necessarily could or we couldn't necessarily have predicted. Um, but what I'm kind of interested in, and I kind of want to pose this to the group and people can pitch in, um, and we have about uh, 13 minutes and then I'm going to go to audience questions. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions um, or raise your hand and get in the queue. Um, so one of the things that I'm really interested in is like, Andrew, you spent a lot of time, you were at the Obama White House, as, um, as we know, you were on the Biden transition team. Um, what do you think the, the impact of this is for regulation? Um, in the US, if anything at all? Well, so, um, so uh, so I don't see much hope that the US, uh, you know, does what, what one might imagine a coherent country would do, right? Which is mm -hmm. to um, consolidate a set of policy objectives uh, and then sit down with the European Union and figure out how to come up with a harmonized, you know, regulatory system that basically like vindicates everybody's shared goals as best you can. Um, I, th I do think what's what's useful about the U.S. perspective at the moment um, is some deep, deeply s rooted skepticism about a few core components of the EU's approach. Just speak in the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so so, so what, what I think the US is contributing right now in, in lieu of coherence <laughs> and like strategy is some useful skepticism about some of the pillars of the EU approach. So for example, um, uh, unbundling 
uh, has a spotty track record of achieving competitive markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and why is that? Because in the unbundling world, you require the consent and the cooperation, if not the consent, you require the cooperation of the incumbent in order to make unbundling work. And what we saw across the EU telecom sector was that the incumbents were extraordinarily good at complying in some ways with unbundling requirements, but making it uh, meaningless uh, as, a, as, a, as a practical matter. I think the U.S. Is very, has some, some deep skepticism about versions of interoperability that require uh, uh, the, the cooperation of the incumbents. So, um, uh, you know, just as a footnote, there are, there are, I can think of at least a couple of areas that I've been close to over the last couple of years where the people who know the most about the technology are the most horrified by the policy dialogue. So one is online voting. Yeah. The more you know about how voting needs to work and the vulnerabilities of the internet, the less comfortable you are with including the internet as part of your stack of a voting system. Uh, online content moderation, the more you know about what actually happens uh, on, in a very large online platform, the more uh, horrified you are about things like the kind of unmoored insanity of the Fifth Circuit's uh, reading of the Texas uh, social media laws, right? Uh, the more that you know about messaging services and the operation of end-to-end -end encryption, the more skeptical you are, I think, about bland interoperability requirements on end-to-end -end encrypted messaging systems, mm. not just for the security of the messages themselves, but all the features that need to be baked into it. It's not to say that you can't figure these things out at some point, yeah. but skepticism is sort of appropriate. And so um, I'm also, by the way, very skeptical about regulatory agencies and legislatures, you know, and their ability to figure this stuff out. The U.S. has a very poor track record of legislative draftsmanship. The state of California has a very poor record of legislative draftsmanship, in my judgment. And I see lots of things I like in the EU DMA DSA. I see a bunch of things that I think seem uh, unmoored from reality um, in that way. What I prefer, and it's not an exclusive preference, but is what um, Corey has been advocating, which is a practice of adversarial interoperability. And so mm. you can Google it, uh, Corey, you might want to talk <laughs> about it, but adversarial interoperability is the kind of interoperability that doesn't require the consent or the cooperation of the incumbents. Um, and so you have to be careful here because, you know, for example, uh, you know, a simple interop practice like uh, scraping uh, a site or a website can have a bunch of privacy, negative privacy implications, but in general the idea that, that incumbents shouldn't be able to use the law and uh, liability as a kind of a shield against interoperability I think is a good one. I can think of some changes to the law that would make, it, make the big platforms more vulnerable to adversarial interoperability. Um, and that's something that I think would be kind of be kind yeah. Of awesome. So here's the chance to get back to what I kind of was kind of wa hoping to bookmark for people after Corey finished his remarks and Andrew just led us into nicely, which is this idea of adversarial interoperability. I want to just point out one thing that I would love to hear your thoughts on too, um, Corey, that you said in your remarks that was like kind of a throwaway, but. You mentioned the splinternet, and there's like something very, in, and like this idea of sovereignty, and I mean, a lot of these th ideas have obviously, and Andrew mentioned sovereignty um, and kind of balkanization as options around, uh, as one of the other kind of axes that he was imagining things happening on. But um, one of the things that I think about interoperability is being very much keyed into that sovereignty conversation. And one of the things that I'm hearing, and this was actually very interesting to me, um, from a lot of people that I'm talking to in the majority world is that they feel years of kind of through design and infrastructure, a, a type of like kind of imperialism that has been imposed on them silently by tech companies without any pushback that you have these kind of moments of EU regulatory seizures of control like with the DSA and um, DSA package or the GDPR that are finally kind of waking up to kind of take some of this power back. But then a lot of people in majority worlds like which like, you know, you know, we've talked about DSA and the DMA, but like uh, Zoe mentioned that there's 40 different regulations that are happening all over the world right now that are all around this. I'm talking to a woman who's mapping every single, like Harvard, who's mapping every single intermediary liability law in every single country in Africa. I mean, these types of things, and there's a big push for balkanization from people in those countries because they want to take back basically um, and have more control over this new online public sphere. And so anyways, I would love it 
Corey, if I'm not to dry this too much, and you should obviously take the time you need, but I would love to hear your thoughts um, kind of about how adversarial interoperability plays into that. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll note by saying that um, adversarial interoperability is so hard to pronounce, and <laughs> AI is already it's taken. Like rural juror. Yeah. <laughs> so, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, we say competitive compatibility or ComCom, because it's a lot easier to say. So I'm going to call it that, uh, although adversarial interoperability does do what it says on the tin here. Um, so I, I'm going to slightly uh, push back uh, against Andrew's uh, point about regulatory agencies. I think that it's true that the quality of tech regulation that has emerged from our regulatory agencies, and legislation for that matter, has been very poor. But I don't think that, that uh, when it comes to technical matters, regulators are incapable of doing good. Uh, nor do I think the answer should be like, and I'm not saying you were advocating for this, but I, I don't think the answer should be kind of a regulatory nihilism, right? Uh, the, the fact that, you know, when, when Boeing was given control over its own regulation, it produced the, the 737 MAX and killed hundreds of people. And the fact that prior to that, the FAA was able to make regulations about how planes should work uh, that didn't result in planes falling out of the sky and killing hundreds of people, militates for a, th a theory with more explanatory power than technical things are hard. Um, and I think that the, the kind of be best way to understand this is to understand regulation and to a lesser extent lawmaking as a truth-seeking exercise in which partisans with different views, some of them parochial, some of them grounded in objective truth as they understand it, show up and proffer different explanations for how things work and how they can be made better, and then a, a, a neutral referee sits to one side, uh, recuses themselves if they have a conflict of interest, comes to a conclusion, shows their workings, offers a policy or procedure by which those uh, conclusions can be revisited in light of new evidence and so on. You know, it's a policy that, that or it's a procedure that's familiar to anyone who understands the scientific method. And I think that when the firms involved are highly concentrated, you just get to the circumstance where uh, it becomes a lot more like an auction and where everybody can show up and say effectively the same thing, you know, up is down, white is black, left is right, um, and Boeing shouldn't have to, uh, you know, subject its, its avi avionics and safety systems to public scrutiny, and then planes start falling out of the sky. So I think that it's best understood as an as a epiphenomenon of capture, this bad regulation, uh, and that we had bad regulation before because of capture by some entities, and we have bad regulation now because of capture by other entities, and that really we need pluralism. You know, as the joke from Ireland goes, uh, if you wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. If you want to make good internet regulation, I wouldn't start by asking a highly concentrated sector and its highly concentrated critics what that regulation should look like, because then you'll get <laughs> things like media bargaining codes, right? Uh, so as to, as to interop, I'm going to say that if you assume sort of hypothetically that you could have a good interop regulation that says, you know, you have to expose an API and here are its technical characteristics, that that regulation would still be insufficient. So if we say to Facebook, expose an API so that third parties can attach uh, um, standalone social media systems to it so that they can communicate, their users can communicate with Facebook users, which will then reduce the switching cost of leaving Facebook. I think we over-index on the network effects of why Facebook and other tech platforms got big. Obviously, people joined Facebook because their friends were already there. Once they were there, that was a reason for someone else to show up. But you know, because technology has this underlying characteristic of universality, this, this, uh, this interoperability that's there kind of because we're talking about Turing machines that can run all the programs that we know how to write, that, um, that network effect has always been balanced against low switching costs where you know, when Facebook kicks off and opens its doors to the general public, it can say, here's a tool that you can use to uh, have a bot log into your MySpace account, get your waiting messages, put them in your Facebook inbox, reply to them, and have those autopiloted back out to your MySpace outbox. And that, that low switching cost means that the network effects can be unraveled very quickly. So we might say, you know, as good policy, we're going to say to Facebook, all right, you have to allow others to do unto you as you did unto Rupert Murdoch in MySpace. You have to expose an API that lets people plug in. Um, and, and even if we did that, we would ask and expect that Facebook, if they detected someone just trying to steal user data, like exfiltrating a billion users' data, we would ask them to shut down that API, right? And say, stop, there's something bad happening on our API. But distinguishing a pretextual shutdown 
from a bona fide good faith shutdown is mm. such a fact-intensive question, yes. not least because to a first approximation, everyone qualified to adjudicate that question is a Facebook employee, that we might find years and years going by between the shutdown and the eventual adjudication. And in those years, the entrepreneurs who started the platform would learn that you can't beat Facebook. The users who relied on the Facebook would, uh, on the platform would learn that leaving Facebook was a, was a sucker's bet. And the investors would, would learn that you should never bet against Facebook and the kill zone would get bigger. And so we need something else. And that something else is scraping bots, reverse engineering, adversarial interoperability, ComCom. All that stuff that allowed Apple to joust with Microsoft by making the iWork suite that could read and write uh, all the files and formats from Microsoft Office that allowed the seven dwarves to make IBM uh, mainframe peripherals, that allowed Phoenix to clone the IBM PC ROM, that allowed all of these companies to grow, that allowed Google to show up at websites that were expecting a browser and suck down all of the data on those websites by impersonating a browser but actually running a crawler, right? All of that stuff that is part of the honorable history of dynamism, user centrism, and technological self-determination technologies history, we need to restore that. And what we could do is if we withdrew the legal protections that Facebook has or other tech platforms have against tortious interference claim, patent, uh, copyright and para-copyright like anti-circumvention, uh, non-disclosure, trade secrecy, and so on, for use by interoperators doing something in the public interest like making the service more usable, making it more private, making it more accessible to people with disabilities, then what would happen is you get a balance of forces where Facebook pretextually shut down its API, it would immediately be catapulted into guerrilla warfare with reverse engineers who are creating unquantifiable risk for its bottom line, right? They would, have, they would not know until the dust had settled how many engineers they would have to commit to combating it, how much they would lose, and they would present surprising information to their shareholders, which is the one thing no publicly listed firm wants to do, and which is the one thing that personally punishes the decision makers who would choose to create uh, pretextual shutdowns, because they're the ones whose portfolios are stuffed with Facebook shares, right? They're the ones who are gonna see their net worth devastated when they show up and say, actually, our margins aren't anywhere near what we thought they would be when we did our predictions at the end of the last quarter because we decided to shut down our API and instead we've had to do guerrilla warfare for the last three months and now we're in real trouble. And so that balance of forces would encourage the firms to color within the lines and if they decided not to because no one ever lost money betting against the hubris of tech executives, if they decided not to and they cheated anyways, well then the adversarial interoperators, the ComCom people could use bots and scraping and reverse engineering to fill in the gap while the API was down. And this is actually in the history of other firms that have successfully used this. It's basically how Mint operated for many years. Uh, unfortunately, Mint fell prey to a predatory acquisition by Intuit instead of being a standalone firm today. But you know, the, a lot of what we think about when we think of innovation in various sectors actually plays out this pattern of a dynamic between adversarial and mandated interoperability that kind of flips back and forth between one and the other until the uh, incumbent firms decide to play ball. Yeah, so I think that that is a fascinating um, idea and vision, and I think that there also is, I mean, I'm really, what I'm hearing a lot from what, what, you, just, what you just said, Corey, is also that like, there, it does strike me as somewhat of an organic process. Some of this, the inter, like there, you can't force these interoperable actors to just be like, like come out of the ether and be forced into existence. There have to be motivating factors that um, to that create that space and make people want to kind of do these types, play that type of role, um, and. Doing that requires the regulation, the top-down regulation that you're, you know, that you're discussing. And so, like, it is a, it is a, it's not even quite carrot stick. It's like you just cannot, like, these are understanding that there is that you're going to have to move at this type of scale in an organic way, and to like to pull essentially people into that space that want to be in that type of space. I think is a great point. So I'm gonna, we're gonna go to kind of a fast, very lightning round question um, that I kind of like was thinking about, which we're just gonna go really quickly and I'm gonna start with um, Barbara, but I'll ask the per perennial technocrat question, basically, which is will more tech 
like Web3, or increasing reliance on end-to-end -end encryption give us more solutions or more problems or just both? And I, I really just, <laughs> so I really think that like as a, and I'm really particularly interested in your answer, I really think that I answer so many young people's, well, why can't we just put, why can't we solve fake news with the blockchain? And I just kind of do a lot of like, well, how would you give me any for instance of how that would work? Like, I'm totally open to new solutions. Like, give me a for instance. And the thing that I get back a lot is, well, we could just make sure we can, once we decide that it's true, we can put it on the blockchain and then it can always be like, <laughs> no, you are just as kind of Corey is saying in like his, you just are recreating the systems. You're just moving the hard decisions mm -hmm. in, in like into different spaces that uh, you're not actually solving for them. So what do you think? Do you think there's more room for solutions from tech? Yeah, well, web free, where to start? So I think that, I mean, the, the answer to, I would give to these kids who are saying like, let's solve everything through the blockchain. I think that this is asking to replace the internet, which was supposed to be about democratic participation and, and human rights and freedom of expression with, you know, unregulated casino, which is gonna burn the planet to the ground. Uh, 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 Corey is clapping. Yeah, moreover, <laughs> based on this reactionary and uh, right-wing libertarian concepts. So you understand on which side of the crowd I am. And uh, I think, I mean, look, I understand the problems with the state and the problems with undemocratic states and so on. But I think that with this Web3, you have a very limited understanding of human rights and also understanding of freedom of expression because freedom of expression and human rights are not only about negative obligation not to infringe the rights. They are also about the state having a positive obligation to create enabling environment for human rights and for freedom of expression to flourish. And for that you actually really need the state because the state is the only thing we have so far to create laws and enforce those laws and also create you know, better economy and structures in it. And this is not to say that they are not undemocratic states, but there is this, this uh, fight for the reform of the state or for the democratization of the state notion of this like, you know, public power. And I don't think we should give up on that and hide behind this like, you know, ideas that technology is gonna solve everything quite opposite. We need to reclaim the power within the state, not to abandon it, but also this web free kind of solutions try to don't realize that they don't operate in void because this, there is also the, you know, sociological, social, political influences which you need for this kind of decentralization to, to operate and not to mention the control over the whole technological, you know, stack, next generation of technology, connectivity, quantum computing, you know, all of this. So I just, really wouldn't give up on the role of the state and having a proper human rights based regulation of this space. Um, I'm just going to take this opportunity to quickly say we're going to go down the line, but I'm, if people have questions, please raise your hand. We have people with mics on either side of the room. Andrew? Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I, I, I think um, we can't regulate our way out of the problems we face. We can't blockchain our way out of the problems <laughs> we face. Um, we do need to build more and better stuff, and I'm actually a little on the more optimistic side about some of the cool things that you can do, do with decentralized permanent ledgers and tokenized incentive systems. But, um, you know, I think it's telling that the dominant kind of discourse in Web3 is, you know, sort of to me captured by the wildly incoherent idea of financial censorship um, and uh, otherwise known in the real world as, as anti-money laundering. Um, and so uh, we have to move way beyond that for those uh, infrastructures to become a useful part of the solution set. But I do think there's some promise there. Yeah. Zoe? I mean, where do I begin? I already told you I was generally an English major, so thinking through like <laughs> what blockchain is going to solve in terms of like massive speech questions, it's a hard thing for me to answer from a technical perspective. I would say, you know, is somehow Web3 going to build a magic classifier that somehow takes down all of the hate speech, all of the terrorist speech, but leaves up all the political speech? Or is blockchain going to give us some idea of a granular level of understanding of people's age, who's under 18, who's under 13, who's a minor, uh, in a, in a privacy-respecting way? Th those are the types of challenges that we're facing that are being written into regulation, and I'm not 
sure, but hopefully there are smarter people in this room than I am who can tell me how that can happen through, um, through, through these new technologies. I'd be all ears, certainly. Yeah. Corey, quickly, and then we're going to go to questions. I mean, I, I just think that it's orthogonal. I think that when, even if you stipulate that blockchain does what it says it does, which I don't think it does, and even if you stipulate that it will solve the problems that it purports to solve. Those aren't the problems that we're having when we talk about when we talk about this stuff. Yes. Um, it's it's like it's like having your house burned down and someone showing up with a really cool burglar alarm, and uh, I don't know <laughs> what that's supposed to do about my <laughs> on fire. <laughs> yeah, no. So I mean, so one of the ways I mean the way that I am I agree with you generally, but um, I do also think that the that for better or for worse. What we are seeing, and and exactly what Andrew said, and exactly what Barbara said, which is that there are being used to escape, like those tools of encryption are being used to escape the regulation that we are on the cusp of kind of putting forward and, and proposing. And so the question is, like, is regulation going to necessarily um, be able to outrun in this kind of constant game of cat and mouse the new tech challenges that are coming, the new frictionless, the new ability to escape the, the hand of the state? And I, th I think that these are kind of the next questions to kind of be thinking about. End-to-end -end encryption is, in a lot of places, um, an answer to, uh, to censorship. Um, and to uh, establish regulation that censors people, um, and it's a very and that's very real. I don't. I'm, I'm less skeptical, if I can say anything nice necessarily, about what NFTs are doing for people or anything else. But I do think that like there are that those are. There's always a vanguard. It will just be kind of. I'm interested to see how how much they take root. So do we have questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you very much for a uh, super fascinating panel, prim primarily, I think, for Zoe, the question. Um, regarding sort of the um, impact on competition that you lined out with Just the closer new, to the mic. new regulatory uh, proposals and their impact to sort of competition, uh, do you think some um, factors that could be used to, to make such distinctions um, and have sort of graduated uh, graduated uh, regulatory proposals are inherently better than others. So, for instance, in the DSA, we have the VLOP uh, threshold of, of uh, uh, so, uh, so and so many uh, million active monthly users. You could also look to sort of short and medium enterprise definitions that point to uh, number of employees or turnover. And do you think some of these factors are better than others in, in, in doing this? So Great question. I would say that I'm a big fan and definitely in favor of graduated obligations based on, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I would do it uh, necessarily by size alone or if there has to be an element of uh, risk assessment as well. Uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, that small doesn't mean safe, right? And if what's really motivating a lot of content regulations is um, user safety, uh, user harms, then I, I think we could get into a, a false assumption that just because you're small that you are not risky because we've seen that not play out. Um, as far as one thing I should mention specifically about the VLOP and the VLOS uh, obligations in the DSA is it doesn't include some things that are still very high bars for decentralized networks or small players in the market. I mentioned one of those, which is out of court redress. I think that's Article 18. Um, and so there are obligations even in the even in the you know four small platforms that are still very high bars for people to meet. And so I think we should just be thinking about those very carefully. Uh, Daphne just mouthed to me Article 21. My bad. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, they, no, they just renumbered they all of the DSA <laughs> just to make it easier on us. Um, so, uh, yeah. But anyways, I was thanks, just teasing. Thanks for fact checking. I also yeah. think that people didn't, if people were not, did not see Corey's hilarious comment in response to Daphne, in response to Zoe calling out, um, calling out Daphne for have pointing all of the people who are now lawyers. But I was like, I, I think that there, there is a, there is such a, there is such a very kind of, it's an incredibly small amount of people who had such are continuing to have and be resources and have lived through this space and it just is like so wonderful to have that type of expertise here right now. 100% I will say my search fee councils are the best lawyers I have ever worked with. They are amazing and they really think about these things through the access of freedom of expression and access to information. It's like I, I've never seen a legal department really be so critical to like the, the heart and soul of a product actually. Yeah, question? 
Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Just to say thank you, first of all, and also to disclose that I work for a large tech company, and so I think I'm programmed by now to ask a question about operational realities and scale. Um, so we know that content moderation is hard um, at any scale. We also know that content moderation at a very large scale um, is incredibly challenging and expensive. And so I'm just interested, when Barbara was talking about Article 19's recommendation for DSA um, and the unbundling, and I think you also mentioned third parties having the ability to provide content moderation services and also to layer on a kind of human rights lens in order to tie those together. I guess I just it's a question about the theory and the reality and whether or not um, the panel can um, give us thoughts on how that would be achieved um, at scale when some of these platforms are obviously dealing with billions of users and billions of pieces of content. So, so our proposal for unbundling um, was uh, for the companies with significant market power. And uh, it's not for, it doesn't, it doesn't propose that this uh, content moderation, which the users can choose, would have to provide this content moderation for the whole country, right? Or, the, for, or on an entire planet. So it can be a situation where you would have, for instance, you know, in Myanmar, the users would choose the local you know, integrated player or a local company. And I think uh, with Michael, who is later talking about, there are actually su uh, already such um, examples where a company has been providing some content moderation services for that market. Or like, you know, for other countries, like, you know, Czech Republic, we have an integrated player, says Nam, it's like dominant company in that country. So you could use that for uh, providing your moderation services. So just uh, not saying that you would have to choose someone who would be, you know, an entire operations. And there is obviously the issue of costs because uh, at the beginning this might not be competitive. Uh, the new players, alternative players might not be, you know, having resources needed for it. So we are talking about something like public service, uh, subsidies, and so on. So it requires the operationalization, but still it's our proposal. Any other questions? Michael. This touches on something that Corey said, but I think it's a question for anyone who wants to answer it, uh, about having uh, employees that are subject to you know, governmental uh, you know, attack. And I think that there's obviously negatives to it in the sense that the government can attack your employees, but there's also in some sense a positive to it in the sense that it puts people in a boat where instead of this being a distant object of, oh yeah, that might be a problem, it's like, oh damn, they just arrested Joe. You know, it, it's a very different sense. It's a very much tighter um, connection. And I would love to see companies actually grapple with the need to protect employees who are you know, subject to these kinds of attacks by maybe allowing them to have anonymity. Maybe they could pay them in Bitcoin. I mean, can we really grapple with this kind of thing um, and still have those very strong connections so that when I talk to a member of like the Twitter health and safety team, if he, he's like, oh, well, we have to obey the laws. It's like, well, but. So I would love to hear that. Yeah, Andrew? So that's a super interesting point. So um, uh, one of the things that I think was that sort of shined through, so, um, uh, Daphne and uh, Daphne's counterpart, Nicole Wong, and I, uh, at least Nicole and I started on the same day at Google. And we basically spent, at some point, kind of like a year putting together a big manual, uh, a set of binders that basically was, went country by country with all of the considerations that related to having data center infrastructure and employees in any country around the world. Because, you know, Google was expanding. And so we were like, all right, we need to figure this out. Because once you have employees there, you have a different... Uh, kind of like relationship to that country and its jurisdiction. Once you have uh, 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 servers in a place, maybe you have different obligations. Once you have cash flows, at least you're at risk of losing the money that you, you, may, you may have stored there or earned there and kept in a bank account. So anyway, so we tried to sort of work our way through that. And one of the things that really shined through to me was that in particular, American Silicon Valley companies got very, very, very uncomfortable distinguishing between countries that have rule of law and countries that don't. And basically saying, we're just gonna treat, 
Iran differently from we're gonna, how we're going to treat Canada. And looking back on it now, it's hard for me to remember exactly why that was, but I see evidence of it all over the place where companies have a very difficult time saying, like, you know, Brazil's court system is subject to capture in a way that uh, Denmark's is not, or, you know, uh, the dynamics in Japan are different. And anyway, that's one weird little complicating factor. I'll just note that uh, at Access Now, um, we have worked our way through employees in places where their identity can't be known. That is, it is possible to do that. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, um, I think that uh, uh, companies probably could as well. Whether it's really worth it for them to do, I think is another matter, but it's not like it's an unsolvable problem. The issue though is, um, you know, to really uh, subject yourself to the jurisdiction of a country like China uh, or, um, uh, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, let's say these days, is, um, is, you know, one, I'd like to see Silicon Valley's make more principled distinctions uh, uh, on if, if, uh, if I were in their shoes. Kate, can I just say from analogous experience also, you make very, the calculus is so different when you're worried about your coworkers personal safety. And I speak not from working at a tech company, but having, um, from my past experience in the UN, having people on the ground, in the field, um, being threatened by host governments, being threatened by uh, rebel groups and things like that. And once you're talking about the safety and security of people that you work with, it's a, it's a, it's a very different conversation. And the decisions are driven by the fact that you want to make sure that your colleagues are safe. That's just overriding. I mean, I, I, I want to just sort of give us a little case study about how this can go wrong. Um, so uh, Facebook obviously has a sales staff in Cambodia. In Cambodia, there's an autocratic dictator who's got a terrible human rights record who nearly lost his office in what was almost the first fair election in Cambodian, modern Cambodian history, where a Facebook organized opposition uh, was able to mobilize a lot of voters to vote against him. Uh, he subsequently hired Facebook experts and became very uh, closely connected to Facebook's operations team in Cambodia. And he weaponized Facebook's real names policy because he runs the government. He can tell you if someone is speaking pseudonymously from Cambodia and he could have Facebook then turf those people off of Facebook or force them to reveal their identities. Um, moreover, when people were speaking pseudonymously from the C Cambodian diaspora abroad, he could force Facebook to either kick them off or, or require them to disclose their identities, which would put their relations in country in harm's way. Uh, and all of that is this kind of toxic mix of a national firewall and uh, staff on the ground and an extremely badly considered policy on Facebook's part of this real names policy. And you roll them all together and you get this thing where, um, you know, Facebook is now a, a very active agent of extremely uh, uh, human rights abusing regime and complicit in uh, extrajudicial um, disappearances, torture, and, and executions. Yeah. Um, we have time for one last question. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I guess two questions. First one's probably rhetorical. It's colored a bit by uh, I'm a lawyer uh, and a software developer, so I want to. You provide some gentle pushback. So one, this is like the third time I've heard this, uh, lawyers can uh, draft regulations and the engineering doesn't matter, and with regard to like the FAA example. So like the 737 MAX 8, right? If you, if you just, just Google it, like the, the Federal Inspector General stated that the, auditor, the federal auditors just didn't understand the software, and that's part of the reason why the MCAS went forward. And so um, I'm pro-lawyer, I'm a lawyer, but the engineering, like matters, <laughs> and and I think it's it's incumbent on the policymakers to, un, like like pay homage to that, like to realize that, and then and then sort of the second is a question about counterfactuals, right? So, um, I was in Myanmar when the genocide incited, incited on Facebook went down, right? Um, and so I'm <laughs> I've been very critical of of Facebook, especially in that time, as kind of Zoe and other people and Barbara well know. However. The counterfactual, we can know. It's unlike an international relations class where you can't know the counterfactual. So the counterfactual is uh, WeChat. Like, uh, so, sort of implicit in all this discussion is some sort of like, 
Western tech supremacy, which is frankly not true anymore. So, so imagine the counterfactual where Facebook, Google, everybody bows out um, in Global South countries. It, it is extremely likely that WeChat comes right on in mm. and there are local companies mm. who, like developing Facebook now is not especially difficult for very talented local developers. Those companies will rise up in this but, and are much more likely to be lockstep with the whims of authoritarian regimes. And I'm not saying that that's lesser than or whatever, but I think that needs to be incorporated. Like, what, like, what do you think about that? Like, what are your thoughts? I'm gonna just, I know everyone here is going to have something to say about that. <laughs> um, uh, but I was just gonna say that um, I'm gonna give a shout out really quickly to kind of the, the amazing book um, by Jack Goldsmith and Tim Wu, who controls the internet, that I think deeply foreshadows this question. And I, just as a side note, I had a conversation in, with Jack about this, Jack Goldsmith in like 2015, and to give you an idea of like how long it has taken for us to recognize the problems that he was saying, which was essentially that Tim and Jack were saying that listen, what is going to happen is that the entire world is going to use, like all these nation states are going to eventually use the internet and the regulation of the internet and the control of the internet for their own geopolitical warfare and national security where all of these things that we are, and like these power, power draws in the same way and it's going to end up being China and the EU and the US that are kind of these regulatory monsters in the room. And uh, when I remember talking to Jack in 2015, saying what an amazing book it was and how it still stands up, he goes, oh, none of that actually happened. And then the last seven years has like truly like, um, has I think truly kind of um, shown us that that is exactly what is happening. Um, and so to foreshadow, to, I think that you're incredibly correct, which is also why I think that I'm so frustrated with a lot of the conversations that continue to happen and treat this space that ignore the majority world and all of the engineers and everything that's happening and the power of all of these. I mean, I just give a lot of talks and there's, when I tell North American populations that they're, you know, of a certain age and demographic that they're, that the US is only 7% of the population on Facebook, people are just like, they literally gasp in the room often. They just have no idea that's how insignificant they're kind of, the, the sheer numbers that they, that they have are. That said, that same population is $56 average rate per user, and the next closest market to that is Europe with $14 average rate per user. Um, and it goes down after that. So I just think that there is, I think that you've hit on a lot of really um, huge questions, and I'm very much hoping that those become the questions of the next um, the next couple of years, and it is like, we're like almost, it's almost too late. Not to change the subject. <laughs> um, but I also, I, I had a kind of different response to Mike's thoughtful provocation here, which is, I don't know, like ha half of the GNI board is in this room, and I just say to my human rights advocates uh, who are here with us, thank you for everything that you do on freedom of expression, everything that you do on privacy rights. Sometimes we don't talk enough about the right to travel and what does that mean in the digital age, especially uh, as we live through internet shutdowns and I think, um, I think Mike's response reminds us of how important that is. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So you are right, Mike. Just and this is the yeah, this is actually not a hypothetical question because we have seen from other, from some markets when let's say t telecommunication examples, when Teliasonera moved out from certain markets, I think Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and so on. Obviously, Chinese uh, company uh, moved moved in. So this is not a hypothetical question and real concern for human rights subsequently. So. Um, but I still think that uh, what you described from Myanmar is actually embodiment of the problem we actually have here, is the problem with the content moderation, but also the power of Facebook there, which didn't happen by accident. And we can also see how the lack of regulation about the zero basics and infrastructure contrib contributed to this problem, because it was not just everybody loved Facebook in Myanmar. And was it, like Facebook was internet, because how it got there and how it bribed mm -hmm. everyone, build the infrastructure and so on. So I don't think that the, the, the problem can be distilled to Facebook, which will protect human rights, or this Western company, which will uh, protect human rights 
or Chinese companies which want. So I don't think the dichotomy is like that. And we actually need this uh, regulation and EU is going the right direction there. So that's why it looks at markets and the power and the, by the way, the, if it was not already clear, the obligations on the, this regulation in the EU will be different for companies like Google and Facebook and small companies. So small company uh, and you know website and intermediary will not have to spend this m amount of money, which Zoe mentioned, because the, the obligations are, are different. Obviously, everybody will need to fill, uh, fulfill some obligations, but those very large online platforms and search engines will have other, and that's correct approach. I, I want to uh, endorse the idea that the technical contours of regulation matter a lot and that understanding the technology is key to doing good regulation. I, you know, there's this sort of inside joke in kind of the digital rights world that oftentimes lawmakers' response is nerd harder. And there are some things where when you say to tech firms, you must do this, they will say it's technologically impossible and what they mean is it's expensive or inconvenient. <laughs> and there are others where they mean it's like making pi equal to three. And unless you understand the underlying contours, it can be very hard uh, to know when you're getting snowed. So this is one of the reasons why um, diversity in the sector is very important because the, the, then you'll get people who will show up and say, actually, the people who are saying this is technologically impossible are, are talking nonsense, we can do it. And, and you need to be able to really tell when it's right and when it's wrong. I, I'm thinking now the Article 13, now Article 17 debate mm -hmm. in the European Union about copyright filters and the you know, broad chorus of independent tech experts who said building a filter that can understand copyright infringement, irrespective of what your copyright limitations and exceptions framework looks like, is impossible because all of them have some contextual clues, plus they're just the intrinsic problems of filters uh, and, and pattern matching uh, and false positives and false negatives. And then y you did have a lot of nerd harder and some of that nerd harder came from the um, tech companies themselves that wanted to sell this. So there are a bunch of filter companies who showed up and said, no, 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 we have these filters. Uh, and then where you might expect the tech giants to say, well, those filters don't work very well, Instead, both Facebook and YouTube ultimately came out in favor of filters and said, well, we build filters and we think they're great, uh, not, never mentioning that this is a kind of capital moat that will be used to prevent new market entrants. Content ID is $100 million in CapEx so far, uh, and you know, it, it only touches a fraction of what Article 17 would expect of firms. And so the, the, um, the final thing I want to say about not having the technical understanding is that it creates these moral hazards, right? That when you set up um, a, a filter that can block uh, speech without oversight, it would be incredibly naive to assume that people who want to block speech without oversight wouldn't abuse it. And so when we see you know, a cop in Beverly Hills playing Taylor Swift out of his phone when he's being observed by a, a citizen journalist recording them with a, with a mobile phone with the intention of posting it to YouTube, we should understand that that cop is acting in a way that is absolutely predictable. You know, people go, oh look, science fiction is coming true. And I'm like, that would be the hackiest science fiction imaginable because it is obvious from the jump that this is exactly what people are gonna do. You know, give us, give us a little credit as a, as a class, us science fiction writers, to come up with more interesting ideas than, than that uh, in, in how these systems will be abused. And so, you know, all together, it means that we do have to have a marriage of policymakers and, and, and technologists. And I'll finally say that this is a live issue uh, in, in a country that I'm sure there are representatives from in the room there, in the United Kingdom, where Parliament gave the Competition and Markets Authority a budget to hire 80 full-time engineers for the Digital Markets Unit, but has failed to produce the secondary legislation that gives them any enforcement powers. Um, and whether that's the result of lobbying by people who would be in their crosshairs or the generally shambolic nature of British politics is not clear to me. But either way, you have, I think, the largest technical collection of antitrust investigators in the world who have no regulatory powers. All they do is produce reports. Uh, and yes, those reports are, are, have been leveraged by the EU and so on, but what an absolute omni-shambles, even by contemporary British standards, <laughs> that these people are just sitting on their hands. I, I mean, well said, Corey. Great question, great question to end on. Um, 
what Corey doesn't realize is that it's 1.40 here, and we're, you're between us and lunch. Uh, so, <laughs> but we're, so we're, you know, no, so it's, uh, but it is, um, it, it, this was, I want to thank everybody for like a, just a really rich panel and like a conversation. <laughs> and I just, as a final thing, I'm just going to say that the, the, the fact that we're still, like the, the interconnected, like the, we've talked about regulation today, all of these laws are interconnected. All of them have effects outside their nation state borders. All of this tech does too. All of it is like a, like a combination of people being science fiction authors and anthropologists and sociologists and engineers and lawyers. And these are things that are all fitting together at the same time. And so I'm really hoping that this continues to be such a rich discussion and so diverse and we can only make it more so to, if we're gonna find solutions. So with that, um, thank you guys so much and um, we are going to have lunch. Yep, thanks guys. So we have just under an hour, so we have to start the next panel around 2.30. And the, the food is in the back of the room, and um, in, enjoy the break, and I hope you continue the conversations.
So welcome back. Um, before we start the next session, we're honored to share a brief welcome remarks video from one of our esteemed partners and continued supporters of our initiative. It's my pleasure to introduce Guillermo Canella, Chief of the Section of Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists for UNESCO. His remarks, Guillermo will discuss the way forward in multilateral regulatory policy. Right after his remarks, we will continue with our last session of the day, titled Business Viability, Decentralizing Power, and Opening Up Competition. The panel will be moderated by Farzane Bade, who is the Head of Outreach and Engagement at Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. She is the founder of Digital Medusa, an initiative that focuses on protecting the core values of our global digital space with sound governance. For the past decade, Farzane has directed and led projects about internet and social media governance. So at this moment, we're going to now turn it over to Guillermo um, before starting with our final session. Thank you. Dear colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, first, I would like to thank Columbia Global Freedom of Expression Project and particular Dr. Catalina Botero for your kind invitation to this very important event. I wish I was there with you, but I'm actually attending a similar discussion with a group of senior judges and prosecutors at The Hague these very same days. Social media platforms provide unprecedented opportunities for people to connect, learn, and engage. They facilitate the exercise of freedom of expression, access to information, with enormous potential to bring people together, including to tackle some very important global challenges. However, as I am sure many of you have already discussed during, those, during these debates, Social media platforms may also be used as vectors for hate speech, disinformation, misinformation, and other content potentially harmful to human rights and to the democratic processes. We are certain that companies need to do much more to have consistent and transparent policies covering technology development, content, and behaviors, as well as effective notice and review procedures and effective remedies, as well as sufficient resources for such operations. We have recommended in different moments to conduct human rights due diligence, implement mitigation measures that are proportionate to the severity of the foreseen or actual risk, assess continually all automated content moderation processes, recommending systems and other actions that prioritize and recommend specific content and groups. And we are not saying that all responsibility relies only with the companies and the platforms. Both states and companies have responsibilities relating to potential online harms to a range of human rights. Urgent action is needed by both to address these issues mindful that freedom of expression and all other human rights apply online as they do offline. Therefore, we need approach to regulating, co-regulating and self-regulating content that protect people from serious harm while securing information as a public good. Therefore, your discussions are more timely than ever. We are at a breaking point. As you probably know, there are at least 190 different regulatory initiatives around regulating online content, including those at state level, for instance, in the United States. Can you imagine what enforcement would look like in a scenario like this? We are aware that some approaches to regulation have inadvertently or deliberately led to suppressing freedom of expression or have simply proved ineffective, ineffective in dealing with harms. The lack of technical capacity in most state administrations hampers the regulatory's ability to understand the technological aspects of, uh, that underpin digital platforms and therefore have difficulty developing, developing effective regulation that are in line with international human rights law and therefore does not have inadvertent uh, negative consequences. So, 
the debate on regulation is present and self-regulation is no longer the only option out there. But a challenge remains. What should the, be the approach to regulation that protects the benefits while neutralizes or at least minimizes the harms? Following the debate, we have been underlining, for instance, that any regulatory approach must consider that the right to freedom of expression is the right to impart, but also the right to seek and receive information, ideas, opinions, and it should be protected and promoted in a coherent and comprehensive way. Greater transparency and accountability with a focus on processes are strongly preferred over content-based restrictions. Any regulatory debates should follow some key standards, among which the full respect for international human rights law and the multi-stakeholder multi participation. Civil society actors and journalists, for instance, need to have open, secure access to online spaces and have a say in the development of measures related to digital technologies and platforms. To allow this conversation to happen among the different stakeholders involved in trying to find solutions and tackle the debate on regulation of digital platforms, UNESCO is organizing the global conference Internet for Democracy that will be held on February 2023. The goal of this global conference is for UNESCO to develop through a multi-stakeholder process of consultations a model regulatory framework for the digital platforms to secure information as a public good while protecting freedom of expression and other human rights. The conference will include the participation of member states, ministries, regulators, parliamentarians, judicial actors, the private sector, the United Nations, civil society, academia, and technical community. We hope to see you, to see you all there and or better here in Paris, and we are more than open to receive the results of your discussions so that they can inform the process that is underway. We, we want to be able to create an environment where meaningful participation and engagement can happen. This will only be possible if companies, governments, civil society, media, academic experts along with international organizations such as UNESCO, work together. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is, can you hear me? Thank you. All right. OK. So welcome to this session on business viability, decentralizing power, and opening up competition. Uh, we heard um, a few remarks uh, in the last session about uh, the fact that we can't blockchain our way out of problems we face, and we heard some skepticism. Uh, the morning session was uh, more hopeful. Uh, of course, we are not here to convert you. Uh, to believe in blockchain or Web3, but uh, we want to uh, look at a few uh, viable uh, businesses that could, um, uh, that could potentially work to provide and protect freedom of speech and, um, uh, and what the internet has brought us all these years, um, uh, interconnectivity and interoperability and uh, universality. So today I have uh, Michael Lewin uh, from Coco Tech Foundation in, Myan uh, in Myanmar, uh, which was uh, established nearly a decade ago. Pre-coup, Coco Tech had over 150 employees, 95% Myanmar nationals with 55% women. In happier de uh, days, Coco Tech worked on building fundamental civilian e-governments and did a bunch of cool things. And Michael is a cool person himself. He's a lawyer and also a technologist and a developer. And um, he uh, has uh, also like he has uh, his team is building a decentralized platform for civil society to independently review Facebook, Twitter, 
and TikTok's content moderation pipelines. And uh, disgruntled by the lack of state response to the Myanmar coup, Michael became interested in Web3 as a possible alternative and also works as a senior product manager for Trust Wallet. And we also have Alison McCauley, is, uh, who's a chief ad advocacy officer at Unfinish and the founder of Unblocked Future, a strategy firm that helps emerging tech pioneers with thought leadership and go to, mar uh, and go to market. Alison holds degrees in psychology, sociology, and uh, organizational behavior and development from Stanford University. For over five years, uh, Alison has worked to raise awareness and understanding of the new possible unlocked by blockchain technology. Alison has a, a very interesting book as well, which I don't, uh, it's called Unblocked, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I definitely recommend reading it. Alison has not told me this, <laughs> I read this and it was very enjoyable and realistic. So without, um, so the objective of this uh, session is to discuss um, what's, why you thought of going to alternative technologies, uh, resorting to alternative technology to uh, address some of these social and economic issues that uh, we have in, in the society globally. So Michael, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah, do you want to do like seven seconds? Yeah, yeah. so if we can get the deck. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I surmised, uh, I guess it, it turned out to be right, uh, that, uh, you know, there would be skepticism, a lot of it warranted, frankly, towards Web3, and so I thought I would just make my presentation about that. Um, so let's zoom out a bit, right? I think uh, you all know this guy well. Uh, Paul Krugman is, uh, to say he's bearish on crypto and Web3 is to make an understatement, right? These are some of his statements. I'm sure you've read a, read a lot of it, right? Um, uh, he doesn't see the point of crypto, sees it as a money laundering scheme. Um, techno babble and libertarian derp, very nice turn of, turn of phrase. Um, on the other hand, he did say this about the internet back in 1998, which uh, his, uh, his trolls, like uh, his his antagonists, such as Mark Andreessen, like uh, posting us on Twitter, um, uh, and then maybe on the other side is Balaji Srinivasan, uh, ex CTO of Coinbase, um, uh, now very much a thought leader. Um, <coughs> uh, he, uh, I think he, uh, like Allison, also has many degrees from Stanford. Um, in engineering, and uh, and uh, he's uh, I think on the techno libertarian side, and uh, uh, he's maybe a major antagonist of Zoe here, saying like uh, you know, policy people are just English majors, and what do they know? Like how are they like comment on on, on tech? Um, and uh, and the stack is like this term's thrown around a lot. Here's like the the as as I want to use it today, not not the actual like application layer down to the bare metal, okay? So so for me, uh, picking two polarized straw men as examples of one side and the other, um, I kind of define the stack as, uh, you know, yeah, the high 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 level of abstraction, you have like sort of conceptual arguments that are largely going on today, right? Um, and, uh, and these are often argued by analogy, like uh, analogy to the airplanes, and then philosophy, right? As you go down, you get closer to the engineering. And I think um, this is sort of at the core of the disagreement. I think Balaji comes from the bottom of the stack, largely when he makes his arguments and pushes up to the top, and then Krugman's coming the other, uh, Krugman's coming the other way from, from the top, maybe going a level down. Um, oh, speaking to the mic, okay, sorry. So I'm, I'm super loud as default, so I try and run away from the mic. So, um, 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 Krugman likes to bring up Venmo a lot and uh, and saying like, we've got Venmo. Why do we need, like Venmo works, dudes. Uh, why do we need this blockchain thing? He's a Nobel laureate. He's a, I think maybe emeritus at Princeton. I don't know what happened here. Okay. Um, Northeastern elite, New York 
as economists, maybe except for the Nobel, I don't know, there might be another laureate in the room, uh, maybe we fit a lot, of, in the, a lot of these buckets, like, is this us? Um, he's like, why do we need this thing? Um, and so maybe he's out of touch. On the other hand, there are a lot of scams in Web3. Like, I know, I work in Web3. There are a lot of scams. Like, every week, there's a scam. Every, every week, basically, there's a major bridge exploit. Um, bridges are particularly vulnerable, so that's like trans transfer of tokens from one chain to another. Um, that happens all the time. There's this um, ridiculous hack of Solana wallets a couple months ago where the team was leaving private keys in plain text on a server, and then an intern inadvertently exposed that via API, and I feel really bad for that intern. Uh, <laughs> um, there's Doquan, like if you don't not aware of Doquan, just go on Google and search for him and be like endlessly entertained slash triggered, depending on your kind of personality. Um, and uh, and I think he's currently like Interpol has a red quest out for him, right? He's on the run. Um, I think it was last seen in Singapore. Um, and he's famous for the UST, the Terra Luna debacle. I mean, debacle is an understatement. Like um, there was like what like my first week in Web three was this UST debacle. And I, th I forget, $50 billion in value or something like that vanished in like the span of a couple of days. I actually bought some Luna when it was maybe 0 .00001 cent and thought, ah, you know, maybe it'll go up. And now it's like 0 .00000000, like there's a lot more zeros. Um, and it's true, like um, I think they wanted, uh, you know, crypto natives, those are like Web3 maxi, uh, you can get in the word soup here, but uh, people who are very bullish on Web3. They will say to other crypto natives that a lot of these protocols are Ponzi-nomics, but they won't admit it. Uh, they won't admit it to uh, normies, which are uh, non-crypto natives are called. They'll, they won't admit it to you. But Ponzi-nomics is a lot of what's going on. Um, and so, what to make of this, right? Like, so to me, this feels very, very tribal. You either go with Krugman and you make kind of conceptual right, policy arguments and then rant about this is capitalism and libertarian derp gone amok, or you side with Balaji and you say, um, you guys don't even know how to code. So like, what are you, are you talking about? So there's this nice ribbon farm. Uh, ribbon farm is a blog for those of you who follow. It's this consultant guy who uh, writes, he literally wrote 10,000 words, I think probably more on this on the sacred and profane, so it's like devil, devil angel categories, right? And, and I find that, you know, how do you get, I, I find both sides useful, is what I'm trying to say. And so, you know, people arguing at the conceptual level may have lack deep level expertise. And this guy in Ribbon Farm essay spent 10,000 10, words basically saying this. Um, but, because he's try, he was trying to justify management consulting. But since they have distance, <laughs> because he gets paid by McKinsey. But, but because they have distance, they don't have, the, it's not their baby, they're, you know, um, they don't really have skin in the game other than getting paid to kind of parachute in. They might spot patterns that, since they are relatively without, like, in-group bias, that those in the in-group may not see, right? On the, um, on the other hand, so then, then you look at the crypto natives engineers, right? Um, they understand the problems much more deeply, and so some of the claims, uh, m you know, start to come across as absurd sometimes that um, uh, maybe people are at the conceptual uh, layer might, might, might advocate for. Um, but being, you know, writing code personally that goes to production may blind them to um, problems with their approach. Um, and so let's let's kind of zoom go back to the to the to the Krugman argument. So when when Krugman said he br brings up Venmo a lot, and I like roll my eyes like all the way back into my in, into my head whenever he says this, because it's like obviously Paul Krugman's a very smart man, and also obviously he has like spent no time in the global south outside of like a four seasons hotel, like <laughs> like Venmo Venmo doesn't work, <laughs> like there's no Venmo. Um, <laughs> um, there's mobile money providers who are like often, frankly, better than Venmo. If you look at like M-Pesa in Kenya, um, uh, and and uh, uh, and and 
however, and they're often local or regional, but they are also enthralled to often what are authoritarian regimes. Um, Myanmar is a perfect example where I uh, was operating uh, in for eight years um, and is currently undergoing a br brutal military coup, and I'll get to that in a later slide. And then, you know, you take ACH SWIFT for, for granted, like you wire somebody money, and maybe it's done in an instant, or it takes days in many global South countries. It takes days, and then like a one, it's like a one or two percent transaction fee. And actually, if you've spent time, even in the US, so I worked at a logistics startup briefly, um, uh, for the technologists in the room, I kind of like rage quit because um, they don't like, they don't do, pro they don't even do agile scrum. It was like completely insane to me. Um, um, but uh, even in like a huge multi-trillion dollar vertical, uh, like logistics, the tr like trucking in the US, right? The most em employment by number of people headcount in the US, they use cashier's checks because they don't want to pay these 3% merchant fees and they don't want to pay a one to 2%, like today in 2022. They're using, because a, a cashier's check is $7 flat. So today in the US, in one of the largest <laughs> verticals there are, because they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with the fees. So so to us, like, it, uh, you know, uh, you know, to, to, to us, like, well-heeled uh, white-collar workers, oh, it's not a big deal, but but actually, um, once you, it's useful getting down to the granular layer because you find it, it winds up mattering. Um, and and specifically to the case of Myanmar. So, so uh, in Myanmar, there was a coup on February 1st, 2021, um, and you think inflation is bad in the Eurozone US, right? Try, it was around 1,200, 1,300 Myanmar juts uh, to $1, I mean, less than two years ago. Now it's over 3,000. And that, that means, right, and for any of you who are an economist in the room, millions of people will starve to death. Like, that, that's what it means. The, the WFP, the World Food Program, and UN agencies are kind of keeping things going, but it's a Band-Aid, right, on a very open wound. And the, <coughs> and why is the inflation happening? The junta controls the central bank. Um, they've been printing money. They actually, uh, um, someone uh, uh, success successfully lobbied the German company that was printing their ink to, to stop selling it. Uh, may or may not, anyway. So they weren't able to print money for a while, but then now they are, and there's inflation. Um, um, and they control the telcos. Um, there's an, uh, the telcos send any user data on demand, um, and they control the banks and the mobile money providers. And so I've had uh, employees imprisoned because the military is just looking at their transactions to see if they're donating to the civil disobedience movement. And so when, uh, like, that there's like no value-added use case for Web3, this is why I got interested in Web3 um, is because of this. Um, and now um, uh, Myanmar's gonna, likely almost certainly gonna get added to the FATF, the FATF, I don't know exactly how the acronym works, um, uh, and only North Korea and Iran are on it, and that will completely shut off the international banking system to it. Um, um, it like stuff you take for granted, oh, I wanna send money overseas. Only TransferWise, now WISE, worked in Myanmar for that, and now they shut down. And so, literally, all that's going to be left is crypto. Like, that's it. Um, right, so I've already said this. And, and, and because, you know, we could, you know, a, a sociologist can get into the weeds on this, the, the, the drivers, racism, colonialism, whatever, maybe more stuff like, um, maybe Nobel Lloyd Aung San Suu Kyi misplayed her hand, right? Um, but Myanmar is not, the, the resistance movement, Myanmar is not getting any, uh, the financial or in-kind support that Ukraine is. And I'm sure you've all read how crypto is actually very important for funding the Ukraine um, I'm more of it. The, the NUG, the National Unity Government, is the shadow civilian government trying to keep things going. The PDF is like People's Defense Forces, they're militias, akin to you know, uh, colonial era militias in the States. And they're fighting the good fight, but it's all, it's all fragmented. Um, and so how do you prevent, not, 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 how do you mitigate or try and address like millions of people who are gonna starve to death um, and like remittances that are now become, 
going to become very difficult because of adding to the FATF list. I mean, wallets. The problem is um, the, you know, if any of you use a MetaMask wallet or, uh, you know, Coinbase has a wallet, um, the user experience for that is very complicated. Like if any of you have done it, you have to install a Chrome web browser extension. And then the problem with um, soft wallets, as they're called, you can get rugged. I've been rugged. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, developers are particularly vulnerable for this because you might be testing something out and you put a private key in a .env file and then commit it to GitHub and then you don't make the re repository private. And anyway, so 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 like the the the, the, uh, the um, um, and then there's cold wallets like hardware wallets, um, um, uh, and there's multi-sig wallets, multi-signature wallets called Gnosis Safe, but the learning curve for that is extremely high. Um, and so how do you get, basically Myanmar is 55 million people, there are lots of other countries that are facing various forms of dictatorship today, as we know, authoritarian, autocratic regimes appear to be on the rise. How do you get them all wallets where they won't get rugged? And because if you could get them wallets, they would all have, like presumably you could think about like um, US foreign aid is a $150 billion annual market. Like Give directly does great work. Imagine if you just gave people USDC stable coins, which to me, other than your C, stable coins are the only real stable coins because <coughs> the Circle Foundation has a one-to-one, -one, they, they keep um, real cash in reserves at FDIC insured banks and they publish the results of an audit of those funds every month. To me, they're the only real stable coin, like Tether and uh, DAI, uh, <laughs> question, <laughs> questionable. But USDC, um, imagine if like you dumped 100 USDC into these people's wallets all over the globe, you'd have a big inflation hedge as the local currency gets inflated uh, away and they could con they could buy food you'd have a secondary economy come up independent of uh, a dictator's control you you people who would be able to buy food stuffs all the basic necessities of life make donations to the resistance movement the military couldn't stop i mean okay then they have, they go after the isps they they have options left but the military would not be able to monitor those transactions. They would not be able to stop transactions other than going after the ISPs and the undersea internet cables. <clears throat> um, and people don't starve to death. Uh, you, could, you could even run, okay, governance tokens and, demo and direct democracy has been rightly criticized here, but when you're a shadow civilian government under the heel of dictatorship in a civil war, the leaders of the National Unity Government, um, NUG of Myanmar, are unelected because you can't hold an election, everyone would get shot. But imagine you'd allocate governance tokens and people could vote on policies, who you'd run an election, and in a civil war. And, and so once you think like, so, so that's why someone like uh, uh, me, uh, a good lawyer, statist, kind of got interested in this, because uh, what happens when the state is the enemy? Um, and someone's got to build it. Um, and so what I propose as a mental model going forward to the Krugman on one side and uh, Balaji on the other is a hybrid. And I think Vitalik does this like pretty well. Occasionally he gets a little pissed off and uh, I think makes like some Linear algebra appeal to authority. Check twi check his Twitter last week. He like went after somebody, um, but uh, but I think generally he does a pretty good job of this. So, to me, the hybrid blend is a investigative journalist and an engineer. So the investigative journalist is a humanist, right? Um, but they don't uh, make uh, philosophical inferences without evidence, right? So um, true, crypto. Uh, uh, well, Ethereum mainnet consumed a lot of electricity, actually less than YouTube, but a lot of electricity uh, before the merge. Vitalik like, was like, yeah, that's right. 
um, let's engineer a solution around it. Not only him, they did. They tested it for two years and they had merged and merged like it went well, cut energy consumption 99.5%. Um, I think this is an interesting approach to look at. So if you look at the other side, where you might call like Elon Musk and uh, Balaji hypocrites, and I actually, like this will make me unpopular in this room, I do think Elon Musk is a genius. Like I think when he talks about engineering, it's like when he does anything else, it's terrible. Um, but um, um, I think they are a little hypocritical, and I have like, I actually really like a lot of what Balaji says. Um, is they become, when they're addressing free speech, where they're not down this deep in the stack, they like, are to stay at the top of the stack, and so it's like very hypocritical to me, where they make these like very uh, pre-law, <laughs> pre-law school, like this is how First Amendment works, uh, arguments, um, and that American First Amendment, their, their view of it, uh, uh, Forget it, that it's like a you know uh, award of against state infringement of free speech it should apply to every country, even though America is the only country that uh, adheres to the First Amendment. Um, and uh, um, and uh, and and so a note on this was um, there's another way. Uh, the, the point of this slide is to show like a blended policy and technology approach could be useful. So what, there was a genocide in Myanmar and cited on Facebook. Um, when I was there, I, um, I thought, okay, so how can we do this you know, in a considered way um, and not just write another paper? No offense to the people in this room. Um, because um, you, if, uh, writing papers is very important, but is that really gonna change anything? And so the idea was to try and build a platform that incorporates uh, the principles of the ICCPR, Articles 19 and 20. And yes, the very intelligent lawyers in this room will say, um, Articles 19 and 20 are so wishy-washy, like what do they mean? And I'll say, you are right, you are correct. Um, and, uh, and reading a Human Rights Commission opinion is like not very useful, but we have to make do with what we have. Um, yeah, I actually put the put this out of space. But um, uh, this is a, a question I brought up earlier, right? This is, prob this is probably gonna be much more complicated in practice, but the major issue for uh, um, content moderation is that civil society groups who are the best place to do the content moderation are like teams of five to 10 locals in 200 countries around the world who operate on a budget, l like a monthly budget that's probably like your all entire monthly salary, like for one person, and like 10 people have to try and make it work. And yeah, the cost of living is not Manhattan, but um, you know, it's not enough. Um, and, so, uh, and so how do you, like I've pitched the people in OSB in this room, the oversight board, like I've, like I've raised this problem to them. How do you make sure civil society groups are actually paid? So what happens is like we're a civil society group in Myanmar, we relied on grants from largely USAID, organizations like FHI 360, Christian Aid, right? Also, the social media companies themselves. So Facebook, uh, t uh, TikTok. Um, and the paradox is like the public sector, like governments uh, uh, and, you know, uh, where's, where's the model where you get paid? So to, for people to actually do this work and not starve. And, and I think Web3 is an interesting, um, you know, I raised the question to Golda, like um, if you take a look at, uh, you know, how oracles or mining is done, um, you have these, you know, mining's tough because there's centralization there, but um, there are these decentralized oracles that pay people to validate like price information for tokens that needs to be updated all the time. Those people get a little payment every time. Um, the notion of paying people to do content moderation, maybe for post or something, is potentially a model that makes this sustainable. And voting with governance tokens and leaving that to the mob might be a terrible idea. 
But the point is, it's an idea that could be possible. Like with DAOs, you have voting, you have delegation of votes, um, and that's going on now. And it's something that should be researched more. And I think that's like maybe the role of people in this room and, and people like that. Where Web3 is not only like the scammy thing. <laughs> um, and then, the I, so, so I try and have a hybrid model, right? So, so Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos, yep. Um, like, sh uh, not only her, but they were fraud. And it took an investigative journalist from the Wall Street Journal, John Carreyou, to do a lot of detective work over a number of years in getting subject matter experts um, to switch, uh, 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 who are employed by Theranos and like switch and, and speak truth to power, right? And um, so I think this like investigative journalist approach I think is good. However, I will say like maybe the more like opinionated journalism without, it's like not fact-based, it's kind of like an analogy or philosophy-based is maybe less useful alone. And then on the solution side, um, engineers are capable of like really remarkable feats. If you look at the proof of stake merge with Ethereum, that was an amazing feat of engineering that eliminated a core criticism of uh, electricity consumption. And so I sort of suggest that this model be one to consider going forward among other models um, because I've hopefully pointed out, hopefully I've pointed out a couple instances where web blockchain technologies or decentralization would be incredibly useful and prevent, m maybe mitigate millions of people from suffering. Um, and uh, it's not only scams, but there are scams. And, <laughs> and uh, that's it, sorry. Thank you, it's okay. <laughs> uh, actually, one of our... <laughs> Actually, one of our panels could not make it. Uh, Dave McGibbon, uh, the CEO of Passbase, so we have some time to discuss among ourselves. And he sent his apologies and unfortunately fell ill. Uh, so you told us that there are scams on Web3, sounds like the internet, and uh, also a lot of the values that you were talking about were more about, um, like, I think that the values that we want to protect and respect on the internet, the uh, global interconnectivity and kind of like uh, to plug people into this um, global economy so that they don't suffer um, internally from authoritarian uh, regimes. If that is, uh, if that would be possible with uh, Web3, that, uh, that's amazing, but we can ask the challenging questions after Allison tells us a little bit about um, yeah. what the, the decentralized yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. database. Um, so, Michael, I'm going to lean right into the hybrid model because I think that that's a really important thing to be thinking about. All of these headlines that you've talked about, we're seeing them every day, and they're shaping the narr a lot of the narrative, and these things are happening. They are true. But there's another side to this. And so what I do find is that people end up in these camps where they're either doomsday, there's nothing good about this technology, or they're, they have what I would call hopium, where it's gonna fix everything. And um, neither is right. And so really the discovery that takes place in the middle is really important to understand. And so that means not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but being extremely thoughtful about how we think about uh, this technology and what kinds of feats of engineering can be done and who needs to be involved in the ground floor as we develop that. And so I found that it's very difficult for people to hold both a, a healthy skepticism because the skepticism is required and a, an inner visionary in the same space. And so that's, that's where we really need to go. And what I wanna share, if I've got some slides, I've got visuals on these, is I wanna talk about whether we can, what we can leverage to really encourage open innovation that could potentially restructure the competitive landscape, specifically in social networking. So we talked a lot about regulation today, which is so important, but these forces are so powerful that we need 
many arrows in our quiver. So what can we do? Now, I know we all know that open innovation can be very powerful. So when you're able to innovate with open source tools that, and the innovators are not limited to a single organization and not incented simply by corporate shareholder interests, there's so much that you can do. But let's just, I just wanna simmer for a moment in really how powerful that can be. And so in the early days of YouTube, which I, um, is obviously a centralized power, uh, platform, so I recognize that irony, but in the early days of YouTube, John Chu, who's a filmmaker, came across a six-year-old kid in Hawaii, he was doing these dance moves that he couldn't understand how this kid had been exposed to it, how he learned about it, what he was doing. It was utterly fascinating at that point in time. And so what he realized was that YouTube was actually being used as an open innovation platform in the world of dance. And so what was happening is that kids in Japan were taking, they were posting videos that then would be taken from kids in Detroit that would create new dance based off of that and then post it again. And you had this cycle of creation, sharing, building, remixing that created something brand new and accelerated the change. So you know, we've seen how open innovation works. We've seen how diabetes patients, for example, will take into their own hands using open source platforms, the creation of an artificial pancreas when medical equipment manufacturers would not, or how open innovation can help to foster a community that uh, offers open source farming equipment for farmers that cannot afford commercial equipment. So it can be very powerful when you look at how do I lower barriers, how do I diversify contribution, how can I accelerate innovation? So then the question is, okay, can we use this more effectively to enable more innovation and to beat the crisis in social networking? So our crisis is that the world's interaction is so locked into these platforms that are governed by essentially surveillance capitalism. And so there's been a lot of really fascinating and important innovation in decentralized social networking that takes different approaches. So for example, there's the Fediverse and federated approaches, which offer some big advantages. They also have a trade-off, we've talked about trade-offs earlier uh, today, where you're reliant on administrator who still holds the server. And so, that's one, one trade-off. You've got peer-to-peer um, -peer networks that offer incredible use cases, but you lack out on global discoverability. So how can I discover people around the world? Uh, how can I connect to people that may not be in my network? And also the onus on the, the user to run a node is high. So what else can we do? And so this technology can be leveraged to offer something interesting because it offers us decentralized shared state. So right now, the best way we have to really truly do decentralized shared state is through blockchain technology. So how can we use that? So I am, I'm gonna share a little bit about some work that a lot of this work is under an initiative called Project Liberty, which is really working to convene people and organizations that are seeking solutions to build a better web and specifically around social networking. And I wanna emphasize something you were saying earlier, Michael, where the, the foundation of all this work is shifting, it needs to shift from just technologists, but also bring in many other, many other kinds of people with different disciplines. So really the foundation of all of this work is how do we move from a state of techno-solutionism to at the ground layer of any technology that's built, really understanding how do we bring in people with diverse backgrounds? How do we be, oh, Golda talked earlier about the need to bring more people in the room with um, geographic diversity. And so how do we do that? So what's really important and fundamental is to enable infrastructure that truly unlocks open innovation, the kind of open innovation we want, is to have this as a foundational layer. Then I wanna share, I wanna talk a little bit about technology. So we have a, um, so Mike Masnick mentioned his paper earlier on protocols, not platforms. And if you haven't read it, it's a brilliant piece and I hope everyone does read it. 
Um, it talks about, it gives an example of what could happen if we move from a protocol or from a platform to a protocol for within social networking and how could that unlock innovation? How could that create a global laboratory of experimentation that we could all learn from? And so I'll talk about a project called DSNP. You can learn more about it on dsnp.org, which <coughs> enables a truly universal, access, universally accessible social graph. And it's based off a, it is a protocol. So the protocol itself enables this <coughs> universal social graph. It's not dependent on any application or platform. It leverages blockchain technology because that offers us a chance to have a decentralized and truly shared state. The protocol is very thin. It's just focusing on enabling this social graph. It also isn't linked to inc crypto incentives. So there are no financial incentives in this layer. This is truly public good technology. And so that enables us a foundation on which we can work. Now, there is a challenge with anything that's decentralized social that's using blockchain. Um, so one challenge is the fact that it's extremely costly to do blockchain transactions. So today, you any, any decentralized social, when it gets to any scale, um, would break because you simply cannot absorb, as a business could simply not absorb the cost of the transactions. So today, when we have financial transactions using a blockchain, it's easier to absorb the cost. But if you're doing transactions, at a frequency of messages, then you've got a problem, with a massive problem that surfaces with the pricing model. So um, that's an example. I want to. So right now, DSMP has a proof of concept on Ethereum. So you can go out and look at that work. Um, but the pricing model doesn't work in terms of getting to scale. So there's a third layer of initiative that needs needs to take place, and that's really to how do we look at tools and infrastructure and other services that can really make it economically sustainable for builders to create new businesses, to discover new business models. And one of the pieces, I'll give an example, and one of the pieces that's based off of this pricing methodology. So there's a project called Frequency that is working to, um, so there was a analysis of 30 public blockchains and how could we create a pricing model that actually would enable this to work at scale. And through that work, the project discovered that the Polkadot relay chain and its shared consensus model enables a new pricing model that actually makes it possible to build a business not off a transaction by transaction cost, but to reserve an allocation of capacity that could be used, um, could be reserved, and that refills in regular increments. So I think of it as, for example, a business that would invest in a solar panel. And we know that every day the sun comes and replenishes the energy from that. So same thing, where you're, you're, you buy an allocation of, or stake an allocation of capacity, and it refills over time, so that you can use that at a frequency of messages. So this is an example of the kinds of things that we need to create that would enable innovation in this space. And the hope is that over time, can we redefine scale so that it actually becomes a collaboration? So scale can be, scales is an, a concept that's really locking us in. It's locking us into this system that we have today. How can we change the concept of scale and have it work for us? And so I'll give a couple examples. Uh, one is with a universal social graph, you have the opportunity of compounding network effects. So applications that come on and use this can grow the social graph over time. That can enable global discovery that enables us to meet people outside of our network. So that's one aspect. Another that I think is really exciting is the opportunity for a shared marketplace of services. We've talked a lot about the challenges of content moderation, verification, and so many other, other aspects of social networking that must be addressed. How, 
pretty sure that the expertise in solving these is not at Facebook. Or if there is expertise there, they are their work isn't isn't fully leveraged. And so how can we tap into the incredible expertise around our world of, of how to build these services and how can we how can we create a marketplace where those could be shared and these shared services could be used by multiple apps? And is there a revenue model that's possible for that that can bring some of the research that's been done in this um, and help to fund it? So there's a couple different aspects of it. And I'll share a story of a prototype that was built on uh, DSMP that was from, this was from a boot camp that was put on by La Platform, which is a school in Marseille. And a, general, a student from Nigeria created a prototype for an app that is focused on helping to connect people with rare diseases to each other around the world and with expertise on those diseases. And so that's an aspect where you need global discoverability to be able to connect to those people. And he talks about how this enables me to connect so, to so many more people than I could if my, my network was more limited. And so the hope is that this, this can create a way where we can truly work together on this, this um, this basic protocol. So I just want to share too that this is complicated by the fact, of course, that this is a very um, a, a very limited um, protocol. It is focused simply on enabling a social graph. And so there's all these other aspects of work that it needs to tie into. And so there's expertise in all of these areas that it would need to connect to. And so this is this is an important thing. I think of this as a sort of a quilting party, if you will, well, where this is, DSMP would just be one square of the quilt, but to work, to come together, it really needs so many more quilts together. And so then there's a question too of adoption. How do you make adoption work? And this is an extremely simple graph uh, that simplifies a, uh, a lot of very complex things. Um, but what I want to point out with this is that right now we're living in this world where the, per the current products have a relatively uh, perceived high value. And over time, there's events that do trigger disillusionment, Facebook files, et cetera, et cetera. So that then decreases the, um, the perceived value of products, but it really doesn't do us any good until there are new alternatives that are available. And so as those new alternatives become available, early adopters will start to neutralize their switching costs. And then hopefully that sets a new expectation. If that early adopter pool is large enough, that expectation is accelerated. Now I have to say that each one of these little teeny lines here represents an incredible amount of complexity. And I think that, you know, obviously there's the complexity of the awareness and education line, right? That's huge. But I think the hardest one is the one that's about getting getting to new alternatives that people actually switch to. So that is, creates, a, there is an incredible amount of work, as you pointed out, in terms of user experience that needs to be done. And I think in this new world, product design is gonna be one of the most important and coveted skills as well, is how do we design products that work for people that they'll actually use. So ultimately, the idea here is um, thinking through how do we offer more, more arrows in our quiver and enable something that can start to offer alternatives to our existing model um, in conjunction with other efforts along regulation and other. And I just want to share one thought too um, before finishing is, so last week I was in New York as, like also, and I was at an event, Unfinished Live, that my organization put on, and I had the honor to sit down with a group of students that were there as part of the Project Liberty Student Ambassador um, gathering, and these were students that were from all over the world. And what I saw is an incredible amount of energy and desire for change. And these are young leaders that are hungry for new tools and want to create. And so really the, the, 
the focus and the need is how do we create? How do we all work together to create tools that are thoughtful, that will enable them to create more of a future that, that they desire? Thank you so much, Alison. So what comes... <laughs> I just want to jump to the discussion. So um, what comes to my mind uh, when you were doing your presentation, I kept thinking, so how this... Uh, how, is the, how, how is this technology different from what we have already? How is it go going to protect freedom of speech and uh, mobilize people to uh, connect with each other and do uprisings? And uh, is there like a future like that that you envision that the technology can do that? How, and are there like other like governance mechanism, because we were like discussing um, in one of the sessions previously that uh, we need to change the incentives of people as well in order for them to uh, behave in a, a certain uh, uh, way instead of just focusing on content moderation or platform governance. So does this technology or what you're working on, does it address any of these issues? So what this offers is the foundation of a universal social graph which um, that's outside of, outside of platforms. So that's a base infrastructure layer and the um, gives us an opportunity to do all kinds of innovation on top of that where expertise can come in and develop content moderation that works with that or other areas. You bring up governance, which is um, massively important where um, I believe that in decentralized systems, governance is where the rubber hits the road really in terms of how, how they um, advance us or not. And there's a lot of work to be done in terms of how to do that well. And so, Governance is a, a critically important part that we need to have much more innovation of in and shared governance or, or sharing the best practices that we're learning as they emerge around how to do it well. And what are the regulatory challenges? Do you have any, do you face any regulatory challenges even now or can you uh, provide a truly neutral protocol that everybody else can permis have like permissionless authority to do whatever they want? Um, so I'm not a policy expert, um, but what I will share is that I think one of the, the forces that is very concerning to me is what I'll call fog of noise. And so that is if you think about incumbents, uh, they are, they're being fined, there's a, a start of a shift in consumer expectations um, and awareness in how my data is treated and how I, what my health is on these, these platforms. And so there's motivation to show change. And so what I'm concerned about is a, a lot of uh, fog <laughs> put out in terms of changes that actually aren't really truly protecting digital citizens and that create a distraction almost so that um, we get a, you know, people think, oh, that's good enough. It's, you know, I'm getting my, my needs met and it takes off the pressure. So I am concerned that the incumbents will create, you know, will innovate in a way that, um, that they're throwing out something that's distracting but not actually changing us. I mean, <clears throat> I just think like, so uh, uh, like, how do you make your product better, right? And so uh, m maybe here, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, someone might say, uh, well, wallets are just too hard to use, so forget it, right? Uh, and then, uh, but, but maybe a designer engineer perspective, you know, it's kind of like, the movie uh, The Martian with Matt Damon, you break up a hard problem into a lot of small problems, then you solve all the small problems, and then it looks like you solved the big problem. So for example, in the global south, uh, people do not use web browsers, or they do, but they don't understand it. Like, so those of you who are with Facebook or Google or OSB like know that, right? They, they use mobile apps, they use chat apps. So one proposed solution that I've made to uh, the Ethereum Foundation, I think is gonna get funded, is you have a wallet as a chat bot. So you have wallet generation and then you have an issue with 
any of you have tried to use a wallet, it's like a 12 word passphrase at least, right? And then you just rage quit it and continued living your life. There's a uh, package out there called Web3 Auth that enables you to create a wallet using like your Google, like your Gmail address or your Facebook login. So why not do that? And then you can get deeper into the details. There's a cryptographic method called Shamir Secret Sharing, which uh, it's like Harry Potter's Horcrux. Like those of you who uh, like read Harry Potter, um, you can basically shard like Lord Voldemort. It was like the Tom Riddle's journal. The, uh, what, what's all the stuff? He had to kill with the basilisk horn. Um, the snake, Nagini. You know, you know the Horcruxes, those of you know. It's like the same, like Shamir's secret sharing is like a cryptographic math nerd version of this. So you can shard your private key, which is like your, like the keys to the bank, right? Keys of the bank vault across multiple shared, you could create Horcruxes. So one is like your, maybe your device, Another one's your, um, like your phone. Um, another one's um, your uh, social media login, Google or Facebook. Uh, and a third might be like a 2FA, like an authenticator app, you know, Google authenticator co code or a password that you come up. And you can only reassemble the private key using two out of three shares. And so I, the point I'm making there is that Sometimes at the conceptual level, when someone says, not here, not today, when someone says, oh, like that totally, you, like that doesn't work at all, that's where I would say, like put on the product hat, as Ellison mentioned, like the importance of product design. And once you like chunk these things up into little problems and then solve for each of the little problems, like then you're like Matt Damon who survives on Mars on like potatoes from the, uh, what is it, the, the dehydrated waste of himself. Um, and so, uh, and so um, um, I just like maybe, as Allison mentioned, put that quiver or arrow in your quiver when sometimes when you want to like say, oh, you, electricity can't fix that, right? Um, yeah. And I'll just point out too, I mean, all of these have trade-offs and it's a, you know, usability versus being able to have more agency. I, these are trade-offs that are really hard to make right now. But as they become easier, it gives us new opportunity. Um, and there's a big difference too in how an early adopter works versus larger populations. So if you were an electric car early adopter, it was extremely difficult to figure out how you were going to get to your meeting that's 60 miles away and home. And you had to do, you had to look it up on a map, find out where you could charge. Um, you might even have to have two cars for a family versus otherwise you might have to have one um, to make it work. So when you have populations that are passionate about it, they will make some trade-offs. Um, ultimately, it needs to become easier or it doesn't get adoption. But it's really understanding for those early populations, how do we get over that tipping point? And it's also fascinating to see how far we are from it now. Um, if you, for example, onboard a teenager to a crypto wallet, you can see just how hard it is. And then when you get to the point on how are you gonna protect your seed phrase, you can see just how challenging it is. <laughs> so uh, it's really important to understand where we are, but also know that um, there's an incredible amount of ingenuity when we break apart these problems that can help change where we are today. Oh, and just, one, and just to give, it, give, a, give an argument for a policy side, uh, point of view. So, so if you've read like uh, Elon Musk's texts, right? That guy came out in like the litigation, right? He talked about like um, uh, making uh, blockchain Twitter one of the ideas with Kimball's brother, and that there would be like micro payments or a tweet, which is actually, like I think it's a really great idea. But um, and he's not the one who first thought of that, right? Um, but put it on the policy hat with like a little bit of like uh, understanding the tech. I think that's gonna be like really tricky in practice. Like in, 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 from my experience in DeFi, if there's an opportunity to try and make some money um, off of, um, so there's this, there's this thing called MEV bots or MEV bots that try and front run transactions on the blockchain. And I could, I could just see like, like the bot prop, like, like Elon's really worried about bots on, on like Web2 Twitter. I think if it's not very carefully architected, the bot problem on like bot blockchain Twitter, depending on there's like smart contracts exposed with like payments could be way worse. Like uh, 
and I think talk to a, like a cryptographic expert on that, I'm only speaking at the level of abstraction of, oh my God, there's like a lot of bad, <laughs> like a lot of wild rugging bot activity and like pure DeFi, not on a centralized exchange. But I think the policy hat is very useful once there's like a new um, engineering solution proposed because um, it's, it's the wild west out there. So um, you mentioned, Michael, that government can monitor and control traditional transactions. And also you mentioned that in the global south, certain countries um, uh, have been like blocked from payments, traditional payment services, and their only hope is crypto. So I want to challenge that a little bit. And um, the crypto wallets have been sanctioned uh, by the US and other countries and have been confiscated. Uh, so access to these uh, in uh, sanctioned countries and not only the sanctioned individuals and entities, but also people, uh, ordinary people, because the wallet provider, it's not in their, um, uh, in their business interest to provide a wallet for, for example, Iranians or those uh, other sanctioned countries. And uh, do you see that as a, uh, as a challenge, as a uh, policy challenge, and what are the solutions that you think you could provide? Because we want to pay civil society with this crypto, right? Yeah, so this is a very good, good question you're making um, because it's a dual-use technology, right? So let's say like, we figure out this uh, crypto wallet and then the military junta goes, oh, why don't we just start using that, <laughs> right? Um, and you're right. So, so um, and, and I think uh, my answer to this will be in COET because it is uh, not fully formed. So, so, so um, the pro the, there is a proposal. So this is a, one of the few things I have anticipated. And the idea is to implement some form of KYC, like know your customer. And uh, um, I can't go into too much detail because we're on video, but uh, let's uh, like there is a KYC process being worked out with uh, multilaterals and INGOs by which access, uh, just thinking about, let's <laughs> by which access to the uh, wallet creation feature would be gated, um, um, uh, barring that you would pass like some KYC thing to make sure you're not the military. Like, uh, and so you're, you're correct. And, and my response to that is, um, you know, there, there, uh, thoughtful actors should, uh, put thinking into how, this is where the policy hat's super useful, right? So I think where the lawyer training super useful is lawyers are always thinking like, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Assumption inference, <laughs> assumption inference. What could go wrong, right? Um, it's like this constant, uh, put on the engineering hat, cron job that's running in a background, uh, Python script that's running in a background like every five minutes. That's like, what could go wrong? What could go wrong, right? This is like how lawyers operate and it's actually super useful. Um, and I think whenever, a lawyer makes a truth claim, they immediately think of what is wrong with that truth claim. And I think, I think it's a, like an extremely useful frame of mind. Um, and so yeah, my, my, my vague question to you is we're working on it, but since we're yeah, live, I um, won't say more than that. Well, <laughs> I, uh, so um, one of my, uh, the the other points that actually were raised in the past sessions and um, is, is, to, is learning from the mistakes we already made in, uh, in the internet space. And uh, if, you're, if you think about, like, for example, decentralized uh, file uh, storage or uh, crypto, what are, what are the mistakes that you think you can learn from and uh, not repeat these past mistakes on in the blockchain space? If I can just lean it, I mean, one of the things that I think was just so blatant, which I we've touched on a bit, is just that technologists were making these decisions that are impacting all of us. And I had an interesting conversation with my teenager the other day, because she said, she's taking a philosophy class, so she said, what's technology anyway? 
it's everywhere, it's everything, so what is it? <laughs> and so it's, we've gotten to a point where you, this, you know, it's quite obvious that technology is changing everything about our behavior as individuals, cultural society, organizations, all of it. And so why are we leaving that just to technologists? And so how do we do that integration where we're bringing more and how do we do that more universally? That is a big challenge ahead and I feel like that um, could help move us in the direction quite powerfully, but it's a lot of work to figure out how to do that right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you say something about this, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's just like the past mistakes that oh, we yeah, shouldn't really repeat. So I think trying to say that we'll be perfect is impossible. There's like, no way that's going to happen. Um, um, I think like it's a fool's it's a fool fool's errand. Is that the idiom? Anyway, uh, uh, to do that. However, I will say like. Um, um, I do think it's worthwhile considering, so for example, like um, I'd uh, get, throw out two buzzwords, uh, like the subgraph, you might, you, might you might wanna look into, um, and that um, this I IFPS and Filecoin, like persistence in web uh, of a data storage in Web3 is like in its infancy. Like it's, don't expect that to be good anytime, like it's not nowhere near Amazon Web Services. Uh, like I think uh, Golda referenced like an S3 bucket that's like a storage bucket and like uh, you could you could put files on there in the cloud um, and it's amazing um, and uh, that's another weird thing that well, I think might happen if you dig into the tech you'd be like okay Jeff Bezos has his issues but he's like really smart um, and so <laughs> um, um, I think um, that will take a long time so I think an important part with the engineering is that it will take a long time and some people have said, like, uh, I think it's a Krugman argument, like uh, Bitcoin's been around for whatever it was, like 15 years, um, that's been so long. It's actually, the field is, it's a baby. It's, it's like a 13 month baby. Like that's really where it is. And so assume that things will continue to go wrong. However, on the positive side, there are like some pretty interesting innovations around this. So like subgraph is like a buzzword. It's just using like, would already exist GraphQL, but it's like it's like an interesting way to uh, uh, like like store data off chain in a way that's retrievable. And then um, there's like some interesting things happening with like um, uh, these oracles that I brought up. And so what I suggest is sometimes the negative response you should make the negative assessment. But you might be missing that people are try are aware of this and are trying to R and D like interesting solutions to it. But it takes years um, because so a thing I like to say is like um, when you're not doing engineering, your ideas move at the speed of like your mouth. It's like idea, idea, let's do this, let's do this. But when you're coding, you move at the speed of the computer not telling you no. And that's like, what, it's so much slower. And so I, um, a lot of the criticism is just, but a lot of the criticism is sort of unfair, like I, uh, you know, it's sort of unfair, like just, to, just, just try it sometimes. It's like, it's infuriating, just try it. <laughs> so I'll add to that too, that is a lot of this steady progress is, um, uh, it, it takes years, is utterly boring and never reported or talked about. And the expertise is, is pretty deep. And so how do you, that's not, that's not visible. Um, and it can be a while before it becomes visible. And so that's, that's another challenge. And it's not just that it's immature, but it's also staggeringly more complex than I think anything we've seen before as well. So that also complicates things. That complexity increases the challenge of doing it right, right? So that's, that's a very important factor. Um, but it's, you know, don't, don't judge on where we are today, but get in and learn about wh what is being done in these various areas, which takes work and time. Thank you. So um, just the last question before we go to an audience question. Um, it, it's a comment. I think we covered some of it. There is a narrative uh, going on uh, uh, within blockchain space that uh, we want to circumvent the government and be uh, governments and be stateless and self-enforcing and 
Um, do you think that there should be like a change in this narrative? And you also like uh, mentioned, Alison, that we should be a more uh, uh, like not rely on techno solutions, but consider all other stakeholders. But is there, uh, is there, do you see that there is a change in this narrative uh, to go uh, beyond uh, just like talking about this technology as, a, uh, as uh, something that we use in a lawless space? Well, I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the governance piece is, is so critical and to make that, so no, not lawless. <laughs> Uh, decentralization is very difficult to do and it's a journey. So if we look at, I mean, B Bitcoin is relatively decentralized. We can argue about that probably all day long, but uh, it started as a centralized system, right? So that took time to decentralize and it's a journey. And what I've also noticed too in a lot of very thoughtful DAOs is they are decentralized autonomous organizations is they're actually moving, they're starting small and moving intentionally slowly towards decentralization so that they can learn more about the challenges that come out and be thoughtful about how to address them and do decentralization thoughtfully. So I think that being aware of that journey is also gonna be critical. We wouldn't want to decentralize pieces too fast because then they might become systems that we can't then um, we, we can't make these changes along the, the way and really incorporate others' perspectives and thoughts and expertise. Yeah, and, and, uh, and yeah, I think well said. And um, I think one, so I, I think like uh, what DAOs are an interesting thing Allison brought up because DAOs are in their infancy and I think lawyers could ha add it and policy people could add a ton of value to them. Um, it has all sort of the, it's like voting. It's voting, and it has all the issues with voting. Like Zoe brought up, most people don't vote. You can actually delegate your tokens, and then there's like bribes. There's literally bribes. Just Google like governance voting bribes. Just Google it. And I think I think the all the the big brains in this room should maybe take a look at like how to make governance better, um, because governance, especially under an a, a autocratic regime, there's like some really cool opportunities there. Like I talked about with Mima and lawyers could add a lot of value. And then um, the other thing to maybe look at is, um, so, smart, so smart contracts, right? So what, what is like a smart contract? It's just code that runs automat like automatically. Um, there are a lot of like little slip ups that are made that there are, there are in some ways unlike what you learn in like contracts class, and in other ways kind of totally like what you learn in contracts class, except the stakes are higher because if you get it wrong, you just run the smart contract all the time and like train someone's wallet. So I, I think there's like an interesting field where lawyers could skill up in essentially like providing those checklists of uh, need to be adapted in the code, like all the checks that a contract, because once you deploy smart, there's upgradable smart contracts that are beginning to come in vogue, but it's, you know, um, I think that that lawyers have a very interesting role to play in that space. I actually do think smart contracts could be worked out over time to operate like paper or DocuSign legal uh, contracts. And I think what I'm trying to say is like policy and lawyers have a actually quite a large role in the space and maybe look into it somewhere. Great, thank you. Are, are there any questions? Okay, Mike. Um, thanks. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff to think about. I, w I wanted to um, go back to one of your slides um, that I thought was really good that showed sort of like the path of the, you know, value uh, viewpoint. And I felt like you might have breezed over the, the point that you had about the uh, events that trigger disillusionment. Um, and the more and more that, that I keep working in this space and talking to people, the more and more important I actually think that is because, I mean, you mentioned things like the Facebook papers or whatever, um, and the reality is we've had you know, dozens of those kinds of events uh, over the past four or five years, and it, it hasn't really necessarily decreased the value that people see in these things, and like, you know, rather, you know, ra well, people will say that they're upset with Facebook or whatever, you know, the only sort of really successful new social network that has shown up since then has been TikTok, 
which you know, for everything that you're concerned about with Facebook, it's, it's more so with, with them. So rather than rushing to these sort of decentralized systems where you have more control and you have more power over your, your own data or whatever, people seem to have gone in the other direction. And so to some extent, there's like, there's the evidence of TikTok that like, oh, you could have a new entrance in this space that becomes really big and really powerful very quickly, um, but it's, it hasn't been the decentralized one. So I, I keep talking to people who point out that that element, the, the thing that triggers people to actually switch to a decentralized system is something that hasn't received nearly enough thought. And some people keep trying to convince me, and I'm not quite there yet, but keep trying to convince me that it's, it's got to be something totally catastrophic, like in a way that we probably don't want to really convince people to move off of the more centralized platforms. So I, I, I wanted to know, like, what do you think, like, how, you know, what is going to be those, those triggering events? What's actually going to make people switch? Yeah, and I actually think you're right. I, I did leave off an important thing. It has to happen in conjunction. We have to have a, a viable alternatives in place when these are ready to be in place when these events happen. Or else what happens is, frankly, and this is the state I think we're in, learned helplessness. So learned helplessness is when we have an event happen and we learn there is nothing we can do about it. So how many delete Facebook campaigns have there been? And how much has that really impacted things? And so that's, um, that's concerning because with learned helplessness comes lack of action. And so that's yet another reason why I feel incredible urgency to develop alternatives that are actually viable to start the early adopter process to then educate and get concentric cycle, uh, circles of awareness around that. Um, so I think it's all about having those happen when there's alternatives to market. And we're just not there where we have alternatives that people can go to that people are aware of. And so it's preparing for that next moment. And then you asked, what do I anticipate? And that is the scariest part of that chart for me because I can anticipate a lot and I don't think we're gonna have any shortage of um, moments. And I think that there's the opportunity, the one I, you know, it all, we all, we have to have that, that to happen. I mean, that is part of this journey, um, I, I believe, unfortunately. Um, so the hope is that it's many smaller ones, um, raise education. I think we can all do our part to, to raise awareness beyond our communities, but to people who haven't heard the things that we've been talking about all day and project that beyond <laughs> to larger and larger audiences. I think that's an incredibly important role. Um, but to amplify the, the things that happen and, and, and make sure that people are truly soaking it in. But my hope is that it's, it's smaller events with more alternatives coming to market versus um, large catastrophic events. But I'm, I'm, I mean, my hope may not be realized. It's not much of a hope. <laughs> yeah. no, and I, I appreciate what Alison said. This is a, a separate question, though, for uh, Michael. Um, uh, this is a two-pronged question. Um, one is that I absolutely think, and, and this would be, you know, how can we make it happen that aid goes directly to people, not only in Myanmar, but the women in Afghanistan should be getting it in a decentralized way and not through a centralized thing. You know, the people in Syria who are refugees, how can we make that happen? And then the concern I have is that if it happened widely and you don't have physical security, you know, I know the Taliban will just stop people at checkpoints and pull the gun to their head and give me your private key. So you do have some security concerns, but I'm interested in how you think we can make it happen. Yeah, um, so this is really good. So, so I think one is, um, let's, uh, okay. Uh, there's a proof of concept that's gonna happen uh, with, a, with a major INGO in a particular country you might make an inference about. Uh, and uh, they have up to a million beneficiaries for cash transfers. So I think one is to pilot it out, and as you know well, once you pilot it out, you realize you're doing 50,000 things wrong, and then you iterate, right? So um, I think that, two, um, um, for Farzana's point, um, the getting the KYC uh, nailed down well in a way that you can validate people without exposing their PII, their per personal identifying information is important. However, this is where I'll say where like a multidisciplinary approach is really useful. INGOs, multilaterals, bilaterals have been doing this for decades, like decades, right? Um, enrolling 
cat, so I, I wanna say cash transfer. Cash transfer beneficiaries, they've been doing KYC for that for decades in sensitive contexts. And so that's where I think like a partnership with an ING or multilateral makes a lot of sense. Um, if you want, if you want me to zoom in a little bit, to me, like my like what the UN or multilaterals could and INGOs could be is the way to make this all happen in a way that's not hyper capitalist. Um, um, and I, I like a, a tech fusion with them is desirable. Like so, for example, like the the hate speech platform I, I mentioned, we're civil society. Right, we're trying to work on a global part scale up with uh, UNDP on that. Um, and so I think nailing on the KYC and then, and then um, so, so the KYC would, pr would prohibit dual use um, because INGOs have decade of experience validating users, beneficiaries, they're trusted, right? Yeah, they know how to do it, they've spent a long time doing it, we're just adding a technology component in. Um, and, then, and then to your, to your private key point, which is a really good point, so um, I don't wanna say that this is refined, but I think the best, so to me, getting the probably ex, uh, Shamir shares, like the hor like being able, able to burn the Horcruxes, like taking the basilisk horn, and when time comes, bang, right? Um, and maybe, I, I, I haven't thought about this deeply, so I'm just speaking off the cuff, but maybe at the smart contract level that like initiates some burn function that burns all the tokens and but but the you record the value the the value of the tokens you burn are persisted and it's sent um, to some uh, like uh, controller contract and you get you have to provide some other information to the INGO and you get repaid you know another way right so 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 for me the way around this is um, don't treat I, like INGOs is expendable. It's like, actually, you guys are already at scale. Like, um, UNDP is in like 180 countries. Um, uh, a lot of these like population services international, they're in like 50 countries. FHI 360 is like 110 countries. If we, um, they, they're basically accountants. Like they're, they're so anal about uh, reporting. If you digitalize them, um, I think that's like, a, to me, um, a blockchain application and getting the UX right with them is fascinating. Like that, that to me is, could be a very beneficial global outcome. Um, thank you. I just wanted to, I, I, I love these uh, real life implications because we always like talk about blockchain in a uh, very fuzzy uh, way, but I got to say that in my research about sanctions and humanitarian aid, especially when even intergovernmental organizations face a lot of challenges because of these sanctions to uh, bring uh, humanitarian aid to uh, the countries like Afghanistan and, um, and UNDP is not very reliable, I can say. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> uh, because if there you are in an authoritarian uh, country and it's run by a dictatorship, UNDP is going to be run by um, those people. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, thanks a lot for um, bringing the real life uh, implications. There was another question there. Oh, hi, thank you uh, to all of you for the presentation. I guess I wanted to follow up on the earlier question about getting people to switch to a more decentralized system. Um, and I'm sort of, and I was thinking also about the question about what are the mistakes that you know we wanna make sure to, to remember uh, and learn from. Uh, I was working on issues of you know, human rights activism online uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and one of the things that uh, organizations I was working with were experimenting with was, well, could we have like a YouTube channel for human rights atrocities or this? You know, and, what they found was that people didn't want more choice. People actually wanted to be able to be politically active in the places where they were also socially active. And for some people, especially for citizen journalism, they're probably, you know, they were sort of unexpected journalists. Um, uh, and, and having, you know, one place where, where you could uh, connect the different parts of your life was, was actually important. The other thing that, um, people talked about at that time was the sort of the security uh, that you know centralization provided. So if you had just a 
you know, one channel for human rights activists. It was just so much easier for people to be targeted and for that channel to be taken down. And so while we may think of technology as letting and decentralization as letting us route around authoritarian, you know, regimes, at the same time, breaking things apart sort of make, can make them more vulnerable. Um, there's also a burden, you know, that's associated with that. Um, so I love, Michael, your point about, you know, having activists actually, you know, be paid um, and be compensated for a lot of the content moderation work that they're already doing. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and maybe if they're paid, it, it is equitable, but, you know, so much of that decentralization movement, I worry, is going to be borne by the folks who are most affected um, by the policies. And, and if it's not compensated, Right, then that's, you know, there's, there's just this fundamental inequity in asking local organizations, um, you know, to do, you know, some of the things that, that they're being asked to do. So I guess it's just the lawyer in me wanting to, you know, sort of play the devil's advocate <laughs> um, and say, you know, what are the downsides of some of the decentralization that, that you're talking about? I can address the choice um, question. So these systems and the kind of innovation that can hap happen from them, of course, offer us the ability to potentially give people more choice and more control. And we've also seen that there's a choice paradox <laughs> where people, do, they want it more simple. So how do we do, deal with that? And I think this is a space where we'll learn a lot about new kinds of delegation. So how can we delegate to, um, to say an organization that is able to provide vetted, um, you know, vetted certification that this is, you know, this is a good service or this is a healthy, you know, set of algorithms or this is, you know, it's some sort of, 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 of stamp or seal um, of, of verification and approval. Um, and so that obviously introduces a ton of complexity. And again, that means that, you know, we can then talk about, well, then it's not truly really decentralized. But, um, but I do think that there is an opportunity for us to have a way to um, access vetted, healthier, um, healthier systems, healthier services that, um, that don't, you know, that still give us more choice. And it changes what we have today, where we don't have a choice, we don't understand how anything works, it's completely opaque, and it's, you know, essentially run by, you know, one person with incentives focused on corporate shareholder returns. So, um, I do think that there will be an opportunity for these kinds of ecosystems to develop, and I think that's another area where um, it's effective if there are many people with many diverse backgrounds contributing to that, because there's a lot of complexities in getting there. If you want to talk about security, or yeah, I mean, I, uh, things are going to go wrong. Like uh, for me to like claim that, uh, be like, uh, if I have any credibility, I won't, I won't have any more. Like, uh, like, um, um, I think things are going to go wrong, and I think, like, uh, so, 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 definitely an interesting decentral, like centralization within decentralization, right? So the the centralized exchanges like Coinbase and Binance, right? They are much better at security. And so if you talk to an economist, what's her name at MIT? Um, I forgot her name, but she makes like a very compelling argument, right? The big thing Web3 is going to figure out, like how do you, can you really get around the benefits of centralization? Meaning you get a bunch of talented people in one place, a bunch of resources, you have very robust security teams, they do all the checks. They, you know, because you can probably go and sue Coinbase and Binance, uh, that puts even more pressure for them to get it right. Um, you know, uh, to, to what extent uh, is centralization and decentralization? So for, uh, to, to zoom out, the big question is, can decentralized rule of law, like, is that possible? Or is it like, uh, are we replaying like the Hobbesian state of nature and it's like, well, there are barbarians. Um, Maybe it's Leviathan time, right? Like, um, um, and can technology um, address that issue, uh, the state of nature problem? And I, and, and I, I th it's too early to say. So for example, like these decentralized oracles to me are really interesting. Um, let's see how they do. So uh, like a little pin where I, like, Chainlink is like the biggest one known out there, but if you're an insider, everyone says they're super centralized. No, 
and then they have competitors coming up who are de more decentralized. And so I'd say it's, it's t way too early to say, but things are gonna go wrong, and that's gonna be key to, I think, the point you're making. <coughs> Is a true decentralized, <coughs> well, what's true? Is a relatively more decentralized protocol like feasible as mature on this R&D curve, or will it have to be, you know, Coinbase, Binance? Um, it, uh, can, can guardrails only be like confidently placed with centralization? I don't know. I don't know the answer. To, uh, to Michael, uh, relitigating a, a, a discussion you and I had over email, I think, over, uh, over hate speech versus uh, free speech. Um, now, I, I was interested in, in hearing more about your, your, your hate speech platform. Um, uh, <coughs> first of all, you know, I'm not a, a US uh, lawyer, but I would be surprised if, if the kind of incitement that, the, that in Myanmar that the government and the military uh, undertook on, on Facebook would be protected under the First Amendment. Like if you imagine that the U.S. military incited genocide against a minority of U.S. citizens, I, I don't imagine that would be protected uh, under the First Amendment. But in, in more in, in, in terms of how, how, would, how is this platform, what, what, how, how will it function, and are you, are you afraid that it might sort of backfire? Um, one of the analogies that I have is that after World War II, um, the Allies imposed uh, on Bulgaria, Romania, uh, um, a number of obligations to prohibit fascist parties, to, to uh, suppress anti-democratic movements, and communist uh, governments um, really fast moved in and used them to crush all kind, uh, all uh, opposition, basically. Um, so, so is there, you know, how, how do you ensure that uh, the cure is not worse than the, than the disease? Yeah, that's a very good point. <clears throat> I originally thought, oh, I'll just do a, some boring product demo with videos, and so so uh, um, um, so. Do you want there's a one? Uh, and I thought everyone will like totally go to sleep. So um, um, so I guess one to your first point about the platform. So the platform is like a traditional Web two uh, app. I'd be interested in building out a Web three version, but I guess based on my previous comments, I'm like worried it's too immature and not to whatever, open Pandora's box, whatever you want to pick. Um, um, but it's a web two, so basically what does it do? And, and kudos to the meta, uh, so, so one thing I'll say is once you can move down the stack, um, the big tech companies are pretty responsive up to a point where they ghost me. So I was trolling some of the OSB people about getting ghosted. Um, and so what does that mean? We got special API access uh, to posts from, you know, Facebook and Twitter. Um, TikTok actually hasn't built it out yet. They, like, haven't built that out. Um, and, and, and what is interoperability? So it's like a data format called JSON. This is, like, the interoperable format. And think of it as, like, a... Uh, like an Excel, it's sort of like, it's not, but think of it as Excel sp sp spreadsheets, basically a bunch of key value pairs, but think of it as like two columns in Excel spreadsheet. It's not that, but sort of like, sort of like that. Um, like post date, date, you post URL, the URL, the content, whatever your friend wrote about cats. Uh, image URL, links to, you click it, opens the image. And the likes, all the likes, the, all the emojis have their count. Um, and so we've taken that and then rebuilt it in a front end where you see a bunch of posts. Those posts are filtered. The posts that show are only from pages that civil society organizations have told us are potentially problematic or on the other side, like activist pages, you know, where the, the good guys. And then we take all that data and our team has reconstructed or built, trained a natural language processing a model for Burmese, Sudanese, Arabic, uh, Sinhala, and Sri Lanka, that basically all those posts uh, uh, are run through and it gives a binary classification of hate, non-hate as a first cut. Then the civil society workers write more analysis on the posts they see. And the idea around that is at scale, like if we scale with the UN, it would be decentralized. So you'd have civil society organizations labeling, well first you'd have machine learning models that are trained by local civil society to filter through millions of posts. 
and then the human review is by the civil society organizations who are, um, and, and maybe there's a problem with that model somehow. May, like the key part is selecting the right civil society organizations. <coughs> As an olive branch to Facebook, we've just said, we'll use your existing trusted partner network since you've already vetted them. And that appears to work. And then also UN agency offices because they're staffed with locals. And that appears to work really well. Like I don't know if there's an issue, but <clears throat> maybe there is. The part that's the negative is I get ghosted by Facebook uh, probably at the director level where I've argued, I've sent them technical proposals for them building out more sophisticated API integrations because I want the civil society organizations to act as an intermediate appellate court, reviewing any decisions people have flagged and then pulling from Facebook's own data pipeline how they decide. So then you could have a data scientist like map all that data and be like, oh, you guys totally have bias when it's this political figure on making this truth claim in this country. We have one last question. Uh, sorry, and then I'm pretty sure I got ghosted on that. Um, there was one last question. I think you got it. Uh, thanks. A uh, really quick one. So, okay, I, I'm understanding how that works for hate speech, but how does it work for CSAM? So, essentially, Farzana mentioned uh, the lessons we learned from Web 1 or 2. Uh, we can't possibly be asking volunteers or the UN or civil society to be moderating CSAM at scale, even on a decentralized network. So, how do you do that? because that's a critical part of user trust, uh, without which no one will switch from the platforms. Do you wanna go? It's you very go. short. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's something, I don't know the answer, and I think that's something that, um, you know, my perspective on that is we need to have tools that we can work with together to discover solutions and test them. Um, so how do we do that in a decentralized way? That's something that is extremely important for us to understand, but the hope is that uh, in a model where we can innovate and then share, we can get there faster. So I don't know if you have anything to add. So I, I'm sort of like, why not? So we created a data labeling UI that could totally handle multimodal uh, audio video images, right? Okay, fine. Fine, like the legal part, I'll leave to the room of like 47,000 lawyers in here. But from an, from, an, from an engineering perspective, it seems totally possible, like we actually, we kind of built this. And you could click, we're not using it for CSAM, I don't wanna get a lawsuit. Um, um, and you can just, yeah, I mean, uh, so, so from an engineering perspective, it's yes. From a legal, I leave it to everybody else in the room. Go together, kind of, but anyway, thank you so much for uh, attending and, pa uh, and our panelists and uh, yeah, here we go with the session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was just fascinating to be able to hear these real world examples of the challenges that we're facing with implementing the, these new models. So thank you again for a wonderful first day and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow in person and virtually. Um, and tomorrow we're gonna start again at 10 a.m. So have a wonderful evening and we will see you soon again. Thanks very much.